Honourable members, the speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, um, on uh, yesterday in uh, question time, it, uh, you... A point of order was raised by the uh, Manager of Opposition Business about an interjection from me. Leader the, the Opposition from the call. Uh, Manager uh, for Government Business, in which I said I made no remark I consider inappropriate, uh, Mr Speaker. Members will resume um, their seats. Leader the Opposition has the call. And the Speaker, you later said I do no, not know what remark the Leader of the Opposition made. I'll check the Hansard revisit the issue unless there's anything the Leader of the Opposition wants to do at this stage, the Leader of the Opposition. Now, the record does show, Mr Speaker, that I did make an interjection that was directed to the member for Parramatta. It's contained in the record and it says, you mustn't be much of a member, Ross, $3,000, you've just got the price and then it tails off, presumably wrong. Um, the point I made subsequent to your intervention, Mr Speaker, was I made no comment directed to the member for Parramatta. Clearly that's wrong. I did make a um, comment to the member for, for Parramatta in relation to payment, because the record says that. But indeed the very point made was that this representation was rejected by the minister. That's the member's representations were rejected by the minister. And I asked what changed apart from the money. Now, Mr Speaker, all I'm saying is if the member for Parramatta takes offence, I withdraw the remark, but I just make the point that my objection was not to him because he had sought representations on behalf of his constituent, which the minister had rejected. The whole allegation yesterday was not that the member was doing wrong. We wanted to know the motives of the minister. Opposition. Let me just pick up the point made by the Leader of the Opposition from the Chair's perspective, what the Leader of the, Oppos what the, Chair in, what the, Leader of the Opposition indicated uh, in an understandable, in, in the heat of the moment, was that he hadn't made a comment to the member for Parramatta, and in fact he had. That was the matter I sought to have clarified. Clearly the contents of that remark were deemed not unreasonably by the Leader of Government Business to have been offensive to the member for Parramatta in the context in which they are contained in the Hansard. And if I understand the Leader of the Opposition correctly, he has indicated his preparedness to withdraw that remark if the Member for Parramatta is offended. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker I, I'm grateful uh, uh, to the Leader of the Opposition uh, for indicating that he is prepared to withdraw the comments directed uh, to the Member for Parramatta. But there is another issue as well, <coughs> Mr Speaker, and that is uh, the Leader of the Opposition said in the Parliament, I made no comment directed to the member for Parramatta in relation to payment. Plainly he did. So not only should he withdraw the reflection on the member for Parramatta, but he should also uh, apologise to the House for inadvertently, I assume, uh, misleading the House. The Leader of the Opposition. I've, I've acknowledged the correction of the fact. Clearly the record does demonstrate that I did make a comment directed to the member for Parramatta concerning payment. But I think if you read the rest of the uh, comments um, in relation to and, and further on the page, and I repeat it, 
um, after I'd said I made no comment directed to the member for Parramatta in relation to payment. Clearly that was wrong. I did. But what I was saying to the member for Parramatta effectively implied that he had made representations which were ineffective and he was trying to do the right thing as a good local member. My complaint was directed at the minister for not having followed the representations of the member, but we believe subsequently influenced by another factor. Now, time will tell in relation to that, no, and that's been the subject of questions in the parliament. Seat. If the, the government the wants to continue down this path, I welcome them to do it. Um, the manager of government, the leader of the house. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I don't wish to go into the various explanations and arguments that have just been advanced by the leader of the opposition. But the fact is, he said something uh, in this chamber on the Hansard record. He then denied saying what the record shows he did say. Uh, he did inadvertently. Uh, I assume, uh, mislead the House, and he should uh, uh, apologise for misleading the House inadvertently. Yes. Can, I, can I indicate that from the Chair's perspective, first, the Leader of the Opposition has indicated that if the member for Parramatta were offended by the remark he made, he was happy to withdraw it. I'm not presuming on the offence, but I, the member for Parramatta is present, and I'm, I am therefore assuming that the member for Parramatta would like the remark withdrawn and the Leader of the Opposition has volunteered to do so. In that context, I believe the matter is closed. The concern for the Chair was at the time that the Leader of the Opposition genuinely, in my assessment, did, didn't, um, the Leader of the Opposition genuinely believed he had not made a comment directed to the member for Parramatta and he has subsequently this morning indicated that if that was the case, it was an error of judgment on his part. And, and it was the case, and he's indicated it was an error of judgment on his part. So, from my point of view, the matter is closed. The clerk. Government business. Taxation laws amendment. Personal income tax reduction bill. The treasurer. Mr. Speaker, I present the taxation laws amendment. Personal income tax reduction bill, 2003. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend taxation laws to reduce personal income tax to increase the rebate for certain low income taxpayers and for related purposes. Treasurer. Mr Speaker, the measures contained in this bill will cut yeah. personal income tax for I'm 9 sorry million to interrupt Australians. The Treasurer, I really do, but, but there is an obligation on to move that the bill be read a second time. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a second time. I thank the Treasurer. The measures contained in this Treasurer bill has the call. The measures contained in this bill will cut personal income tax for 9 million Australians. The tax reductions will amount to $2.4 billion in 2003 2004 and total $10.7 billion over the next four years. The income tax reductions will be achieved in two ways. Firstly, from 1 July 2003, the low income tax offset will be increased from $150 to $235 for low income taxpayers. The phase out threshold for the low income tax offset will also be increased from 1 July 2003 to $21,600. As a result of these changes, a more generous low income tax offset will be available to more taxpayers. The maximum amount of the low income tax offset of $235 will be available to taxpayers on incomes up to $21,600, with some tax offset able to be claimed by taxpayers with annual incomes up to $27,475. Taxpayers will also be able to have an annual income of up to $7,382 without paying tax up from the current $6,882. Secondly, for all other taxpayers from 1 July 2003, the income tax thresholds will be lifted. The upper income limit for the 17 per cent rate will be raised from $20,000 to $21,600. The upper income limit of the 30 per cent rate will be raised from $50,000 to $52,000. And the upper income limit of the 42 per cent rate 
will be raised from $60,000 to $62,500. By providing tax cuts through changes to the thresholds and through a more generous low-income tax offset, the largest proportional reductions in income tax are provided to low-income earners. A taxpayer with an annual income of $10,000 will pay 16 per cent less tax. Some taxpayers with annual incomes between $20,000 and $27,475 will have their tax cut by $329 a year, or 10.7 per cent. This is a much higher percentage reduction in tax than that provided to higher income earners. For example, those with annual incomes of $85,000 will have a 2 per cent reduction in their tax. Senior Australians will also benefit from this proposal. The increase in the low income tax offset will mean that recipients of the Senior Australians tax offset will be able to earn up to an additional $500 annual income before they have an income tax liability. This means that these Senior Australians will pay no tax on annual incomes up to $20,500 for singles, compared with $20,000 currently, and up to $33,612 for couples, compared with $32,612 currently. The Medicare levy threshold for senior Australians will also be increased to ensure that they do not pay the Medicare levy until they begin to incur an income tax liability. These changes mean that Australian taxpayers can keep a higher proportion of the earnings they receive after tax, providing improved incentives to pursue work, advancement and higher skills. The tax cuts in the 2003-2004 budget provide a responsible balance between the government's key goals. The government is meeting the higher costs of defence and security and financing other priority programs such as education and health. The budget remains in surplus, allowing for debt levels to be further reduced. And after providing for the government's legitimate spending proposals, this government is able to return the benefits of good economic management and growth as tax cuts for all Australian taxpayers. <coughs> Full details of the measures in this bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend the bill to the House and present the explanatory memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Your debate be adjourned. The question is the resumption of the debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister for Science. Mr Speaker, for the information of honourable members, I present volumes one and two of the Australian Law Reform Commission in the Australian Health Ethics Committee of the National Health and Medical Research Council's report on the protection of human genetic information in Australia entitled Essentially Yours. I thank the Minister for Science. The Clerk. Government Business Notice No. 1, Export Market Development Grants Amendment Bill. The Minister for Trade. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I present the <coughs> Export Market Development Grants Amendment Bill uh, uh, 2003. We'll find a... Clark. Reading a bill for an act to amend the Export Market Development Grants Act 1997 and for related purposes. The Minister for Trade. Mr Speaker, I move the bill be now read a second time. Yes, the Minister for Trade has the call. Okay. Mr Speaker, the uh, Export Market uh, Development Grants Amendment Bill 2003 will refocus the EMDG scheme to further assist small and medium-sized businesses and, in doing so, better support the government's goal of doubling the number of exporters by 2006. Each year, the, uh, the government invests uh, $150.4 million in the EMDG scheme to support eligible export promotion activities of small and medium Australian businesses by partially reimbursing their eligible expenses. The EMDG scheme has been regularly reviewed and is consistently hailed as a benchmark of effectiveness in terms of government industry support programs. In 1999-2000, following extensive econometric analysis of the scheme, Professor Bewley of the University of New South Wales found that an additional $12 in exports was generated as a result of every grant dollar spent. Last year, around 3,100 small and medium-sized exporters uh, received grants through the scheme. These businesses generated approximately $5 billion in export revenue and employed over 60,000 Australians to fill their export orders. 
Support was provided to small and medium enterprises across virtually all industries and in all parts of Australia. Importantly, 21 per cent of grant recipients were located in rural and regional Australia. Demand for grants has grown considerably in recent years, demonstrating <coughs> the continued success of the scheme. Austrade informs me that it has received over 4,000 applications for the 2001-2 uh, grant year, an increase of 23 per cent by number on the previous year. Over 1,500 businesses applied for a grant for the first time. Small business is one of the fastest growing sectors of the export community and is the key to doubling the number of Australian exporters. Austrade estimates that 97 per cent of all Australian exporting firms are SMEs. These are the businesses that need to be nurtured. Accordingly, since 1996, we have made a number of changes to the, make the EMDG scheme much more attractive and accessible to small business. These include reducing the minimum expenditure required to access the scheme from $30,000 to $15,000, doubling the grant rate available to the tourism industry, improving access for family businesses, reducing red tape and documentation requirements, introducing a $5,000 minimum grant and broadening the range of eligible export promotion expenditure. The government has also taken steps to improve access of small businesses in rural and regional Australia to the scheme by ensuring that related domestic costs are included in the EMDG Overseas Visits Allowance. The changes proposed in the Export Market Development Grants Amendment Bill 2003 will further simplify the scheme and put greater focus on assisting small and emerging exporters, that is, those businesses that most need assistance. The proposed amendments include reducing the income ceiling for applicants from $50 million to $30 million, reducing the maximum grant amount from $200,000 to $150,000, reducing the maximum number of grants from eight to seven, removing the $25 million export earnings ceiling, and removing the provision for additional grants for entering new markets. The proposed changes are to take effect for EMDG claims from the 2003-04 EMDG grant year onwards, in other words, to applicants applications received and grants paid from 1 July 2004 onwards. The total budget for the scheme will not be affected by the changes. Funding will remain at $150.4 million, a decision that reflects both the government's firm commitment to the scheme and its strong fiscal stance at a time when there are significant demands on the federal budget. The proposed amendments will, in fact, ensure that a greater number of claimants from the scheme's target group that is, small business, receive a grant. The EMDG scheme is but one important element of our government's comprehensive strategy to double the number of Australian exporters by 2006. Last year, for instance, we committed $21.5 million to expanding the Trade Start program over four years. Trade Start is designed to assist small businesses break into potentially lucrative overseas markets through an extensive network of specialist export advisers <clears throat> in 51 locations across metropolitan, rural and regional Australia. It also puts the international market expertise of Austrade's global network across 58 countries at the fingertips of small business. And the early signs are encouraging. In 2000-2001, the base year for the doubling target, the Australian Bureau of Statistics estimated there were approximately 25,000 exporting companies in Australia. Last financial year, that number increased by almost 6,500 firms, or over 25 per cent. But there is still an enormous amount of work to be done. In considering this bill, it is important to keep in mind that the EMDG scheme is all about assisting small business to become sustainable exporters. One such, one such business, uh, Mr Speaker, is Queensland company Elise International. Since uh, humble beginnings in 1987, uh, Elise uh, now provides its electronic livestock identification products to most major properties, sale yards and abattoirs across Australia. In the last few years, the company has looked at expanding into overseas markets and recently won a tender, the biggest of its type, to provide electronic identification equipment for the entire cattle herd in Botswana. And in 2002, Elise received its first grant under the EMDG scheme, enabling it to defray some of the costs associated with marketing its products around the globe. Elise and thousands of small companies like it are the unsung heroes of Australia's continued economic success. 
This bill will ensure that the EMDG funding is focused on cultivating small and emerging markets such as exporters, such as Elise, and in turn contribute to the long-term strength of the Australian economy. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, I would like to reinforce the point that the government is better targeting the EMDG scheme at a time when there are significant demands on the budget. We believe that the proposed changes, as outlined in the Export Market Development Grants Amendment Bill 2003, will ensure the program continues to assist those businesses in most need, small and medium-sized exporters. Mr Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and present the uh, explanatory memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Question is the resumption of the debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number two, Australian Film Commission Amendment Bill. The Minister for Science representing the Minister for Arts and Sport. Mr Speaker, I present the Australian Film Commission Amendment Bill 2003. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Film Commission Act of 1975 and for related purposes. Minister for Science. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. The purposes of the amendment bill before the House is to facilitate the integration of two major cultural agencies in accordance with the government's announcement in the 2003-04 budget. Following recommendations from the review of cultural agencies within the communications, information technology and the arts portfolio, the government has decided that Screen Sound Australia, the National Screen and Sound Archive, and the Australian Film Commission, AFC, should be integrated into a single statutory agency. In taking this decision, the government has taken into account the implications for the cultural objectives of the agencies, the need for appropriate governance arrangements and relationships with key stakeholders. Accordingly, the government considers that integrating the AFC and Screen Sound Australia, a current program of the Department of Communications, Information Technology and the Arts, will provide real benefits and opportunities for both organisations and the, and the combined constituencies that they represent and serve. The AFC is the Commonwealth's primary agency for, agency for supporting film, television and interactive media production and distribution and their creators. The AFC also supports activities uh, and events that provide the wider Australian community, including regional Australians, with access to Australian audiovisual product. Screen Sound Australia is the national institution responsible for preserving, documenting and interpreting the Australian experience in audiovisual media. The proposed amendments will, for the first time, give clear recognition in Commonwealth legislation to the important work of collecting and preserving the nation's sound and visual heritage. Specifically, the amendments will articulate a broader cultural role for the AFC by conferring on it express functions and powers in relation to the development, maintenance and exhibition of a collection of film and or sound recordings, supporting documentation such as scripts and artefacts, such as original film posters. This bill amends the Australian Film Commission Act 1975 to enable the transfer of administrative responsibility for Screen Sound Australia to the AFC. It will ensure that the AFC has the functions and powers that will enable it to properly manage, maintain and exhibit the National Screen and Sound Collection, and it facilitates the transfer of relevant Commonwealth assets, liabilities, contractual rights and obligations and records to the AFC. Screen Sound Australia staff are currently employed under the Public Service Act 1999. To ensure no disadvantage to staff, the bill also provides the AFC with the power to employ staff under the Public Service Act. This bill establishes a chief executive officer position within the AFC to support these arrangements. The synergies created by combining the resources of Screen Sound Australia and the AFC will expand the scope and focus of national screen cultural activities and enhance coordination. Links between Australian audiovisual heritage resources and the broader sound, film and television industry will be improved, as will educational and exhibition activities. 
combining Screen Sound's extensive collection of screen and sound material with the AFC's ability to support national exhibition programs will ensure that more Australians than ever, particularly in regional areas, are able to enjoy the unique audio-visual resources in Screen Sound's collection. The combined agency will therefore be in a stronger position to provide national leadership in enhancing access to and understanding of audiovisual culture. As a former arts minister with responsibility uh, for the Australian Film Commission and Screen Sound Australia, I strongly endorse this very, um, very forward-looking reform which will benefit not just the two institutions and the people who constitute them, but also the wider cultural sector and especially film, television and, and, uh, and uh, radio. Um, I would wish to congratulate um, one person in particular, Mr Peter Rush, who headed that cultural review of agencies and institutions within the Department of Communications, Information and Technology. I've had experience with Mr Rush. He was a former uh, department liaison officer in, in my office and it was a difficult task that he and his colleagues within the department embraced with enthusiasm and imagination. One of the results has been the transfer of Questacon, the National Science and Technology, um, in, uh, the National Science and Technology. Um, well, we call it Questacon, but National Science and Technology Agency, uh, to my de to my department of Education, Science and Training. So it has been a review that has looked at the proper purpose of our valued and important cultural institutions and sought to uh, reshape them in a way that will continue to better serve their objectives. In the case of Questacon being transferred to the Department of Education, Science and Training, it makes perfect sense because Questacon major objective is to promote and educate science and technology. It's not a collecting institution. So I would wish to thank everybody within the department and within the AFC and Screen Sound for their cooperation and input into the cultural review within the Department of Communication and Information Technology that has led to what I will to what I believe will be a consolidation and an enhancement of the AFC and Screen Sound well into the future to the benefit of, us, of Australia's artistic and cultural objectives. I commend the bill to the House and present the expunditary memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate made in order today for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. New Business Tax System Taxation of Financial Arrangements Bill No. 1. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I present the New Business Tax System Taxation of Financial Arrangements Bill No. 1, 2003. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. The measures contained in this bill reflect the ongoing implementation of the initiatives of the government to reform the taxation of financial arrangements. The measures amend taxation legislation to remove tax barriers to the issue of traditional securities and to remove anomalies, distortions and gaps in existing laws governing the taxation of foreign currency gains and losses. These reforms will also reduce ongoing compliance costs for business and serve to enhance the efficient operation and competitiveness of Australia's business sector. Schedule 1 addresses a potential cash flow disadvantage that arises where the holder of traditional securities that convert or exchange into ordinary shares does not have the cash from the conversion or exchange to pay the tax on any resultant gains. The amendments address this potential disadvantage by removing the taxing point at the time of conversion or exchange. This will mean that an investor who acquires an ordinary share on the conversion or exchange of a traditional security will not be subject to tax until the ordinary share is ultimately sold. This will improve the ability of business to raise new capital using convertible and exchangeable traditional securities by making them more attractive 
to investors. Schedules 2 and 3 contain technical corrections to the capital gains tax provisions to ensure that they operate as intended for convertible interests and rights, respectively. Amendments addressing foreign currency gains and losses are the second stage of the reforms of the government to the taxation of financial arrangements recommended by the Ralph Review of Business Taxation. These measures have been developed with the benefit of a public consultation process and are broadly supported by business. Schedule 4 addresses a number of uncertainties and anomalies arising under the current law's tax treatment of foreign currency gains and losses. It introduces a general translation rule into the income tax law which will translate foreign currency denominated amounts into Australian dollars. This ensures that Australian income tax liability is calculated by reference to a common unit of account. It also introduces functional currency rules under which the net income or loss of an entity or specified part of an entity that functions predominantly in a particular foreign currency can, under certain circumstances, be determined in that currency with the net amount being converted into Australian dollars. This measure should reduce the compliance costs of business with large international operations. Schedule 4 also introduces a core realisation principle into the income tax law which, together with the translation rule, ensures that foreign currency gains and losses are brought to account when realised, regardless of whether there is an actual conversion of foreign currency amounts into Australian dollars. It ensures that foreign currency gains and losses have a revenue character subject to limited ex exceptions. This schedule also introduces a simplified treatment for certain foreign currency denominated bank accounts and optional rollover relief for the issuer of certain securities under finance arrangements. These two measures were developed in consultation with industry and professional bodies to reduce the costs of compliance for large and small businesses and to reflect commercial finance arrangements. Full details of the measures contained in this bill are included in the explanatory memorandum. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order the debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order the question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill No. 6, 2003. Clark. First reading. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the measures contained in this bill amend various taxation legislation. Schedule 1 to this bill will increase the Medicare levy low-income thresholds for individuals, married couples and sole parents in line with increases in the Consumer Price Index. Schedule 1 also increases the Medicare levy low-income threshold for pensioners below age pension age to ensure that where these pensioners do not have a tax liability, they will not also have a Medicare levy liability. The amendment to the Medicare levy low income thresholds will apply to the 2002-2003 year of income and later years of income. Schedule 2 to this bill will modify the general value shifting regime so that as a transitional measure the consequences arising from operating under this regime do not apply to most indirect value shifts involving services. This measure will help to reduce compliance costs for business during the transition to consolidation. Schedules 3 to 8 further refine the consolidation regime. Schedule 3 will limit the extent to which a linked asset tax cost can change when it comes into a consolidated group, minimising possible distortions in asset values. Schedule 4 modifies the cost-setting rules to ensure they apply appropriately to a partner's interest in a partnership as well as partnerships that enter consolidated groups. Schedules 5 to 7 align the membership rules for multiple entry consolidated groups with the current membership rules for consolidated groups where subsidiaries are held through an interposed non-resident entity. Broadly, only those multiple entry consolidated groups 
that consolidate before 1 July 2004 will be eligible to have non-resident entities interposed between members of the group. Schedule 8 makes some minor technical amendments. These refinements to the consolidation regime will apply from 1 July 2002, which is the commencement date of the consolidation regime. Schedule 9 streamlines the procedures under which an individual taxpayer can be released from a tax liability where payment of the liability would entail serious hardship. The existing authority to grant release will be transferred from tax relief boards to the Commissioner of Taxation. Consistent with contemporary review practices, the amendments will also introduce a new right to have tax relief decisions reviewed internally under the Australian Taxation Office objections process and externally by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal sitting as the Small Taxation Claims Tribunal. Also, the scope of the release arrangements will be expanded to cover instalments of pay-as-you-go and fringe benefits tax under a new tax system. Schedule 10 will amend the imputation rules to allow New Zealand companies to choose to enter the Australian imputation system. A New Zealand company will be able to maintain the Australian franking account and attach Australian franking credits to dividends. This measure will enable Australian shareholders of New Zealand companies deriving income in Australia to receive franking credits and consequently a tax offset for Australian tax paid on that income. This measure fulfills Australia's commitment to the reform of triangular taxation. It reflects the commitment of this government to the continued strengthening of the closer economic relations agreement between Australia and New Zealand and the promotion of trans-Tasman business. Schedule 11 amends the GST Act and the GST Transition Act to apply the GST insurance provisions to payments and supplies made in settlement of claims arising under a compulsory third-party scheme. The GST insurance provisions are also extended to apply to transactions undertaken by insurers pursuant to an agreement to share the cost of settlements made under a compulsory third-party scheme. Lastly, Schedule 12 of this bill provides for the establishment of a new category of deductible gift recipient, namely a register of harm prevention charities. Harm prevention charities are charitable institutions whose principal activity is to promote the prevention or control of behaviour that is harmful or abusive to human beings. Under this measure, these institutions will be entitled to apply to the Australian Taxation Office for endorsement as deductible gift recipients. Such deductible gift recipient status will assist these institutions in attracting public support for their activities. Mr Deputy Speaker, full details of the measures in this bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Deputy Speaker, I present the Superannuation Surcharge Rate Reduction Amendment Bill 2003. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend laws relating to superannuation and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. During the 2001 election campaign, the government announced a package of superannuation reforms designed to make superannuation relatively more attractive compared to other forms of non-concessionally tax savings. One component of this package of measures is the proposal to reduce the maximum superannuation and termination surcharge rates from 15 per cent to 10.5 per cent over three years from 1 July 2002. Implementation of this measure was announced in the 2002-2003 federal budget. This bill will reduce the maximum surcharge rates to 13.5 per cent for the 2002-2003 income year, 12 per cent for the 2003-2004 income year and 10.5 per cent for the 2004-2005 income year. Mr Deputy Speaker, full details of this measure are contained in the explanatory memorandum and I present the explanatory memorandum of the House and commend the bill to the Chamber. Order. This debate must now be adjourned.
The honourable member for Cowan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Notice number three: Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low Income Earners Bill. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I present the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low Income Earners Bill 2003. The clerk. First reading. A bill for an act to provide for contributions to be made towards the superannuation of low-income earners and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Bill 2003 will enact legislation that will establish the arrangements for the government to pay superannuation co-contributions to qualifying low-income earners. This bill, together with the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Consequential Amendments Bill 2003, will fulfil an election commitment announced on 5 November 2001 in a better superannuation system to further assist low-income earners to save for their retirement. The government's co-contribution will replace the existing taxation rebate for personal superannuation contributions made by low-income earners with a more generous co-contribution. The maximum co-contribution of $1,000 compares with the current maximum rebate of $100. This maximum co-contribution will match personal superannuation contributions of up to $1,000 made on or after 1 July 2002 by qualifying people on incomes of $20,000 or less. This maximum will then be tapered for each dollar of income over $20,000, meaning that some co-contribution will be available to qualifying people on incomes up to $32,500. Full details of the measures contained in the bill are included in the explanatory memorandum. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I present the superannuation Government uh, Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Consequential Amendments Bill 2003. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to make amendments consequential on the enactment of the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Act 2003 and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. The Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Consequential Amendments Bill 2003 will make amendments consequential on the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Bill 2003. This will enable the government to fulfil an election commitment announced on 5 November 2001 in a better superannuation system to further assist low-income earners to save for their retirement. The details of the arrangements for the government to pay superannuation co-contributions to low-income earners are contained in the Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Bill 2003. The Superannuation Government Co-Contribution for Low-Income Earners Consequential Amendments Bill 2003 will amend a number of taxation and superannuation laws that deal with eligibility for and taxation treatment of government co-contributions and arrangements for certain defence personnel and Commonwealth public servants regarding co-contributions, use of the superannuation holding accounts reserved for co-contributions in some circumstances and review of certain decisions. It will also repeal the existing personal superannuation contribution taxation rebate. Full details of the measures contained in this bill are, presented, are contained in the explanatory memorandum, which I have already tabled, uh, a joint explanatory memorandum with respect to this bill and the previous bill. Order. 
The debate must now be adjourned. The honourable member for Cowan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I present the Customs Tariff Amendment Bill <coughs> No. 2, 2003. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, contains amendments to the Customs Tariff Act 1995. In brief, the amendments in this bill impose additional customs duty of 38.143 cents per <coughs> litre on ethanol for use as a fuel in an internal combustion engine as a consequence of the decision of the government to remove excise exemption on ethanol. This rate of duty is the same as the rate currently applying to petrol. These amendments complement amendments to the Excise Tariff Act 1921 contained in the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 2003. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance and Administration. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Excise Tariff, Amendment Bill No. 1, 2003. Clark. First reading. A bill for an act to amend the Excise Tariff Act 1921 and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 2003, amends the Excise Tariff Act 1921 to validate the changes made by Excise Tariff Proposal No. 4, 2002. This proposal removed the excise exemption from fuel ethanol from 18 September 2002 and imposed an excise duty rate equivalent to that applying to petroleum currently 38.143 cents per litre. Customs Tariff Proposal No. 3, 2002, made complementary changes to the customs duty on imported fuel ethanol. The measure was introduced as part of the strategy of the government to encourage the use of biofuels in transport in Australia. At the same time, the government introduced a domestic production subsidy for new and existing producers of fuel ethanol at a rate of 38.143 cents a litre. This subsidy, administered by the Department of Industry, Tourism and Resources, was a targeted means of maintaining the use of biofuels in transport in Australia while the government considered longer-term arrangements. Ongoing arrangements have been announced in the budget. The amendments to the Excise Tariff Act 1921 alter the classification of denatured ethanol for use as fuel and impose an excise rate equivalent to petroleum. A new formula was inserted in the Excise Tariff Act 1921 for determining the duty payable on a blend of fuel ethanol and other petroleum products reflecting the changed classification and rate of duty. Complementary changes to customs legislation are being addressed through Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003. Full details of the measures in the bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The honourable member for Cowan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. It's number four, Criminal Code Amendment Terrorist Organisations. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I present the Criminal Code Amendment Terrorist Organisations Bill 2003. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. Attorney. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11, 2001 signalled a terrifying new phase in international terrorism, and they marked the beginning of what has become known as the war against terrorism. Just 13 months later, the terrible reality of this war was brought home to Australia with a bomb attack on Bali, a favourite destination of Australian holidaymakers. Recent bomb blasts in Saudi Arabia and Morocco have killed an estimated 66 people, including at least one Australian, and another Australian was killed by a suicide bomber in Iraq. Terrorism is clearly not an abstract phenomenon and not one from which any country is isolated. In recent months, we have witnessed major developments in the war against terrorism. Key al-Qaeda figures have been captured. The brutal regime of Saddam Hussein has been dismantled and the criminal proceedings against those alleged to be responsible for the bombings in Bali have commenced. But there is no doubt that the war against terrorism is ongoing. Australia did not ask for this war. We did, did not ask for Australians to get caught up in terrorist attacks in the United States, in Bali, Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, but they were. Australians have been killed and others have been seriously injured in terrorist attacks. Terrorism is a very real threat to world peace and it is a real threat to Australia's national security. The safety and security of the Australian community and Australian interests is a top priority of the government. It is a responsibility this government takes very seriously. Our response to the threat of terrorism has been comprehensive and wide-ranging and it is a task which is ongoing. In the current environment, complacency is not an option. As part of our comprehensive approach to the new security environment, the government developed a package of strong counter-terrorism legislation, the bulk of which was passed by the parliament in July last year. Included in that legislation were amendments to the criminal code allowing the listing of terrorist organisations subject to certain strict conditions, including the requirement that the terrorist organisation be identified as such by the United Nations Security Council. The requirement that Australia wait for the UN Security Council to agree with our own assessment of what constitutes a threat to Australians and Australian interests before we can act was an amendment and insisted upon by the opposition. The government argued at the time that this potentially created problems where Australia identifies threats by terrorist organisations that do not interest members of the UN Security Council. UN lists are limited to organisations with links to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Australia is currently in the unsatisfactory position that we cannot act independently of the United Nations to list a terrorist organisation posing a threat to Australia and Australian interests. Other countries can decide for themselves which terrorist organisations pose a threat to their citizens and to their interests and act accordingly. In fact, we know of no other country whose power to list terrorist organisations is linked to the United Nations. But thanks to the opposition, Australia cannot act independently of the United Nations Security Council. We cannot list the terrorist wing of Hezbollah because it has not been formally identified as a terrorist organisation by the UN Security Council. Yet we have advised from ASIO that there is evidence that this organisation engages in terrorist activity and has the capacity to do so globally. Indeed, the US, the UK and Canada have all listed the terrorist wing of Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation under their laws. The government has moved quickly to list the terrorist organisations under our laws. However, the Security Council has only ever operated as a mechanism for identifying terrorist organisations linked to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda under resolutions 1267 and 1333. As is the case with the terrorist wing of Hezbollah, we cannot list a terrorist organisation that has not been formally identified as a terrorist organisation by the UN Security Council. Of course, where there is a connection to Al-Qaeda, we can approach the United Nations to identify an organisation as a terrorist organisation. We did this in the case of Jamar Islamia. Beyond that, our current legislative arrangements constrain our ability to act in our national interest and to independently list a terrorist organisation, thereby attracting the full weight of the criminal law. The current mechanism has proved to be unworkable. This is particularly anomalous given that the Hezbollah External Security Organisation has been listed by the Minister for Foreign Affairs under the Charter of the United Nations Act as a terrorist entity, the assets of which must be frozen in Australia. It is clear that we must have the capacity to independently assess and act on threats to Australians and Australian interests without waiting to see if the rest of the world agrees. The Criminal Code Amendment Terrorist Organisations Bill will amend 
Part 5.3 of the Criminal Code Act 1995 by removing the requirement for there to be a relevant Security Council decision in place before we can list organisations as terrorist organisations for the purpose of our domestic criminal law. The bill gives to us independence to make our own decisions about our national security and the application of our criminal laws. It allows us to list terrorist organisations based on the advice of our intelligence agencies and an assessment of our national interest and security needs. And it allows us to delist organisations that cease to meet the definition of a terrorist organisation. The bill retains a number of important safeguards on the exercise of the listing power. Importantly, to list an organisation as a terrorist organisation in regulations, the Attorney General must make a deliberate and reasoned decision that an organisation is engaged in preparing, planning, assisting in or fostering the doing of a terrorist act before listing that organisation as a terrorist organisation. That decision will be subject to the Administrative Decisions Judicial Re Review Act 1977, which provides an important safeguard on the exercise of this discretion. And any regulation is subject to disallowance by Parliament. Further, the bill preserves the requirement that the regulations listing a terrorist organisation cease to have effect on the second anniversary of the day on which they take effect. This is in addition to the obligation imposed on the Attorney-General to delist organisations when he or she is no longer satisfied that the organisation meets the criteria for defining a terrorist organisation. If passed, this bill will allow us to move quickly to list those organisations that, notwithstanding the absence of a Security Council decision, should be appropriately identified as terrorist organisations under Australian law. This bill is further evidence of the government's continuing commitment to taking all appropriate action to ensure that terrorist threats are dealt with effectively and expeditiously. And it is clear that Australia needs to have this independence. The opposition has indicated that it will not support this bill. In such circumstances, the government is introducing a second bill, the Criminal Code Amendment Hezbollah Bill 2003, that will allow the terrorist wing of Hezbollah to be listed in regulations, provided the statutory criteria for listing are met. We are introducing the second bill because we recognise the need to take swift action. And that is why we proposed the amendments to the Opposition and the States and Territories some two months ago. The simple fact is that we cannot wait for the Opposition to wake up to the problems they created and support our first bill. As a result of the second bill, the Hezbollah terrorist wing will be listed as a terrorist organisation for the purpose of the Criminal Code, provided that the Attorney-General is satisfied that the organisation is directly or indirectly engaged in preparing, planning assisting in or fostering the doing of a terrorist act, whether or not the terrorist act has occurred or will occur. If the Attorney-General is so satisfied, a public statement to that effect will be issued. Appropriate regulations will be made and gazetted with effect from the date of that announcement. Any such announcement will be widely publicised in both print and electronic media, and that announcement will only be made after consideration of available relevant intelligence that satisfies the Attorney-General that the criteria for listing an organisation as a terrorist organisation have been met. The Opposition has admitted that their UN listing process is flawed by acknowledging the inability to list the terrorist wing of Hezbollah. However, the Opposition has also indicated that it will not support a move to make us independent of the United Nations Security Council processes. In an attempt to cover up its mistake, the Leader of the Opposition has announced his intention to introduce legislation specifically listing Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation directly in the legislation. This is despite knowing that this so-called solution is constitutionally uncertain. As I informed the House yesterday, our legal advice is that the Opposition's proposal gives rise to constitutional uncertainty. That should clearly be avoided in such important legislation. <coughs> Singling out organisations by name and legislation without mechanisms to overcome constitutional concerns could invite challenges to validity on potentially wider grounds than simply lack of power. This constitutional uncertainty could undermine future prosecutions of terrorists, and that is something the government simply will not accept. Our legal advice is to the effect that our second bill will not give rise to the same constitutional uncertainties that plague the opposition's proposal. This bill is intended to be complementary, not an alternative to the first bill. Together they create a legislative framework that deals with the immediate issue of the security threat represented by the terrorist wing of Hezbollah and the longer term issue of how Australia can act independently of the Security Council in relation to our domestic criminal laws. While we 
welcome the oppos opposition's indication that it will support the government's Hezbollah-specific bill. The opposition has indicated they will continue to obstruct the passage of our first bill. The government intends to vigorously pursue passage of our first bill. The opposition's position on our first bill ignores the longer-term problem that we will not be able to act quickly or effectively if other terrorist organisations come to light that pose a potential threat to Australia but have not been listed by the United Nations Security Council. It does not solve the longer-term problem created by the opposition's UN-linked listing provisions. That is why we are forced to proceed with two bills. This is a serious matter of national security. The government will not allow the opposition's obstinance to paralyse us and prevent what must be done to ensure the safety and security of Australia and Australia's interests. We trust that the opposition will wake up to the problems they created and support our first bill. I call on the opposition to put politics aside and support both government bills in the interests of the security of Australia. I commend the bill to the House. I present the explanatory memorandum to the bill. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is the resumption of the debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number five, Criminal Code Amendment, Hezbollah Bill. The Attorney General. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Criminal Code Amendment, Hezbollah Bill 2003. The Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 in relation to the Hezbollah External Security Organisation and for related purposes. Attorney. Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. As I have just indicated, this second bill, the Criminal Code Amendment Hezbollah Bill 2003, will allow the terrorist wing of Hezbollah to be listed in regulations, provided the statutory criteria for listing are met. As a result of the second bill, the terrorist wing of Hezbollah will be listed as a terrorist organisation for the purpose of the Criminal Code, provided that the Attorney-General is satisfied that the organisation is directly or indirectly engaged in preparing, planning, assisting in or fostering the doing of a terrorist act whether or not the terrorist act has occurred or will occur. If the Attorney-General is so satisfied, a public statement to that effect will be issued. Appropriate regulations will be made and gazetted with effect from the date of that announcement. I call on the opposition to support this bill and the Criminal Code Amendment Terrorist Organisations Bill 2003 in the interests of the security of Australia. I commend the bill to the House. I present the explanatory memorandum to the bill. Order. This debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2003-2004, Second Reading, Resumption of the Budget Debate, uh, and on the amendment moved by the Member for Fraser. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member for Fraser has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Warrawa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is a bad budget for the working families of my electorate, especially with its attack on bulk billing and higher education. The government's sandwich and milkshake tax cuts, just $4 a week, will be wiped out many times over by the introduction of a $20 upfront fee for visiting GPs and a 30 per cent surcharge on HECS. Yet again, the Treasurer, Mr Costello, has failed to stand up and fight for the working families of my electorate. And the parliament is entitled to ask why is it budget after budget, year after year, the Treasurer refuses to stand up and fight? Well, the truth, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the Treasurer won't stand up and fight for himself. He won't fight for himself, let alone the hard-working families of Middle Australia. This is one of the golden rules of public life. If a politician won't stand up and fight for himself, there's no way in which he will stand up and fight for his constituents. Indeed, the Treasurer has a bad record, a lifelong record, of dogging a serious fight. As I said yesterday in question time, if you opened up that chest of his, all you would find is a split pea, a heart the size of a split pea. The Treasurer has a very bad history of dogging it. 
He dogged it when he moved from Young Labor to the Liberal Party. He dogged it when he moved from the Baptist Church to the Anglican Church. How do you start your time in politics as a Young Labor Baptist and end up a Liberal Party Anglican? <laughs> I've heard about the road to Damascus, but this is ridiculous. He starts as a Young Labor Baptist and ends up as a Liberal Party Anglican. And indeed, in this place, we've had some very bad rats, some very bad rats over the years, and names like Billy Hughes and Joe Lyons come to mind. But the Treasurer, Mr Costello, was the first member in this place, the first member of the House of Representatives to have changed both his political party and his religion. What a daily double, going the transfer of political party affiliation plus religion. So he has no loyalty. Well, that's right. If you're at the Essendon Football Club, as the member for Bass points out, you'd be very worried about that. He's likely to see the light and end up supporting Collingwood, as any good person would. So the Treasurer has no loyalty to his party or his religion, and how can he be loyal and faithful to the needs of working families? He's got a bad record, a lifelong record, of dogging a serious fight. And I refer the House to Sean Carney's biography of the Treasurer produced in recent times. At page 64, he records an incident in the politics of Monash University when the Treasurer was confronted by one of his student colleagues, Red Bingham. And uh, Mr Sean Carney writes, Red Bingham confronted Costello in the MAS office, challenged him about refusing to fund Piranha and then belted him. Costello's cries of, Red, Red, stop hitting me, became the stuff of legend on the left, a sign that Costello talked tough but was really just a cream puff. Well, there you have it, dog to fight, wouldn't stand up and fight for himself, lying on his back like a mangy dog, saying, Red, Red, stop hitting me. The stuff of legend at Monash and now the stuff of a disappointing budget in this House of Representatives. Carney goes on to say that in a subsequent newspaper article in the Melbourne Age, he, Mr Costello, was quoted in the article as describing his political stance as moderate ALP. Well, he's come a long way in terms of his uh, political uh, dogging of a fight, his political shift of allegiance, but that style, that refusal to stand up and fight for yourself is still evident. He's still the same Peter Costello who refuses to stand up and fight for himself. And of course, how can anyone who won't fight for themselves in public life uh, ever fight for the hard-working families of middle Australia? So we've got many great sayings in Australian politics, Mr Deputy Speaker, many great sayings. There's Malcolm Fraser, life wasn't meant to be easy. Gough Whitlam, nothing will save the Governor General. Little Richo, whatever it takes. And now we have Peter Costello, don't hit me red. Don't hit me red. That was his lasting memory and testament at Monash University. So he won't stand up and fight for himself. He won't stand up and fight for the working families of this country. And so too the Treasurer won't stand up and fight for the truth. He won't stand up and fight for the truth on the economic record of this nation. We heard in the question time following the budget that uh, the Treasurer was claiming there had been a smaller tax cut than his own $4 a week. $4 a week is not much. As Senator Vanstone said, it won't buy you a sandwich and a milkshake. And Mr Costello was trying to claim there had in fact been smaller tax cuts and he referred to the LAW tax cuts of the Keating government. Well, in fact, he's playing fast and loose with the truth because in fact the LAW tax cuts were paid in the 1993-94 budget they were paid from the 15th of November 1993, eight months before they were planned, at a full year cost to the budget of $3.45 billion. This is revealed at Table 2, Revenue Measures, at page 4.5 of Statement 2 of the 1993 budget papers. These tax cuts were paid in advance, eight months before planned, and were much larger, much larger than the tax cuts that are now before the House. In fact, the Treasurer misled the House two weeks ago in telling us that these tax cuts did not pay one dollar to one person for one day, talking about the LAW tax cuts, when in fact the average level of tax relief in 1993 was $8 per week. The Treasurer should now apologise to the House for willfully misleading it. In fact, the Treasurer himself is the culprit, order, the culprit the of any problem with the 1993 careful. tax cuts. The Honourable Member should be very careful with the way in which he couches his remarks about actions of another member.
The Honourable Member for Werriwa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In fact, the Treasurer was the culprit because in the 1996 election campaign, along with the Prime Minister, he promised to keep the second half of the LAW tax cuts. The first half were paid in full in advance, and the Treasurer and the Prime Minister promised to keep the second half to be paid as a 3 per cent superannuation co-contribution at a full year cost to the budget of $4.34 billion. So the breaker, the breach, of the LAW tax cuts, in fact, was the Treasurer himself, Mr Costello. He presents himself in this House day after day as the gamekeeper when, in fact, he is the poacher. He is the poacher. He's the one who, uh, after the 1996 election campaign, broke his promise to pay the second half of the uh, tax cuts in the form of a 3 per cent superannuation co-contribution. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, having put those matters on the public record, having explained to the House how the Treasurer never stands up to fight for himself, so don't expect him to fight for the families of middle Australia. Let me explain the ways in which he has let down and disappointed the hard-working families of my constituency in the southwest of Sydney. This is a very bad budget for the people of my electorate. It attacks working families and the services, the essential community services on which they rely. Uh, it attacks uh, Medicare and bulk billing. Yesterday in the House on health funding legislation, I explained the way in which my electorate has the most to lose out of the government's attack on bulk billing. How in the southwest of Sydney we're known as the children's capital of Australia and also the bulk billing capital of the nation, with 95 per cent of doctors offering a bulk billing service to their patients. So people know that these changes are bad and that in the southwest of Sydney we have the most to lose as the government winds back the provision of bulk billing around the country. In the electorate of Werriwa, we have the most to lose. And I strongly oppose the dismantling of Medicare. I strongly oppose the dismantling of bulk billing. I will stand up as forcefully as I can for the principles of universal health care in my electorate. So too, the government is making it tougher for families in my electorate with its 30 per cent increase in higher education fees. In particular, this punishes our local hero, the University of Western Sydney. The historic role of that university is to ensure that many students, the first generation and their families, go on to a higher education. But unhappily, under the Howard government, the University of Western Sydney has faced nothing but funding cuts and higher fee charges. Uh, since 1996, the university has lost $270 million of federal funding and has lost 3,700 government-funded student places. This reduction in capital funding is a savage blow to the University of Western Sydney. The university is now being forced to use licensed club facilities such as sporting and RSL clubs to hold its lectures and tutorials. It hasn't got enough teaching space on campus to make provision for the many students in Western Sydney who need and demand a higher education. It's having to conduct its classes in licensed clubs. So it just makes you wonder in a civilised society where education is the great hope for young families what it's come to when we're using licensed sporting clubs to conduct tutorials and lectures. It's not a good situation for the University of Western Sydney, uh, but they've been forced into it because of the savage funding cuts of the Howard government. So too, the 30% increase, the increase in HECS debt is a savage blow to the working families of my electorate. There's only so much debt that low to middle income families can carry before they turn their back on a university education. I know this from my own experience. I know this from growing up in a public housing estate. There's only so much debt that low-income families can carry before they are forced to turn their back on a higher education. I reject some of the assertions, some of the barracking that's been going on in the media about the government's changes. I noticed that in the Australian newspaper on the 21st of May, Paul Kelly was quoting Bruce Chapman to say that the way poor people view a hex loan and debt is similar to the way that rich people view them. Well, I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, what nonsense, what absolute nonsense. Let them live in a family where the parents argue about debt. Let them live in a family where low-income people have disputes about the family budget. Let them grow up in a family where your parents argued about debt and then try and tell me that people from that sort of background have the same view and attitudes to debt as rich people. That is just absolute nonsense. There is a cultural and attitudinal change, not surprisingly, that can make low-income people ad, 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 averse to the carriage of high levels of debt. And that's why these hex changes are so damaging. Why should a bright student who works hard at school, getting good results, be forced away from a higher education 
because of their aversion to debt. Why? Why in a fair and decent society should that happen? Well, I say it shouldn't happen. I think we should have special consideration of the circumstances of low-income families and their particular attitude to debt and have a system that's affordable and accessible for all. Universal, universal public subsidy of higher education. And I know that the Minister for Education, Dr Nelson, is not opposed to the ideas of universality in education. Yesterday in the House he gave an answer about uh, private school funding. He said that the Howard government is proud to ensure that all schools in Australia, all non-government schools in particular, have a level of public subsidy. That level of subsidy varies, of course, from school to school, but they have a system of universal public subsidisation of non-government schools. So why then in higher education are they requiring some Australian students to pay the full fee, to have absolutely no public subsidy and to pay a full fee for their higher education? Why is it that the government supports universal, universal non-government school funding but won't support universal higher education provision in this country? It's a shocking piece of hypocrisy, a shocking contradiction that shouldn't be supported by this parliament. So, I know from uh, my own background, my own background, and I know from my own electorate, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, if I had been forced uh, back in 1978, 79, to consider uh, high levels of hex debt, I couldn't have gone on to a higher education. And I'm worried that there are many hundreds, if not thousands, of people in uh, southwestern Sydney, young students working hard, working their guts out at school, getting good results, who will find that they're in a similar situation, that if they had to contemplate high levels of debt at an early stage of their life, they will turn their back on a higher education. Effectively, Mr Deputy Speaker, they'll have to turn their back on their very best opportunity in life. I just think that's disgusting. I just find that disgusting. And uh, we had the member for Parramatta talking about the things that make him sick. I just feel sick in the stomach at the idea of hard-working students out of public housing states in my electorate thinking, I can't carry all that debt. I can't carry a 30 per cent increase in debt at an early stage in life. I've heard what's been said about our family budget in the home. I've heard some of the disputes. I'm going to turn my back. I'll have to go and look for a job. I won't be able to undertake a university education and do good things for the future. I just find that absolutely sickening and quite barbaric, quite barbaric. I know for the Liberal members who don't come across these things, they don't have the public housing estates in their electorate, they don't see this part of life, they don't see the other side of the tracks. But I tell you, it exists. It exists, and you want to do everything you can in the education system to ensure there's public universality, that every single student who works hard, who gets good results at school, can go on and get a higher education. The thing that so many of us in this parliament take for granted, I'm very fortunate. I was a beneficiary of the Whitlam education reforms. Education, higher education at that time was relatively free, relatively inexpensive. Um, but uh, today, of course, it's a different situation and so many more people, uh, so many uh, students in southwestern Sydney will be forced away from their best opportunity in life. Now, the Minister for Education, Dr Nelson, often makes the point that 70 per cent of uh, Australian students don't see the inside of a university. Well, I know one certainty. I know one certainty, particularly in my part of the world. 100 per cent of parents hope and pray that their children do, so, do, do see the inside of an Australian university, and they're quite happy to contribute to that system. 100 per cent of parents hope and pray that their child is successful enough at school to go on to a university education. And in a civilised society where our taxes buy us a slice of civilisation, we should support those parents and ensure that the public subsidies are there to uh, uh, provide the opportunities for the bright and hard-working students who go through to a higher education. We should back their aspirations. We should be backing an ambitious Australia where there's plenty of aspiration for a higher education and plenty of government support for that legitimate ideal. The other source of disadvantage in my electorate, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the, uh, the, funding, cut, the funding cut to the University of Western Sydney and the fact that this university is not classified as a regional university. It's not going to be receiving any additional funding from the government. The government funding package has some money for regional universities, but the University of Western Sydney is not classified as a regional institution. So this is typical of the Howard government, jumping straight from the inner city out to pork barrelling and national party electorates, jumping straight over the outer suburbs, failing to classify them as regional universities and denying them the extra funding they need to provide a decent higher education for students in my electorate. There are other sources of neglect in this budget, Mr Deputy Speaker. For instance, uh, many parts of my electorate miss out 
on high-speed broadband access, ADSL access, by Telstra. The new suburbs of Cecil Hills, West Hoxton, Greenway Park, Horningsea Park in the western areas of Liverpool have got no access to high-speed broadband access. Again, the government has jumped over the outer suburbs, sent all the Telstra privatisation money to national party electorates and its neglected outer metropolitan areas. This uh, absence of ADSL uh, internet provision by Telstra is bad for the education of our children. Why shouldn't hard-working students with a computer in the home in Western Sydney have access to high-speed internet provision? It's bad for small business. The whole struggle for 20 or 30 years in my electorate is to move the jobs, move the industry, move the investment to where the people have moved in such large numbers. Well, the absence of ADSL access is very bad for small businesses that might want to work out of their home and uh, create new investment and employment opportunities in southwest Sydney. So I urge Telstra and the federal government to roll out this uh, high-speed broadband access to all parts of metropolitan Sydney, not just the inner city, and then not just the pork barrelling for national party electorates. How about doing something? How about looking after the outer suburbs instead of jumping straight over them and neglecting their needs? Uh, another source of uh, neglect in this budget is the absence of initiatives for law and order. I believe that this is an important issue. We need safe and secure suburbs and streets. The public wants solutions. They don't particularly care where law and order solutions come from, whether it's local, state or federal government. They just want a solution. But all you get from the Howard government is buck passing the problem on to the states. Uh, I uh, support and Labor supports the establishment of community security zones to tackle the social causes of crime, to recognise there is a social and community dimension to the crime problem and to target areas such as Campbelltown and Liverpool for particular remedies. We have, for instance, a serious graffiti problem in the Ingleburn Township. The Chamber of Commerce, the local community, some of the local police have been working hard to try and resolve that issue, but they lack the resources to tackle this particular community problem, the problem of graffiti in Ingleburn. It's one of the uh, issues, one of the problems that would be targeted by the establishment of a community security zone with additional federal resources to work with the community, work with the Chamber of Commerce to get a lasting solution. So too, this is a government that neglects serious issues of urban environment and uh, urban sprawl in Western Sydney. In our region, we're a very successful multicultural community, but we also need to recognise that there has been too much population growth into South West Sydney, too much population growth planned for the future, both by internal and external migration. Labor, of course, has a population policy approach to influence the locational decisions of new arrivals to this country. It's a good approach because for those regions such as South Australia, Tasmania, other parts of regional Australia that want more population growth, well, of course, they want and need and deserve extra migration arrivals. But in South West Sydney, we need to recognise a population limit. There's only so much growth that our region can accommodate, particularly in terms of the fragile urban environment, particularly in terms of air and water quality problems. I strongly oppose the Brinjelli development, for instance, the construction of a new city of 300,000 people to the west of Liverpool, carrying, uh, carrying a huge volume of cars and extra congestion on our region. The truth is the existing roads, Cow Pasture Road, Camden Valley Way, Campbelltown Road, Currajong Road, Benira Road, they can't cope with the existing suburbs and the existing traffic volume. We don't need a new suburb, a new city in the southwest of Sydney. We need a population limit, good urban planning, and most Order. of all, some provision by the federal government for essential Order. infrastructure. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise in the House today to speak on appropriation bills number one, number two, and appropriation bill parliamentary departments bill. I'm honoured to be a member of this coalition government, which in this budget is handing down its sixth consecutive budget surplus. The performance of the Australian economy has been outstanding against a backdrop of slow world economic growth and the drought. This economic performance is due in no small part to strong economic management of this government. Despite the initial expenditure, additional expenditure required for the war on terror and greater demands on home security and the huge cost to government of the drought, this government has again delivered a budget surplus. A surplus has been delivered by the Treasurer Costello, along with modest tax cuts, at a time of increased spending on defence and security. 
This budget includes very important announcements with respect to higher education and is particularly significant for regional universities. These are far-reaching reforms to Australian system of higher education. I believe these reforms are balanced and highly focused. Through strengthening our universities, including specific measures for, for regional universities, the changes introduced in this budget set a framework for higher, the higher education sector and individual institutions to deliver high quality education for students and to, and to conduct high quality research. These aims will be accomplished through the $1.5 billion increase in funding to be allocated to higher education over the next four years. The Treasurer told the House that these reforms would be fully in place by 2010 and there will be an increase of 17 per cent over 10 years in real terms. Universities will be encouraged through incentives to improve their internal governance and workplace relations. Such reforms are due and they are appropriate. They recognise universities are tasked with delivering higher education to their students and they must be efficient and highly focused in that objective. Under the proposed reforms, universities are to be given flexibility in relation to fee setting. These announcements are designed to produce better outcomes for students. But students will also receive other direct benefits, such as assistance through a new higher education loan program to help with the payment of fees. The HEX repayment threshold will be raised from $24,365 a year to $30,000, directly alleviating some of the current financial pressures on thousands of graduates and, of course, assisting countless students into the future. The HEX system is something which occasionally comes under fire from various quarters. But I've been reading with a great deal of interest some of the commentary in the media over this issue and the budget's higher education reforms. It is interesting to note media reports which have been generally supportive of the proposed reforms. And I note comments in the uh, Australian newspaper of the 21st of May which quoted the Australian National University's Bruce Chapman, I might add a former Keating advisor, and in the article by Paul Kelly highlighted the point that the Whitlam government's uh, abolition of fees, and I quote, had no discernible effects on the socio-economic composition of higher education students. An interesting point, no discernible effects on the socio-economic composition of the student population. And most no notably, it did not lead to a greater proportion of poor students going to university. The article goes on to state that the overall distribution effect was from poor to the better off, since there are a greater proportion of better off students at university. Chapman describes the free university system, and I quote, as unquestionably regressive. Kelly makes the important observation that HEX introduced by Labor, with the support of the coalition, had no detrimental effect on access to university, and that in a recent paper by Chapman and Chris Ryan, they found that those from less privileged backgrounds were no more discouraged from attending university in 1999 than they had been in 1988, which was when HEX started. They form the view that there is nothing in the HEX system that disadvantages the poor. The carping mindless opposition across the chamber should note, take note of these important points. In fact, HEX is a scheme founded in equity. Under HEX, both students and the government contribute to the cost of education, and the student's contribution is deferred. In fact, the only upfront front, uh, payment faced by students is the compulsory union fee, and we want to abolish that unlike Labor and the Democrats. It is important to note that the, the uh, student contribution uh, of the cost of a degree is deferred and a partial contribution at that. The student actually only pays 27 per cent of the cost of the university education, with the government contributing the other 73 per cent by virtue of many taxpayers who have never seen the inside of a university. And as I've said earlier, the reforms will also benefit from an increase in the threshold of, of HEX to $30,000 before repayments start. This scheme is sound, it is fair, it is equitable, and it ensures that public higher education is affordable, progressive and sustainable. Financially disadvantaged students will be assisted by three new scholarship programs costing $162 million over four years. The package of measures also puts an extra $113 million over four years into quality assurance and promoting Australian education and training to overseas markets, a market which brings in $5 billion in export earnings each year. 
However, I must particularly congratulate the government on the specific measures for regional universities in this announcement. One of the cornerstones of, higher education, of the higher education reform package is the proposal to boost regional universities by providing an injection of an additional $122.6 million. It is to the credit of the Minister for Education that he has recognised the importance of universities in regional Australia and the additional costs and difficulties faced by them as a result of their location. Additional funds will be incorporated into the new Commonwealth Grant Scheme and will particularly benefit the Coffs Harbour campus of Southern Cross University in my electorate of Cowper. The funds are to be allocated on the basis of regionality, which is to be determined from the size and distance from the mainland capital city of the campus. I am pleased the Southern Cross University's Coffs Harbour campus will receive the second highest level of loading allocation in Australia under this measure of 7.5 per cent. This will be a significant and a welcome injection of funds into the university and the Coffs Harbour campus itself. This measure will benefit the students at the campus and also the wider region, and I thank the Minister for Education for his work in bringing about these measures which are so beneficial to regional universities, and particularly the Coffs Harbour campus. Professor John Rickard, Vice-Chancellor of the Southern Cross University, reacted to these announcements by saying that the budget recognises the situation often faced by universities in, in regional areas and that they are in fact at a disadvantage. And he also notes the fact that of, the, of the important contribution that regional universities make. He said that the extra funding coming under this budget could be uh, put into offering components of courses for the first time at the Coffs campus and also expanding those programs already in place. The Treasurer announced last Tuesday the budget is setting aside some $161 million for teaching and nursing and other priority courses, and there is to be at least an extra 574 places in nursing by 2007. This is a highly commendable measure and will also be welcomed in the Cowper electorate. I might mention to the House that there are moves afoot at Southern Cross University to establish a course in aged care nursing at Coffs Harbour. This is a particularly relevant and important area for the community uh, in a region which has a, an ageing demographic. I am hopeful a course will be created at the Coffs Harbour campus and it will become a recognised centre of excellence in this field. It will certainly be something that brings great opportunity for young people and others wishing to enter this expanding vocation. A vital part of improving university education for students is the abolition of compulsory union fees. I believe in freedom of association as opposed to forced association and the compulsory membership of student unions. Abolishing compulsory union fees for students is welcomed by many students in my electorate. And offering choice is a very important factor, I believe. How can the Labor Party stand for equity when they support compulsory union fees? They don't stand for freedom of association. That's why I oppose the government, they oppose the government's moves to abolish compulsory union fees. I call on those opposites to support the lifting of what is an upfront cash fee on students going to universities. You can't claim to stand for the rights and interests of students if you can't stand up for freedom of association. This budget has been delivered in a period where the dangers of international terrorism are rising and our national security is at the forefront of our considerations. In the last year, there has been considerable cost involved in Australia's commitment to the international coalition against terrorism and, in particular, our endeavours to fight this threat and liberate the Iraqi people from the tyranny of Saddam Hussein and his regime. That is an issue on which I have spoken on a number of occasions in this House. The Treasurer reports that the cost of these commitments to the budget is $645 million, which includes some rehabilitation, reconstruction and humanitarian expenditure. A further $100 million has been committed for urgent humanitarian relief for the Iraqi people. There is a continuing commitment of our troops in East Timor at a cost to the budget of some $500 million. The Treasurer announced $2.1 billion over five years in new defence spending, bringing total defence spending up to $15 billion in the coming fiscal year. This is an absolutely necessary area of expenditure. The world is not the place it once was, and we must protect our nation. This government delivers on its commitment to the Australian people to do all it can to ensure that our country is protected from the threats against it. It also delivers on a duty to those who serve on the front line, our defence force personnel, our emergency services and so on, 
that the money is there to back them up so they have the resources they need to do their job and do it well. The recent announcement of a Special Operations Command in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet is a welcome one. It will enable a coordinated approach between federal and state agencies. In this package, which enhances Australian security arrangements, an additional $152 million will be put into vital intelligence services to add to their counter-terrorism capabilities. I am particularly moved by the budget measure allocating $10.5 million to fund a new intensive care centre for the Sangla Hospital in Denpasar in commemoration of the Australian victims of the 2002 bombing and to recognise the assistance provided by the Balinese to Australians in a time of need. The Disability Employment Assistance Area is another key uh, area which will receive a boost in this budget. This $160 million measure will offer assistance to 90,000 people with disabilities across Australia and hundreds within my electorate of Cowper. This government has been reforming this policy area since 1996 towards a focus on the individual needs of job seekers. The announcements in this budget recognise different barriers are faced by different supported seekers, job seekers, and it puts in place measures which address that fact. As an example of how these new measures would work, uh, I would uh, give the following uh, example. A person with a high support need in rural Australia might decide they want to undertake an IT traineeship. With the funding assistance announced in this budget, the employment service will receive up to $16,660 to help and support the client in ongoing work, up to $7,000 to provide work-based personal care, up to $5,000 in travel assistance and another $660 for getting the client the traineeship. This compares with a total of $7,000 in assistance which would currently be available. There is also practical help for businesses employing supported employees, including a $25.4 million package. And as I have said, these measures will be of assistance to many thousands of Australians. I welcome the regional partnerships announcement. This announcement integrates a number of initiatives for regional Australia into one. It effectively extends the Regional Solutions Program, which was due to expire at the end of the coming fiscal year. The Regional Solutions Program has been a highly successful initiative for the regional communities. By way of example, the Minister for Regional Services, Territories and Local Government, Minister Tucky, recently announced a $52,000 Regional Solutions Program grant for the Royal Volunteer Coastal Patrol Headquarters and Communications Facility in Coffs Harbour. Not only is this a program which importantly injects funds into regional economies like Coffs Harbour, but it helps local communities with projects such as this, which will immediately enhance communication and search and rescue services provided by the Coastal P Patrol for the many seagoers in the region. The Regional Solutions Program is also providing $137,500 in Woolgulga for a senior citizen centre. A $222,000 grant under the Rural Transaction Centres Initiative has established an RTC in Barrowville, which I recently had the pleasure of opening. The RTC program, which will also be rolled into the new regional, uh, regional partnerships, provides funds to help small communities such as Barrowville to provide access to services. Those services can include areas such as financial services, postal services, phone, fax and internet services, Medicare Easy Claim, Centrelink, facilities for visiting professionals, printing and secretarial services, insurance and taxation services, uh, and a variety of other state and federal services. These services are vital to regional locations like Varable, which are effectively isolated by virtue of low levels of car ownership and a disadvantaged community that exists in that area. Whilst the federal government's role in the provision of public health care is limited, with jurisdiction primarily being held by the states and territories, the Commonwealth does play an important role in ensuring access to health care through Medicare and providing funding assistance to the states and territories for hospitals. This budget incl includes and builds on some vitally important announcements which, have, made, uh, which are, have been recently made with relation to Australia's health system. The Prime Minister recently announced a range of changes to Medicare at a cost of some $917 million. These changes are designed to increase affordable access to primary health care. There is a particular focus in the package on increasing the availability of general practitioner services to the general public and bulk billing services to low-income earners, pensioners and others in need. There will be around 234 more places a year for medical courses and an additional 150 
GP training places. Importantly, the additional medical school places will be bonded to areas of doctor shortage and the additional training places targeted in rural areas. New incentives to encourage doctors to bulk bill pensioners and holders of Commonwealth concession cards will be put in place. General practitioners who agree to bulk bill pensioners and Commonwealth concession card holders will receive extra incentive payments. In the electorate of Cowper, that will amount to $5.30 per consultation. They will also receive expedited payment of the Medicare rebate. The new scheme will eliminate the need for patients seeing participating doctors to attend Medicare offices to receive their rebate, which will be, be uh, received electronically at the surgery. Safety nets will be put in place to protect against high out-of-pocket medical costs. Firstly, a new government-funded scheme will help pensioners and Commonwealth concession card holders with $500 or more in out-of-pocket costs for out-of-hospital medical services in any year. And secondly, private health insurance cover will be available for out-of-pocket expenses for out-of-hospital services exceeding $1,000 in any year for other patients. The new private health insurance cover will attract the government's 30 per cent rebate. Under the Australian health care agreements, the Commonwealth assists the states and territories with funding for public hospitals. Negotiations are currently underway for an agreement for the period 2003 to 2008. The Commonwealth has offered the state and territory governments up to an additional $10 billion to help run public hospitals, an increase of 17 per cent in real terms. The total amount to be provided by the federal government is in the order of $42 billion over the next five years. This commitment is very important for public health care. I am concerned, however, that the figures from the Australian Institute of Health Welfare indicate the growth in the public hospital funding provided by state and territory governments as a whole has not kept pace with the growth in funding provided by the Commonwealth. The total state and territory share of funding has fallen from 47.2 per cent in 1997-98 to 43.4 per cent in 2000-2001, whilst the Commonwealth share has risen from 45.2 per cent to 48.1 per cent over the same period. I am hopeful that this discrepancy in state government funding will be addressed by the Commonwealth's offer under the new Australian health care agreement by committing the states to match federal increases in funding for their hospitals. Finally, Mr Speaker, the government delivers in this budget a personal income tax cut for some 9 mil million Australians, and unlike the LAW law tax cuts, they will be delivered in full. The size of this tax cut has come under some fire from some quarters, including the Australian Labor Party. It's important to note that the Australian Labor Party is a party without any economic or budget credentials whatsoever. The Treasurer has, de Treasurer has delivered, to his credit, the sixth, government budget, sixth budget surplus of this government. The members will note that the Labor Party has delivered nine deficits in its 13 years in government most recently, plus the budget black hole which it left when, when it was removed from office in 1996. I might add this debt was incurred at the same time they were conducting asset sales, so they couldn't even balance the budget while selling off the family silver. Compare that with the Coalition and the Treasurer, who in this package delivers a $2.2 billion budget surplus at a time of continuing global economic uncertainty and heavily, heavy increases in demand on budgets, budget items such as defence and other areas. And on top, of that, the, on top of that surplus, he delivers a tax cut. There has been some ill-informed remarks about the size of the tax cuts. Let us look at those tax cuts. Firstly, firstly it's a reduction in tax for 9 million Australians. Secondly, it's a tax cut which amounts to $2.4 billion in the coming fiscal year and $10.7 billion across the period of the forward estimates. That's a $2.4 billion injection into the economy, giving money back to the Australian people. This tax cut, in my view, is significant. It displays our position on these matters and it distinguishes us from the Labor Party that this government should return the money of the people wherever possible. When the surplus is $2.2 billion, Order. the tax— The honourable member's time has expired. Thank you. I thank the member for Cowper. The question is that the words proposed to be admitted, admitted stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for Prospect. I thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the budget papers tabled by the Treasurer provide the Australian public with a stark choice. A government driven by an ideological obsession to more service provision being taken away from the state and being provided by the private sector, or the Labor Party, which is committed to providing what we regard as essential services to our communities. 
and no two areas are more important for the well-being of our society than health and education. The government has decided that these two areas of public policy require reform. I cannot argue with that. After seven years of dwindling funding from the government, they obviously do. However, they have decided that individuals and families will have to take it upon themselves to fund their own health and education needs. Ironically, even when the government has decided that it intends to reduce its role as a service provider, it is increasing its intake of revenue from the community. Full of irony, isn't it? Taxing the life out of the battlers so they can get their spin doctors to crow about a budget surplus. It's great for the financial markets, but cruel to ordinary families. So the tactical wiz wizards, Mr Deputy Speaker, decided wouldn't it be smart to cut services by introducing tax cuts? Brilliant. The punters will go for that one, just like they did with the kids overboard story. So the message went to Treasury to find a way to provide tax cuts and still keep the surplus intact. Their great plan, a week, a $4 a week for the average family and $11 tax cut for those who didn't really need it. The amount provided in the tax cuts show that even though revenue is pouring in and services are being cut to the bone, there really wasn't much room for cuts of significance. So why, Mr Deputy Speaker, is it all so tight? The answer, largesse. This government is quite flippant about spending inordinate amounts of money on consultants, advisers, subcontractors, glossy PR brochures to extol the virtues of their benevolence, but they cringe at the thought of spending anything on the battlers who put them on the Treasury benches. It was quite okay to pay for two occupants at Yarralumma on full pay, but it was not okay to make it easier for a smart kid from Western Sydney to study medicine or law or accounting at our universities. I now turn to the government's so-called Medicare reform package. As I stated earlier, I have no gripes about reforming the Medicare system, but the government is using the term to mask its ultimate aim, destruction. Since 1996, this Howard government's neglect of Medicare has cost ordinary Australian families $123 million extra a year. This is before the so-called reforms. We can only imagine what the impasse will be on families if the Prime Minister's reforms are passed. At the present time in my electorate, we do not have a problem with bulk billing. The doctors in Fairfield St Clair Greystains overwhelmingly bulk bill their patients. They know that their patients are not well off. Many are pensioners and concession card holders, so they will be fine in the short term. But the vast majority are young families. What will happen to them? I, can't re I can remember, actually, back to the days before Medibank, when you really had to hope that you had a charitable doctor who, when you had to make an emergency visit with a sick child, he would kindly or she would find me forego that fee because you just didn't have the money at that moment. So again, this Prime Minister is trying to force us back or force on us a scheme that suits his ideal world of the 1950s. This Prime Minister is convinced that the world would be a better place without all families having access to adequate health care. He would rather see the already extremely stretched public hospital system take on an even greater load, which will undoubtedly result from the Howard changes. People, Mr Deputy Speaker, in this civilised society are not going to lay down and die. They will use whatever avenues they can afford to seek assistance for themselves and their children. However, what has the government done? It has moved $918 million from the Australian health care agreements over five years, which help fund our public hospital system to pay for their Medicare package. What a creative piece of accounting and a disgraceful form of public policy. Populate or perish. Who would want to have kids when they have this impost imposed on them? The Hawke government, Mr Deputy Speaker, introduced Medicare in 1984, and it took about 12 years to get bulk billing to the level of 80 per cent. It has taken only seven years for the Howard government to reduce bulk billing by nearly 12 per cent to 68.5 nationally. All the while, the Prime Minister and his health minister refused to guarantee the rate of bulk billing will not continue to fall. So we will, if the Senate passes the government's proposals, see families who earn over 32,300 a year a vast majority of my community not have access to bulk billing as we know it today. Talk about means testing. This is mean spirited indeed. I've heard government members, and just now as well, state that all will be well 
doctors will not have to increase their fees because they will be reimbursed for bulk billing pensioners and concession card holders. Well, the AMA president, Mr Deputy Speaker, Karen Phelps, has publicly indicated that doctors will have to increase their fees. And she said, and I quote, what will need to happen is that the doctors, to continue to bulk bill their concession card holders, they're going to have to charge their non-concession card holders more. So there you have it. The doctors admit that they will have to charge more. The doctors have also stated, and I'm pleased to see, that Labor's plan for Medicare is the better of the two. The difference is that we on this side of the House believe that the state is the vested interest in providing adequate or has a vested interest in providing adequate health care services for its people. We believe that in a civilised society that all people, regardless of their social standing and wealth, have the right to this service. We are not arguing about choice. We believe that people should have the right to choose which facilities and what type of care they require. However, the government's plans impinge upon the right of many families to choose. Ordinary families will have no choice whatsoever. We in the Labor Party believe that everybody should have a choice. The Labor plan rewards doctors who continue bulk billing, and the incentives are there. Our plan will provide doctors in my electorate an additional $7,500 a year for bulk billing 80 per cent or more of their patients. When we are in power, nearly all of the doctors in my electorate and across Australia will receive this incentive payment, and they deserve it. Most of the doctors have tried to maintain a bulk billing service, but the government's changes, I fear, will see this rate drop dramatically. Added, the in cost, in, added in cost of seeing the doctor is the government's plan from the last budget to increase the cost of essential medicines. So if the government got its way, we would see ordinary families not only paying more for walking through the doctor's door, but if they required medication, 30 per cent more at the chemist. If the government signs its much fated free trade agreement with the United States and the abolition of the pharmaceutical benefit scheme is really part of that agreement, then the sky's the limit as to what people will be forced to pay for a range of medicines. The picture so far, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government has given you $4 a week. This is an act of benevolence that we should all be grateful for, according to their acolytes. However, for this generous $4, we should sacrifice a few things. Firstly, do not in any circumstances get sick. If you do, there goes your $4, so make sure you stay perfectly well. Secondly, do not try to improve yourself by obtaining a higher education. If you don't have the money, then take out a loan under the Nelson Plan, the Minister for Education, when he tells us you can borrow $50,000 at 3.5 per cent plus CPI. So if you took it out today, that's over 6 per cent. And that is only halfway to what some of those degrees will cost. This government's education policy is unapologetically geared to the top end of town. Already, on average, since the Howard government took office, more than 20,000 qualified students are turned away from our universities each year. These are intelligent young people, thwarted not by their lack of effort or diligence, but by the lack of funding provided by this government. Since 1996, the government has slashed university funding by $5 billion and at the same time more than doubled hex fees and lowered the threshold. The one positive to come out of this package is that the government has recognised its folly from a few years ago and raised that threshold now to a more reasonable level of $30,000. However, as always, Mr Deputy Speaker, with this government, there is a catch. Universities will be able to increase their hex fees by 30 per cent. Over the last seven years, the top rate of hex has increased from $2,442 to $8,355. So when you add the 30 per cent increase on the average hex fees, you are looking at an increased cost to students and their families of over $1,650 per year within the next two years. Break it down and you have that added cost of an extra $32 a week. Since 1996, the average hex fee has more than doubled, up by 116 per cent. The Department of Education, Science and Training has admitted that student debt is to rise to astronomical levels. By 2006-07, student debt will be $13.2 billion, and we're supposed to clap that. There are young people out there, Mr Deputy Speaker, improving themselves and the benefit that will come to us as a society. It will be immense. 
But what does this government do in its so-called wisdom? It punishes them by imposing upon them before they begin their careers a very significant level of debt. In essence, slowly but surely, we are seeing the Americanization of our education system, whereby parents from the birth of their child, in other words, from the cradle, will have to save up for their child's higher education. Is that what the average Australian people want? Well, I know my constituents, Mr Deputy Speaker, are stringently against this. I also note that in the budget papers there is not an extra cent to support TAFE or our technical and further education institutes, and no mention of any new training initiatives. The government intends to make great sway of its new apprenticeship scheme. However, this scheme has failed to address skills shortages in the critical areas. The Heather Riddart of the Australian Industry Group AIG has been quoted as saying that there has been an alarming fall in technical and engineering apprenticeships. Since 1995, there has been a 35 per cent decline in, in engineering enrolments in TAFE colleges in New South Wales, not due to lack of demand from employers for youngsters in those trades, but due to the lack of serious funding from this government. And the latest data indicates that there has been a decline in the number of people taking up traditional trades, including carpentry and panel beating and motor mechanics and plumbing. Only 6,000 in the December quarter of 2002. It is the lowest in over four years. One significant move in this budget, Mr Deputy Speaker, showing really terrible lack of foresight, was the abolition of the Enterprise Career Education Foundation, or ECEF as it's referred to. For the government, it is a saving of a measly $4.1 million over four years. For the students involved, it is a severe setback. This was a program that received strong praise from the business community by bringing students and industry together so as to assist the students in developing their skills to enhance their career prospects. This is yet another policy area where Labor and the government are poles apart. We believe that government should be proactive in devising strategies to assist business in rectifying problem areas such as skills shortages. However, with the government, they believe that the market will sort it out. Well, the market needs the skills, but we are not providing them. So they have no option but to search offshore for labour or, even worse, move their businesses offshore. The result, an increasing number of unemployed people who end up being chronically unemployed with all of its social consequences. All it requires is for government to be proactive. The government, however, tends to have no shortage of money when it comes to funding private schools. We're not talking about small private schools, but the large established institutions, and they have never had trouble raising funds. They tend to have no problem at all in raising their fees, while at the same time putting their hands out for the government handout. State schools get a pittance. The government will argue that they are the state's responsibilities, but I thought private schools were as well. Different rules for different people, I presume, and the hypocrisy shines brightly from this government. What does this budget provide for the majority of Australian women? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This government has shown throughout its period in office and it takes women for granted. They gladly take their votes, but they provide little in return. If you're a young woman established in a career and then want to start a family, you have one choice. Leave your job, stay at home. The failed baby bonus will look after you. Providing token financial assistance for women to stay at home is uncharitable in the extreme, and this has been shown by the poor take-up rate for the baby bonus. The government should be looking at the economics of having children as a major part of their social policy. However, the government refuses to countenance a scheme of paid maternity leave, which, as their sex discrimination commissioner, Prugard, has stated, would be of significant benefit for women and families. Most countries that are members of the OECD have some form of paid maternity leave, except for Australia and the United States. If Australia is serious about addressing the decline in the birth rate without a significant increase in the rate of immigration, then the whole of government needs to come up with a plan to examine this growing problem. The other problem for working mothers is the ridiculously expensive cost of childcare. When I asked the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs a couple of months ago a question on notice regarding the number of childcare places and the average cost of those places in my electorate, he could not answer that part of the question on the average cost. No data was available, was the reply. No wonder the government has no idea what the struggle is like out there for women in the real world. Maybe he doesn't want to know how hard it is. I can inform the minister 
that people are paying in my electorate upwards of $10,000 a year for long day care in some places. $10,000. Add this to the cost of the increased cost of going to a doctor, paying more for the kids' medicines, and then saving every spare cent you have for the rolling tax from those rolling tax cuts the government promises to implement so as to pay for their children's higher education. No wonder women are beside themselves out there as to how they properly can take care of their families and themselves. The government will claim that it is unable to afford to spend in these areas, but why not? Is this not the highest taxing government we've ever seen? The tax cuts have been provided by the government are so small they will not return any of the increases in revenue caused by inflation. The $4 a week for people on average income earning between $30,000 and $50,000 a year will in no way cover increased health, education and childcare costs. It will not get anywhere near it. People earning over $75,000 a year receive almost three times the tax cuts as ordinary workers and part-time workers who will only receive a pittance of $1.63 a week. Many women work part-time and, again, this government treats them with contempt. The government promised before it introduced the goods and services tax that it would abolish all so-called hidden taxes. Can the government look straight into Australian people's eyes and swear that they have not introduced any new hidden taxes? The truth is they can't, even though they call them levies. There is the ANSET tax, the sugar tax, the dairy tax, the Sydney airport tax and an increased excise on LPG, a clean fuel. If there is any new form of revenue taking they can think of, then this government will implement it. Anything to con the Australian people into believing the government is giving back more than it is taking. Treasurer stands proud at his honour of being the highest taxing treasurer in Australia's history. What an achievement. He has grabbed more than $3.3 billion from ordinary workers just this year in back at creep. Has this been returned through these tax cuts? No. The government has a hide to excel its virtues. There has never been a government more reliant on income tax as this government and there probably has never been a government more committed to cutting services to the Australian people. The Leader of the Opposition in his budget reply speech pray, raised another issue that should be a paramount priority for any Commonwealth government, and that is the saving of the Murray River and tackling the problem of salinity. I do not believe this has been argued strongly enough yet to the Australian people on how important this environmental issue is. As the driest continent on earth, water is a precious resource. I think many people, particularly in the eastern seaboard, take it for granted the amount of water we have at our disposal. Hopefully the drought might have opened up some of the people's minds to the con conservation of our water resources. The saving of the Murray River is extremely important, and so is the end of land clearing. And I must commend the government for getting close to an agreement with the Queensland government on the issue of land clearing. However, Labor's plan to create the Murray-Darling River Bank is a great innovation to attempt to achieve and secure the large amounts of funding necessary and to create a climate of cooperation that is desperately required between the Commonwealth, the states and local government and the private sector. I can testify to the almighty problems involved in trying to get cooperation over the conservation of the Murray-Darling network from my own experiences as the New South Wales Minister for Natural Resources in the 1980s. The recent downpour in Sydney, Mr Deputy Speaker, the issue of flooding has come to a head again. As a long-term resident representative of the Fairfield area, I have seen at first hand the damage the serious floods can do to our community. Whilst Minister of Natural Resources in 1984-85, we introduced from the State of New South Wales a funding agreement and arrangements with the State Government to assist councils in flood mitigation works, and a few years later, after lobbying the Hawke Government, the Commonwealth then made a contribution on what had now or led then to the 221 system. In other words, a dollar spent by council, you got two dollars from the state and two dollars from the Commonwealth. This government abolished that system, reasoning that in particular metropolitan councils could raise the funds required for flood mitigation works. People in the regions got upset, so the government implemented the regional flood mitigation program in 1999. Then a couple of years later, the government expanded the eligibility criteria to include outer metropolitan areas. The government has stipulated that a rigid definition of what constitutes an inner or outer metropolitan area under the plan has not been set, as many councils have significant demographic variations within their boundaries. It will appear that the government has left that definition deliberately ambiguous, ambiguous enough for Parramatta City Council to be classified as outer metropolitan, but Fairfield City Council not. My ge geographic skills are not bad, and it would appear to me that parts of Fairfield City area are substantially further west from the city and could be classified as semi-rural as compared to Parramatta. And part of this scheme, Parramatta was allocated $950,000 for this for the, the for voluntary purposes. Fairfield I call the, the question is that the bill be now read a second time.
I call the honourable member for Dunkley. Thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. Reductions in personal income tax, enhancing our security and strengthening defence, investing in education and our health, health systems, funding boosts for disability services and the greatest ever commitment of funds to tackle environmental degradation are features of the Howard government's 2003-2004 federal budget. Prudent financial management by the Howard government has enabled tax cuts to be delivered to all income earners after paying for the unexpected challenges of drought and Iraq and further reductions in the debt inherited from previous Labor governments. The budget delivered by Treasurer Costello maintains a respectable surplus and a climate conducive to improved employment opportunities and sustainable economic growth. The tax cuts will pay for the winter gas bill and amounts to a return of $2.4 billion in the coming years of taxes paid by income earners above what is needed to fund federal works and programs. Tax cuts are the dividend paid to Australian taxpayers for sound fiscal and economic management and will be delivered without placing the economy, our nation's longer-term national interests or the budget at risk. Some, including the Labor Party, have been critical of the size of the tax cut. And I, I guess it's interesting how those opposite can ignore the anticipated $1,800 impost on Victorian households and families under the hundreds of tax and levy increases uh, implemented by the Brax government in its budget a week earlier. Yet the opposition leader seems to have belatedly recognised that a tax cut is a tax cut, something that vividly contrasts with the form of Labor at state levels where, as I mentioned, dozens and dozens of taxes and charges are being increased at great expense to households. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the federal budget presents a sound triple bottom line approach to the Howard government getting on with the job at a time of great challenge, pointing to world-leading economic performance, social investment and new environmental spending. In economic terms, the budget signals continuing impressive outcomes. As William Pesek, Jr. recently canvassed in his column for Bloomberg News, and I quote, whilst most major economies are struggling, Australia is thriving. In the US, Japan and Germany, it's stagnation and rising unemployment that folks worry about. Here, it's how to keep the good times going. Chances are, Mr Pesek says, that Australia can do just that. The dismal state of the global economy is a clear and present risk to an economy Costello sees expanding at 3 per cent this year and 3.25 per cent next year. But domestically, it's hard to see Australia as anything but a role model for the world's best economies. He goes on to say, take the tax cut plan Costello unveiled as part of his budget. It will lower taxes for 9 million Australians by $10.7 billion over four years. That may not sound like much to politicians in Frankfurt, Tokyo or Washington, but it gets at a bigger point. Costello is in a position to trim taxes. He also has more ammunition to do so than his peers. Compare that to what's happening in Washington. Australia's government expects to produce a $2.2 billion surplus in the fiscal year starting July 1, its sixth in eight years. He reflected on the Howard government's budget and concluded, and I quote, Australia is not getting, isn't getting much credit domestically or internationally, and that's a shame. If you're looking for an example of an economy that's forging its own path, independent of the weaknesses slamming most, Australia is it. And if it's a haven from market volatility you're after, you could do worse than give Australia a look. PESEC's piece emphasised how here in Australia we can expect continuing economic growth and modest inflation, accomplishments greatly admired by other developed countries who are facing a less prosperous future and the need to fund government activity on their national bank cards, a debt left for future generations to pay off. Historians will look back on this time and declare it a golden era in Australia's economic life. It will be contrasted with the neglect of opportunity and profligacy of the previous Labor government that produced debt, deficit and despair. Labor's approach stole from future generations, and the Howard government has had to repair the damage we inherited, deal with the significant challenges of the day and build the foundations for a better future. The budget includes new funding for further improvements to our border security, higher education and Medicare reforms, industry research and development and a continuation and enhancement to the environmental commitments that have made the Howard government the greenest in our nation's history. Locally, the budget will help our regional economy. 
and employment prospects by supporting continued strong building activity, home ownership, buoyant retail sales, expanding educational exports and continuing growth in the tourism, leisure and hospitality sector. A significant proportion of our economy is interest rate sensitive. And fortunately, the interest rates in the early 1990s that crippled our region during Labor's recession we had to have are a dark but not too distant memory. The government's economic stewardship has steered the economy away from the horrors of a 17 per cent home mortgage rate and even steeper business lending and overdraft rates. For those recent entrants into the home ownership market, I remind them that they were the horrors that the Labor government faced gave home buyers not too long ago. Local home buyers and their families, Dunkley small businesses and those they employ, and all others associated with our discretionary expenditure segment of the economy can rejoice at the opportunities and the assistance the economic climate has offered under the Howard government, but also what has been avoided. Speaking of avoidance, the BRAC's government seems hell-bent on avoiding its obligations to construct the Scoresby Freeway. The single most significant and bald-faced deception of electors occurred during the last Victorian state election, when the BRAC's government promised to build the freeway without tolls. Labor lied. Labor lied. Labor lies. Dunkley motorists intending to use the Scoresby Freeway to improve access to employment opportunities, educational institutions, family connections and leisure interests will now face a toll. Potential investors in our region now have to weigh the financial imposts of tolls, disadvantaging our region when compared to other investment destinations. The importance of the Scoresby Freeway to our community cannot be overstated. There is no single endeavour that will enhance the viability, vitality and living standards of our region than this project, and the time is well past for local ALP representatives to stand up for our community. They haven't been battling for this project, but they've been mere bystanders up till now. But worse still, they were briefed by Premier Brax and supported the betrayal of their own promises and the interests of our local community. And last Friday, at the quarterly elected representatives meeting hosted by Frankston City, all the local ALP state MPs could do was gloat. Gloat about the effectiveness of their deception and crow about improved opinion polls and, and approval ratings, despite blatantly deceiving our citizens, misleading our community and placing their own pathetic self-interest above our community's needs. State Labor MPs sit in Spring Street on the back of an electoral fraud, knowingly deceiving the electors of the eastern and southeastern suburbs into believing it was committed to the Scoresby Freeway. Scoresby has gone from a freeway to improve viability, vitality and living standards to our region, the Howard government vision, to a boulevard of broken dreams under the deception and indifference of the Brax and Crean Labor team. We will continue to honour in full our commitment to fund a toll-free Scoresby Freeway with the allocation of $445 million and will need to join together as a community to demand that the BRAC's government also honour its promises to the electorate and contractual obligations to the Commonwealth to partner the Howard government in building a freeway and not a tollway. The reasons for the indecent haste with which Steve Brax went to the polls can now be clearly explained. Premier Brax knew he had squandered the surplus he'd inherited from the Kennett government, that he could not possibly do all that he'd promised, and that his economic credentials and his own personal credibility and trustworthiness would be compromised as the evidence of his mismanagement and deception emerged in the public arena. It's not uncommon for incoming governments to find their preset predecessors had cooked the books. We all remember that. That's what happened here, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, when the former Federal Labor government, of which the now opposition leader was a key figure, claimed that the budget was in surplus in the lead-up to the 1996 election when we found it was really $10.5 billion in deficit. Tough choices and dif the difficult task of bringing the books back into the black was left behind by Labor for the incoming Howard government to address. But this is not, this is not the story of Victorian Labor. The people in the government before and after the last state election were the same. The ALP had all the information about the budget situation before scurrying off to the polls. The BRAC's betrayal was all his own work. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, the budget that we're discussing here today also buttresses the social fabric and builds a more able, fairer and well-supported future for our community. I've heard some of the members opposite talk about um, Minister Nelson's higher education reforms. 
And I compliment Ross Gittins for his article in the Sydney Morning Herald. As he said, the opposition parties and interest groups have used several tricks to mislead us. Do you see a pattern emerging here, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker? Labor misleads and deceives. First, they've got people thinking that they're muddled between two separate schemes. Here we are hearing from the Labor Party examples, the most outrageous, unrepresentative examples of what the implication of these changes would be. And Gittins goes about dissecting the Labor lies again, the lies that seem to perpetuate under the Labor's opposition and attempts to do anything to frighten people into supporting their misguided causes. Whatever it takes, absolutely right, Minister at the table. Absolutely right. The Nelson Higher Education reforms will commit $1.5 billion extra dollars into the university sector over the next four years, $870 million per year recurrent extra funding from 2007, and $10.6 billion extra additional investment in the first 10 years. Now, what does that do? Well, that actually increases the number of undergraduates in Australian universities. There are currently 531,000 undergraduates in Australian universities. 531,000, more than half a million. Of those, 98.3% are in government subsidised hex places. Yet you don't hear the Labor Party talk about that fact. That is a fact. What they seek to talk about is the less than 2 per cent that aren't in government-funded places. And the minister yesterday outlined to the House why the opportunity for full fee-paying, non-government-funded places should be made available to Australian citizens. Why? It's available to everybody else. If you come from Jakarta, you can get a full fee-paying place, but if you come from Frankston, you couldn't before the Howard government was elected and introduced that change. Minister Nelson very effectively um, highlighted an example from a Frankston High School student where just one-tenth of one per cent below a TER score could deny a student the opportunity to study and pursue their particular career. Now, what's wrong with that person deciding to invest in their own future? Absolutely nothing, I would have thought. They're making a choice about their future and investing in it by pursuing something that hits their buttons and stimulates their future working life. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing, but unless you're from the Labor Party. What they'd rather see is that person occupy a hex-funded place, a hex-funded place that could be exactly what someone else is looking for, but because Labor is so hell-bent on denying people a chance to select their own pathways in life and Labor would like to tell them what's good for them, not allow the individual to make those choices, they don't trust the people, and they certainly don't trust young people making choices about their career type. So what you get to is somebody who may have just missed out by one-tenth of one per cent on a TER score to get into their preferred course, being denied the opportunity to approach that university to argue that they are capable and competent of undertaking that course of study and to invest in their own future. Instead, instead under Labor, they're forced into a program that is not their preference. They displace someone from a hex-funded place who may actually desire to be in that program. They are perhaps not going to be stimulated by it, and that perhaps explains why about 40 per cent of people who commence higher education don't finish. They don't finish. So what's wrong with encouraging people to pursue their own course and investing in their own future? And in doing so, strengthening the university sector, where you'll see an increase, an increase in hex-funded places, an increase in hex-funded places, not where, as the Labor Party would deceive people into believing that someone has to go and save for those places. They are using fictitious examples to create a less than two per cent um, case study and then seeking to apply that across the entire university sector. As Rod Skittens has outlined, they should stand condemned for their tricks in misleading people and continuing to do what Labor does best, and that is attempt to scare people Order. with their lies and false representations of government policy. The additional support for carers of people with disabilities, those selfless individuals that give up so much of their own time and opportunity to care for a loved one, is well, well welcomed in this, in this budget. The Disability Employment Services funding boost is also a positive social measure that recognises the selflessness of those people supporting disabled citizens. The record $2 billion committed to environmental repair and management programs in the 2003-2004 budget exemplifies the Howard government's whole-of-government framework for environmental sustainability. It includes, for the first time, $40 million for a sustainable cities program aimed at the impacts of city living and improving the environment, health and lifestyles of urban Australians. 
It includes a further increase in increased spending between the environment and agriculture portfolios, who jointly administer the landmark Natural Heritage Trust and the National Action Plan for Salinity and Water Quality. That funding is going to be increased on environmental activities, a funding level that has more than doubled since 1996 to a record $957 million next financial year. That's what good economic management offers, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, the chance to do something. As you see in the state of Victoria, poor economic management denies opportunities to do things. And I spoke in this House about a $20 million subacute facility in Mornington, hospital facility, even un un ashamedly presented as an election sweetener for those people in the, the southern part of my electorate. That's not even in the forward estimates of the BRAC's budget. That's what poor econ economic management does. It denies opportunities and it limits future potential of not only our communities but our nation. And in, in going further on the triple bottom line advantages of this budget, we can look at some of the less spectacular programs, but equally as important. I'm particularly pleased that the retractable needle and syringe program that I'd secured prior to the last budget has advanced to a stage where $17.5 million has been allocated to roll out the technology over the next three years. That's encouraging news. That's providing the proper public health support for injecting drug users, but not at the expense of the safety and well-being of regular citizens who are fearful of coming into contact with recklessly discarded used syringes. That's a constructive, positive measure that I strongly support. But before I close, I'd just like to talk about one other issue. I have for a long time been a campaigner on the virtues of LPG. LPG, I think, is the new fuel. Sadly, its genesis was one of a dirty fuel as a waste product from petroleum refining. But we've come to realise that as a fuel source, it is clean, it is kinder to the air quality, and it is in an abundance in our area. The government has announced that they are examining the question of uh, fuel taxation uh, through the fuel tax reform for the future package. Now, I'm encouraging those people, such as myself, to recognise the fuel security and self-sufficiency virtue of LPG. Our capacity to meet those transport fuel requirements from our own reserves, that's a value that LPG offers that should be reflected in the final determinations of the rates later this year. Also, the air quality benefits, Mr Speaker. Uh, you'd be aware that the particulates um, things that are uh, compromising our efforts in improving air quality uh, and even uh, would make uh, the gains that we hope to make under the Sustainable Cities Initiative more difficult, well, LPG offers a pathway there where it's friendlier to the air quality and therefore that should also be recognised in, as another, another factor that should influence the rate of uh, excise that's applied to those fuels. And finally, Mr Speaker, it's the greenhouse benefits. Uh, we know that uh, LPG uh, in, has a performance uh, that is outstrips uh, many other fuel types for the transport sector, and that that also, I think, has a public policy value that should be taken into, an, into account uh, as another factor uh, that should influence the rates of excise applied to LPG. Uh, my encouragement to the LPG sector, with whom I've worked closely with over the last four or five years, is uh, let's get that information together. The opportunity is there. The government has stated that the, uh, the energy content of the fuels will be the starting position. Uh, I've been assured that other factors will be taken into account. Let's assemble that information. Let's put that to the government. Let's show how LPG is not only an attractive, uh, a self-reliant and environmentally friendly fuel that we should integrate more deeply into our economy, but it's also a fuel where there's an existing distribution network. It's an existing distribution network. It's not a potential future alternative fuel. It's here now. It's here now. One in 17 cars on our national fleet are using LPG. We've secured uh, the support and coordination and cooperation of the industry to promote and market LPG as the clean fuel. Uh, I've described it as a bit of an aspirin in that uh, people have sometimes discounted the virtue of LPG, but as time goes by we will learn more about its positive characteristics. I encourage the sector that's worked so effectively to uh, advance the interests of, the, of LPG to combine, to get its information together and help support me to present the best possible case about the other factors that need to be taken into account beyond the energy content of LPG as the government 
subsequent moves to um, settle on that fuel type. Uh, OEM, original equipment manufacturers of vehicles in, our Australia, in, in Australia, or four of them have been working on uh, LPG cars. Uh, we are looking at European technology, which is primarily on two-litre engines, to see what needs to be adapted and changed to meet Euro 4 um, end-of-pipe emission standards for LPG. This is an exciting time. LPG Order. is the fuel of the future, the and we should get behind time it. time has expired. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Fowler. Mr Deputy Speaker. There is an old saying that if you drop a frog into a pot of boiling water, it will jump back out. But if you put the frog into a pot of cold water and bring it to the boil, the frog will be slowly boiled alive. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a strategy that the Prime Minister learned some years ago, and that is the strategy being applied to the Australian people today. When you look back over the so-called reforms of the Howard government, changes to industrial relations, changes to the tax system, changes to childcare and health services, changes to education funding benefiting private schools at the expense of public education, changes to subsidise private health insurance and many other reforms. While each of these have alarmed some parts of the community, Unless you take them all together, you might not see how far they have washed away the foundations of Australian society. Because this package was presented by the now Prime Minister in 1987, and then in the Liberal Party's fight back package in 1993, it was firmly rejected, rightly, by the Australian people. So, the Prime Minister realised that what he couldn't achieve by dropping the frog into the boiling water might be achieved if he took things slowly. So we had the, and we remember, the never ever promise about the GST and the hand over the heart promise to preserve Medicare. And we have now had eight budgets by this government with each one turning up the heat each one breaking a never, ever promise, each one making our society less fair. Well, where do we stand today as we look at the 2003 budget and the associated plans to change bulk billing and university fees? The water in the pot is getting uh, very warm, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the frog has its last chance to jump before it is too late. But you can understand how the frog feels. It's nice and warm there in the pot. It's feeling relaxed and comfortable, you might say. And it thinks it will now know just when things have gone too far and it's time to jump. It also thinks that if the Howard government goes too far, it can always turn back the clock to rebuild Medicare, just like Labor did after Malcolm Fraser thrashed Medibank. But that assumes that the government hasn't done the unthinkable. The treasurer has put a lid on the pot. Even if the frog, frog wanted to jump out, it can't. It's left there to boil alive. There's another part of the strategy. To make sure what this government has, done, has undone cannot be put back together, Mr Deputy Speaker. So what we have seen and we see again in this budget is the transfer of services such as public hospitals and schools to the states and the subsidies of private services such as private health insurance and private schools supported by the Commonwealth. With limited financial resources, the states fund these publicly provided services while the Commonwealth hands out subsidies for private services. You can hardly be surprised that all state and territory governments are now Labor. You certainly could not trust the Liberals with such a responsibility. They would privatise the lot. But this other part of the strategy, putting the lid on the pot, is now clear for us all to see. By locking in subsidies for private health insurance, private schools and private universities a large group of voters will scream like boiled frogs if you try to take the subsidy away. 
and then there are then they, there are those tax cuts the fistful of dollars or more precisely a couple of coins in your purse the effect is not to make taxpayers grateful for some tax relief, but to ensure that a new government cannot restore what this government has taken away. It's putting the lid on the pot to stop the frogs from jumping out. After all that, we still have the highest taxing government in recent history. Only now we lose both ways. We have high taxes and we still have to pay for private services. As most Australian families know only too well, their $4 a week tax cut will soon disappear in payments to doctors and, if the government gets its way, in higher charges at the chemist. But as this government knows only too well, you can cut back on benefits to the so-called undeserving poor but you can't touch government handouts to those who can afford private health insurance. The effect of this is best seen in one of the most disgraceful acts of this government. In his first budget, the Treasurer stopped the funding for pensioner dental services. The states have been left with the full cost of meeting this important treatment. But the 30 per cent Commonwealth subsidy for private health insurance covers ancillary treatment such as dental services. So private dental services are subsidised by the Commonwealth, but not services for pensioners or their dependents. We had the Minister for Ageing in this House the other week saying that Labor would take away the dental care of children whose parents have private health insurance. But not a word, Mr Deputy Speaker, about his government taking away dental services for aged pensioners. Let them eat soup. That was the message the Minister for Ageing gives to aged pensioners in dire need of dental care. We know how important dental care is for maintaining the general health of older people, but you will never hear the Minister for Ageing talk about dental care for aged pensioners. All we get are crocodile tears about kids needing braces, as if only the children of the 45 per cent of people with private health insurance have dental problems. But that just shows us where we are heading. As a rough calculation, the government subsidises private dental care to the tune of $500 million a year, but doesn't give doesn't give one cent for dental health care for pensioners. As they say about the good Lord, Mr Deputy Speaker, Speaker, this government looks after those that look after themselves. But as I see almost daily in my electorate office, there are many that this government will not help, like the pensioner forced to pay hundreds of dollars each year for the only drug which effectively treats his arthritis but is not covered under the PBS, or the young mother wondering where she will get the $300 up front demanded by her doctor before he will treat a precancerous condition. This government has sat on its hands while bulk billing and ultimately Medicare are collapsing around us. Its measures will not save Medicare. They will create a two-tiered American-style health system which will leave more and more Australian families without full access to health care. The other area of this budget that rolls forward the Howard agenda is education. In this budget, it is not private schools but universities that are up for so-called reform. Can I say at the start that I do support the HEX uh, scheme as introduced by the previous Labor government. I know that HECS payments are a burden on many individuals and young families. One of the problems with HECS has always been that it hits at a time when young graduates are starting out in life and have other costs to bear. When a young graduate seeks a home loan, they must declare the $20,000 HECS debt and the $150 a month needed to repay the debt. Allowing, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
fee increases of up to 30 per cent and providing for loan schemes for full-cost places will have a dramatic effect as graduates face loan burdens of $100,000 in future years. There will be a great incentive to work overseas to avoid these debts, and we are seeing this now. And we will definitely suffer as a nation from the loss of this brilliant talent. But what worries me is allowing universities to charge fees up to 30 per cent above the existing set fee. The predicted effect of this move will be that the so-called sandstone, sandstone universities will be able to increase fees and presumably be able to attract a larger number of full fee paying students while other suburban and regional universities will not. With the benefit of higher revenue, the sandstone universities will attract better staff and facilities and hence will be seen to provide a higher standard. This two-tier American style university system will reflect the same differences as we see between public and private schools and with access to health care between privately insured hospital patients and those in the public system. The worst aspect of this will be that graduates of lower fee university, universities will be assumed to have lesser degrees. What concerns me, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it is the main reason that I support the concept of HEX, is that, as the Minister for Education and Science keeps telling us, only 30 per cent of students go on to university. And that figure would be far lower for the electorate that I represent, my electorate of Fowler. But what would be unfair for students from electorates like Fowler is that they are far less likely to have had an exclusive private school education and less likely to gain entry to a sandstone, sandstone university. Their only choice, because their parents could not afford a full fee-paying place, will be to take a place at one of the second-class universities created by this proposal. Now, I don't agree that a graduate of an outer urban or regional university is second-class. But I am concerned that the employment market may see those graduates as second class. I'm reminded of a report carried out in the early 1950s, which led to the creation of one of the sandstone universities, the University of New South Wales. The report for the, new, for the then new South Wales government looked at the engineering diploma courses at Sydney Technical College. The report concluded that the STC diploma course had a better content and rigour than most university degree courses in Australia and, for that matter, in the UK and the USA. It was our cultural cringe that saw STC courses as being lesser than courses at sandstone universities. I am concerned that the proposed changes to fee structures will lead us back to the pre-Dawkins days of a two-tier university system with dire consequences for some universities and their graduates. Mr Deputy Speaker, just as this budget shows a change in the accepted role of Australian government domestically, it also shows a change in our international position. This can be seen from the budget figures for official development assistance for countries in our region. Now, at a time when we are told to be alert, to be alert but not alarmed, our government should have noticed the situation in our region. By any assessment, we have a very volatile situation in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands. We also have what may lead to a civil war in Aceh, the province of Indonesia. So we might expect the government to step up our A program in the region, but instead it has been cut back. Compared to last year's budget, aid for Papua New Guinea and the Pacific has fallen from 516 million to 509 million, and for East Asia it dropped from 497 million to 491 million. 
The figure for the rest of the world increases, but only through increased aid, only through increased aid to Iraq. We will spend less than budgeted in this year on most countries except Iraq. In fact, you could say our aid contribution to Iraq was made at the expense of other countries which rely on Australian aid. We have robbed Peter to pay Paul in the international aid sense. This comes on top of the 100 million in urgent humanitarian aid to Iraq mentioned by the Treasurer in his budget speech and the aid component of the 645 million cost of Australia's deployment to the war on Iraq. But only now can we begin to count the cost of our commitment as part of the coalition of the willing. Now that our flag is flying alongside the Stars and Stripes and the Union Jack over Baghdad, it's time to count the booty. All that oil revenue. But before we spend all those oil dollars, we need to look at what Iraq owes to other countries and individuals. According to the Financial Times, Iraq has external debt of at least 350 billion US dollars. Iraq, as our foreign minister would say, is a busted ass country and even with high oil revenue could only service a fraction of its foreign debt. This debt was, after all, the reason for the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, and with interest it is now much higher than it was then. It reminds me of the Peter Sellers movie, The Mouse That Roared. A busted-ass country, the Duchy of Grand Fenwick, declared war on the US to get some Marshall Plan-style foreign aid. In the end, it was the US that surrendered rather than pay out more aid. The US has called for much of this debt to be forgiven, but the US is owed only $2 billion, so it's easy to see why. The Financial Times says, and I quote Mr Deputy Speaker, the motive appears to be concern about the cost of reconstructing Iraq and a desire to reduce contingent claims on US taxpayers. End of quote. It should also be clear why Australia has been so keen to avoid a role in the administration of Iraq. Now, you might think that this odious debt should not be repaid, but that is not what the Paris Club demands of countries like South Africa, Argentina and even Vietnam, which is responsible for the debts of the former Saigon regime. But much of Iraq's debt is owed to former Soviet and Eastern Bloc countries, which are held responsible for the odious debts of their former regimes. So there is little chance of Iraq being forgiven its odious debt. Of course, Iraq still owes billions in compensation to Kuwaiti citizens, and a recent US court decision holding Iraq responsible for the World Trade Center tragedy could add another $100 billion to the debt. With little more than 30 per cent of the United Nations' $2.2 billion emergency appeal for Iraq being promised by all nations, Australia's contribution has been a mere $10.2 million. This government, this government was eager to be part of the coalition of the killing at a cost of more than $600 million. But when it comes to humanitarian aid, to put Iraq back together, this government isn't home when the appeal caller comes to the door. And even then, it gives away money that should have gone to countries in our region. Is it no wonder we need to spend more on defence and security when we spend less and less on promoting living conditions that can lead to peace in our region? But what of the impact of the budget in my electorate of Fowler? For a start, Vella has the second highest rate of bulk billing. It has, at over 98 per cent. So it should be clear that any changes to bulk billing will have a direct impact. Many doctors are expected to charge a co-payment of at least $5 and as much as $10 per visit. That alone will wipe out, will wipe out the $4 tax cut for some families. University students from Fowler are more likely to attend what this government will make second-class universities as a result of changes to fees. They will have less chance of attending full fee-paying courses 
and less chance of reaching their full to, uh, potential that they deserve. In these and so many other ways over this Treasurer's eight, eight budgets, the people of Fowler are being treated as second-class citizens. This was summed up in the budget papers by the government's offer to provide $445 million for a freeway in the Liberal-held seats in Melbourne's eastern suburbs, provided there is no toll, but only $62 million for the Western Sydney orbital, making it necessary to charge a toll on a national highway. That's Order. this government's the idea of fairness. No wonder frogs are the question now is that the words proposed to me admitted stand part of the question. To that, I call the honourable member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's always enlightening listening to those opposite commenting on things to do with fiscal management uh, and budgets. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's a pleasure to speak on a budget which is responsible, which is sensible, and which is balanced. This budget does three essential things. It addresses some very important areas of need in terms of increased spending and reform, longer-term reform in terms of tertiary education, strengthening our tertiary education sector, strengthening Medicare and spending more money to strengthen Australia's security. Mm -hmm. Secondly, this budget reduces income tax burdens on ordinary working Australians. And thirdly, this budget continues this government's proud record of strong economic management and continues to pay off the legacy of Labor's debt, and that is, in fact, after some extraordinary, unexpected items of expenditure. The longest drought in history, an escalation of the war against terror uh, uh, action in Iraq, and yet after that still being able to live within our means and still being able to deliver a budget surplus that pays another $2.2 billion off Labor's debt. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to address each of these uh, areas in a, little, in a little more detail. Firstly, addressing those areas of essential spending. This budget allocates over the next five years another $2.1 billion to, stre to strengthen Australia's defence. We are strongly committed on this side of the House to building Australia's defence capability. This is a clear contrast to some of those on the left of the ALP. Mr Deputy Speaker, this extra commitment in this budget brings new funding commitments to defence of $38 billion since this government came into office. Secondly, in terms of security, uh, a, a related area of need, this budget means enhanced domestic security. We already in the 2001 budget allocated another $1.4 billion over five years for uh, domestic security measures. Uh, this budget allocates a further $411 million over the next five years for that purpose, for ports, for airport security, for Australian intelligence organisations and other essential areas of need. It's unfortunate that the world climate is such that this money has to be spent, but it is a prime priority of any government to secure the, the, the uh, security, uh, the safety of its own citizens, and this government is committed to doing that. Mr Deputy Speaker, in that regard, I just have to express my disappointment uh, with the Labor Party continuing to obstruct the 2002 ASIO bill that is part of this government's determination to protect the life and the safety of Australian citizens. But again, the, government, again, the government's measures are being obstructed by those opposite. Mr Deputy Speaker, the second essential area of spending uh, highlighted in this budget is spending on education uh, right across the sector, higher education, schools education, vocational education and training. In the area of higher education, this budget delivers much needed reforms, reforms which will give greater flexibility, greater competitiveness, greater sustainability, greater equity and will raise the teaching standards in our university sector. This package of reforms has been developed by the minister after extensive consultation throughout the tertiary sector and with widespread support from the vice-chancellor's committee. It has many features. Just quickly to run through those. An extra $1.5 billion over the next five years. An extra 1,400 places for nursing and teaching in our universities. 2,500 scholarships starting next year and rising to 5,000 in three years' time for disadvantaged students uh, to uh, enable them to get into university. An easing of the repayment threshold for HECS 
for students, raising it from $24,000 to, to $30,000 before they will need to repay their HEX fees. Uh, and then it provides access to full fee-paying courses for those Australians uh, to be able to have the same opportunity that overseas students do. Those who just miss out on a HEX-funded place, uh, if they've got the capacity, uh, if they want to access a loan to do so, then they can uh, have the same opportunities that overseas students have to, uh, to pay for a, uh, for a fee-paid fee course. Uh, that is after, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is after the expanded number of HEX places are guaranteed and are delivered, uh, then there is that other option there as well. Mr Deputy Speaker, these reforms are essential. They are sensible and they are equitable, despite the nonsense uh, that we've been hearing from Labor on the other side. And if I can just quote, for instance, uh, just this week uh, from Ross Gittins in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, who is pretty objective in his analysis of uh, most things to do with economic policy, he said this about these changes uh, to uh, university funding. Uh, you take the people who are smart enough to attend the most intellectually high-powered institutions in the country that is, the universities mention a threat to their hip pocket and all their powers of rational analysis go out the window. That could be said of those opposite as well. As well. All their powers of rational analysis go out the window. Ross Gittins goes on to say, when you look at it coolly and assemble all the facts, you find that the Howard government's proposed changes to university fees are not as onerous as the critics claim and they are not unfair to students from poor families. In fact, they greatly assist students from poor families. And 2,500 scholarships next year, rising to 5,000 scholarships for students from poorer families. Mr Deputy Speaker, the other point that's worth, that's worth making is this, that this package of extra funding for higher education is roughly double the package that Labor was offering in its much trumpeted Knowledge Nation. They went around the country saying how wonderful their Knowledge Nation package was, was going to deliver all this funding for universities. This package that this government is, is going to deliver, that is budgeted for under this bill, will deliver twice what the much trumpeted Knowledge Nation was going to deliver. The Noodle Nation, they, they could never fund it. Now they're saying ours is, not, ours is not enough, yet it's double what they said that they are going to deliver. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move on to other areas of education. The continued and essential commitment of this government to vocational education and training, remembering, Mr Deputy Speaker, that 70 per cent of students don't ever get to the inside of a university. This government is committed to increasing, enhancing, expanding opportunities for those young people. Young people that were ignored by the Labor Party, who shamefully allowed apprenticeships to run down to their lowest level for 30 years. This government has proudly reversed that tragic decline, and apprenticeships in this country are now at record levels, more than double what they were when Labor was, when Labor was kicked out of office. This package, Mr Deputy Speaker, brings, brings vocational training and education spending over the next four years to a record $8.5 billion, an area that is much needed. If I can just, uh, just uh, illustrate by reference to my own electorate, over the last two years under this government we've seen a strong increase in the number of young people in apprenticeships, an increase from, uh, uh, in, uh, over the last two years from 1,471 young people taking up new apprenticeships to 2,075, a 50 per cent increase roughly just in two years of people finding worthwhile careers in apprenticeships uh, just in my own electorate, a product, a, benef uh, a beneficiary of the, the strong and positive policies of this government. Thirdly, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the area of education, measures to increase export education, an area of enormous potential, $5 billion a year and growing exports of education in this country, measures in this budget to assist that. Uh, one of the, the outstanding institutions in our electorate, the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School, uh, providing, uh, bringing many students from overseas, providing export dollars, money coming to our local electorate and tremendous opportunities in careers for graduates of uh, the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the area of schools, school education, this budget delivers an extra 8.3 per cent, an extra 8.3 per cent to schools, bringing school funding to a record of $6.9 billion. 
including a focus on really important areas such as literacy, another $210 million for literacy. This has been a very important focus of the Howard government, of raising standards of literacy and numeracy across this country. Finally, bringing the, bringing the state premiers, state education ministers, sometimes kicking and screaming, to an agreement to a national benchmarking of literacy and numeracy to, to ensure, to guarantee essential standards of literacy and numeracy in our schools around this country. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's been very sad to hear the, the, the ideologically driven rhetoric of the other side about school funding, captivated as they are by the teachers' unions and unwilling and unable to look at the realities of school funding. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move to the third area of need addressed in this budget, the area of health spending. Uh, addressing areas that really need to be addressed. This government is committing under this budget an extra $917 million to Medicare to ensure that Medicare is sustainable, that it's accessible and affordable. Now, the nonsense we hear from the other side about the government threatening Medicare, how could we be threatening it if we're putting an extra $917 million into it? We are committed to making it work better. Labor could never do that, in spite of all their nonsense over there. The best that bulk billing rates ever got under the Labor Party was 80 per cent. They could never get it above 80 per cent, and now they're somehow pretending that if they got into office they would do magically what in 13 years they failed to do. They're a fraud and a sham. Mr Deputy Speaker, under this government, under the Howard government, spending on health has risen by 65 per cent in seven years, an increase of 65 per cent in health spending. The other aspect of the budget is the, is the Australian health care agreements with the state governments, the health care agreements with the state governments that will provide $42 billion, $42,000 million over the next five years to assist the state governments to fund their state public hospitals. An increase of $10 billion. And an that's on top of an increase of, uh, of 28 per cent in real terms the five years before that. The last five-year health care agreement under the former Labor government was $24 billion. This one's $42 billion, an increase of 75 per cent in Commonwealth funding to assist the states with their, uh, with their public hospitals. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I could go on. Other key areas of spending, $316 million over the next four years to continue this government's successful tough on drugs strategy, a strategy that has led to greater seizures of illicit drugs a strategy that is tackling the importation, the distribution and the use of illicit drugs that has brought so much misery to so many people. A program that has been successful. We've seen an encouraging uh, decline in the number of heroin deaths. We've seen a dramatic rise in seizures of illicit drugs. Mr Deputy Speaker, other areas, an extra $135 million over the next four years for disability employment services that do so much uh, to focus on the abilities of, of uh, people that might have disabilities and to use those abilities to get them into rewarding work. I've got some great uh, em uh, disability employment providers in my electorate, uh, Nova Employment, Active Employment, Sid West, West Personnel, Allura Industry and others who do a great job, and this extra $135 million will assist them. Mr Deputy Speaker, the other area that I, that I wanted to move on to, the other area that is important in this budget is the income tax cuts. $2.4 billion in income tax cuts, but let's put that into context. These come, on top of, these come on top of the income tax cuts that we delivered just three years ago in July 2000. Let's not forget that. Labor would, these income tax cuts, $12 billion, July 2000, income tax cuts of $12 billion, net tax cuts after the whole new tax system package, net tax cuts of $6 billion, opposed by the Labor Party. The Labor Party opposed tax cuts of $12 billion to Australian workers, opposed net tax cuts of $6 billion. Now they've been, now they've been over there saying that the $2.4 billion in income tax cuts, extra tax cuts offered, are not enough. Yet when, they, when, the, uh, the shadow, when the opposition leader got up uh, to deliver his budget response, we didn't hear any other promises about extra tax cuts. Mr Deputy Speaker, compare this. Labor's last promised tax cuts, the LAW tax cuts, what happened to them? They disappeared magically after Labor got into office. Not only did they, those LAW tax cuts not materialise, they were replaced by an immediate slug of 2.5 per cent on every sales tax rate around the country. The 10 per cent rate went to 12.5 per cent, the 20 per cent rate went to 22.5 per cent and so on. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the contrast is clear. The Labor Party stands for higher taxes. This government, the Coalition, stands for tax cuts—$2.4 billion tax cuts in this budget. The point is this, Mr Deputy Speaker, that where we can, after delivering, delivering on those areas of need, increase security for Australia, enhancing our education system, strengthening our health spending, after we've done that, and if we can still afford it, we are committed to giving back to taxpayers some of their hard-earned money to reducing income taxes. Mr Deputy Speaker, the third area that this budget illustrates again, and this is so important, is that this government is committed to living within its means. This government is able to live within its means. This government is able to manage responsibly. Compare that with the record of the other side. This budget delivers another surplus, a surplus of $2.2 billion. This means that $2.2 billion more will be paid off the debt that we inherited from Labor. Let's just go back and think about this. In the last five years of Labor Party in office, they added almost $70 billion to, a, to government debt. In their last five years, they averaged deficits of almost $14 billion a year. Year after year, for five years, $14 billion worth of deficit each year. A total close to, I think it was $68 billion, close to $70 billion in five years. Leaving, leaving us leaving us with a debt when we came into office of $96 billion. Mr Deputy Speaker, through this government's responsible management, we've been able to repay $63 billion of that $96 billion debt, removing it to $33 billion. Mr Deputy Speaker, the implications of this are obvious. Let me mention three important implications. One is that our children will not be saddled with a burden of having to pay for the profligacy of the drunken sailors opposite. Secondly, secondly, the annual interest bill that taxpayers have to meet has been substantially reduced. In 1995, $8 billion a year Order. of taxpayers' money was going down the gurgler simply paying interest on Labor's accumulated debt. $8 billion a year Order. of taxpayers' money down the drain servicing Labor's debt. Because of this government's responsible management, that has been reduced to $3 billion. Taxpayers are saving $5 billion a year in interest payments now that they're not servicing the massive debt left by Labor. That's $5 billion a year that can be spent on essential services, on health, on, on uh, education and on defence and security for this country. The other important point, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the, the other effect of those high deficit policies of Labor was that they put upward pressure on interest rates. And who can, who can forget the, the, the horrific interest rate burden that home and home buyers suffered under Labor? When, when Labor left office, home loan interest rates were 10.5 per cent. They're now down to almost 6.5 per cent. The average home buyer, even a home buyer who has a mortgage of $100,000, saving almost 4 per cent a year, uh, a year on their interest payments, is saving almost $4,000 a year in post-tax dollars on their mortgage. That is roughly, uh, roughly $330 a month on their mortgage. If you had a mortgage of $200,000, you're saving close to $660 a month on your mortgage. The high debt, high deficit policies of those opposite would push interest rates up again and again uh, rapidly raise that burden on Australian home buyers and Australian homeowners. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the, the stuff we've heard coming from the other side, the constant sort of uh, cries about we're not spending enough on this, we're not spending enough on that, we're not spending enough on something else, repeated again by the opposition leader in his response to the, to the budget. Uh, wanting to spend but not having a clue how to get the money to, to, make or to, to fulfil all those promises. The magic pudding approach from the other side that somehow pretends you can keep spending money, it will it'll materialise out of nowhere, someone will pay for it, we'll worry about that later. The policies that, that run up deficits, the policies that run up debt, the policies that push up interest rates, the policies that will have to push up taxes. Mr Deputy Speaker, the contrast could not be clearer. This government can deliver sound economic management, economic management that can reduce debt, economic management that can reduce interest rates, 
economic management that can reduce income taxes. The, the, the random policies of spending on the other side, the outrageous uh, uh, profligacy and extravagance on the other side that's easy to promise and can't be delivered on, would raise interest rates, raise debt, raise, raise deficits and raise taxation. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget is responsible. It delivers on areas of need. It enhances Australia's security. It strengthens our education and health system, and it, it, it allows us to continue to manage this country properly, to repay Labor's debt, to keep interest rates down, and to improve living standards for the Australian people. All of the question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. To that, I call the honourable member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. In um, 2002, the Prime Minister said to a joint meeting of the US Congress, like you, I see the Australian family at the heart of the nation's existence. Not only does the family nurture and educate our children, but it provides emotional anchorage for all of us as we travel through life. The strength of the family, of course, goes beyond the spiritual and emotional. United caring families are the best social welfare system mankind has ever devised. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, Given that, you would have to ask why this government has brought in a budget that makes life so much more difficult for ordinary families in this country. Of course, it comes after many years of attacking families and um, it shouldn't surprise us, but the, the difference between the rhetoric of the government and what they're prepared to commit to when it comes to dollars in the budget still startles me. We have um, a lot of spin from the Howard government when it comes to committing valuable resources and budget dollars, this government are at best silent and at worst negligent. We know that Australian families are doing it tough because they've faced the seven highest tax years in Australian history. Foreign debt has doubled to $354 billion. Credit card debt, and this is very significant for families, has tripled to $22 billion. Australian families owe nearly $600 million to the Commonwealth Government in family tax benefit debts and over 670,000 families now owe an average debt of $850. This is because of the inadequacy of the government in introducing this system of payment of family tax benefit. Bank fees have doubled since 1997. Australians are saving just three cents in every dollar they earn, compared with eight cents under Labor. Average monthly mortgage repayments are at a 13-year high. Um, members on the opposite side continually talk about uh, interest rates and how frightened um, ordinary people are of interest rate rises. Of course they are, but the reality is that they're paying more now for their mortgages than they ever have in the past. Um, it takes um, eight and a half years of wages to buy an average Australian home, which is 27 months longer than it was just seven years ago. And of course, in my electorate, that situation is much worse because of the high cost of housing. This government's policies are hitting families hard, and uh, the only response from the government is to give a, a measly $4 tax cut to people on average wages. If you look at a family earning $20,000 a year, and there are a lot of them around, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, they're receiving a tax cut of only $1.63 a week. Knowing what those families face in additional costs, we really have to ask ourselves what that $1.63 a week is going to buy them. Their um, average families are being paid $725, the total, $725 million less in family tax benefits. That means that the average family will be receiving a benefit uh, $400 less than the government had previously promised. Um, when families um, get their you know, $4, $1.63, whatever it is in their pay packets, it's hardly going to make up for the fact that they're paying more for essential medicines, more to see their GP, more to educate their children. The tax changes um, will still leave average families paying more than 60 cents in each additional dollar earned in tax uh, and reduced benefits. And you've also got to remember that families are now um, faced with the um, prospect of starting to save $44 a week um, from the, the time of their child's birth to pay for the university education um, that their children, they hope to um, obtain for their children. Andrew McCallum of um, ACOS said, and I quote, this is an upside down budget. It takes from the poor to pay for handouts to the well off. Budget cuts will undermine the health and financial security of up to three million poor and vulnerable Australians, especially the disabled, the sick and the unemployed. The Brotherhood of St Lawrence responded to the budgets by saying, and I quote, 
Changes to health and education in the 2003-2004 federal budget risk further entrenching the growing gap between rich and poor, and changes to Medicare and higher education are likely to create a user pay system that impacts most on those on low incomes. Uh, that's the end of the quote. The, um, if you look at health in uh, greater detail, we see that, um, that there is indeed a crisis in our national health care system. The rates of bulk billing have decreased by 11 percentage points over the last seven years, with only 69.9 per cent of GP services now bulk billed. It was 80 per cent under Labor. The member for Macquarie um, um, turns his nose up at a rate of 80 per cent, but I know that m most Australians would be very happy to see us to return a, to a rate of 80 per cent of bulk billing. More than 10 million fewer GP visits were bulk billed this year compared to when John Howard first came to office. What a shocking figure that is. The average cost of seeing a doctor who doesn't bulk bill is now $12.78. Up, that's up 5 per cent since the Howard government came to office in 1996. And of course, there are um, a great deal fewer doctors that do bulk bill. Australian families are now paying $123 million a year more for visits to their local GPs since the Howard government came to office. Uh, AMA President Karen Phelps, um, Karen Phelps was um, very concerned about, um, she, and I quote, we're looking at a massive cut to the PBS, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme of $2 billion, which will hit the sickest and the poorest, people with chronic illnesses, which will be particularly affected, as will people with young children who are often at the doctors. Um, the Australian Division of General Practice um, applauded Labor's um, proposals in response to the government and said that um, our our proposals, and I quote, are a, a substantial increase in patient rebates and no requirement that GPs opt into an agreement about bulk billing are positive elements of the ALP package. There is an alternative to what the government's proposed. Um, what's really interesting about the government's uh, rhetoric on Medicare is the, the loud trumpeting of the um, $917 million rescue package for Medicare, as they like to call it. Um, but um, not even a whisper of the $918 million that they've cut from public hospitals. Further incentives um, to, um, uh, will encourage um, GPs actually to stop bulk billing. I, in my electorate, I'm very lucky that we still have very high bulk billing rates. Um, it's an inner city electorate and there are a lot of you know, high numbers of doctors that do bulk bill and um, high bulk billing rates. Well, you, um, you've got to uh, admit Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, that the government's proposal is an incentive to them to start charging co-payments. Why wouldn't they when the government makes it so easy for them? And um, The result of all of this, of course, is to make Australian families pay three times for their medical attention. They pay once through their Medicare levy, once when they go and see a doctor and once through their private health insurance. The um, education, if you look at education in more detail, we know that over $5 billion has been gutted from universities and from student income support since uh, 1996. Um, Australian families are now paying $900 million more for the cost of educating their children at university than when the Howard government was first elected. There are 20,000 fewer publicly funded university places than in 1996. Fewer places, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. Student fees have increased 85 per cent since 1996. Um, the um, Minister for Education is, um, uh, carries on all the time about how elitist it is of us to um, complain about funding for university education, but on his own figures yesterday he admitted that almost half of Australians see the inside of a university at some stage, either when they first leave school or in many cases later in life when they're retraining or um, studying for a new career. Only uh, well, fewer than 3 per cent of Australian students see the inside of a Category 1 public school, a Category 1 private school, and uh, there's no controversy about the fact that those private schools now receive more funding than universities. Private schools in total receive more funding than universities. Um, student, uh, Students are now paying 40% um, of the cost of their university education, not 25%, as the government continually claims. The NTEU um, says that student contributions under Backing Australia's Future will increase to 44%, and if these current budget measures are enacted, students will pay 50% of 
of their university education, which is the highest of um, any, anywhere in the world, the highest student contribution anywhere in the world. We're told that um, American universities are so expensive for students to get into. On average, Australian students pay more than American students or students anywhere in the developed world for their university education. Daniel Kiriakou from the National Union of Students says, um, and I quote, proposals to expand the number of places for students who are able to jump the queue by paying full fees of up to $90,000 sends the message that money is more important in accessing higher education than academic ability. Even the government's proposed new hex fees of up to $40,000 for some degrees will put a university education further out of reach for potential students from low and middle income Australian families. Um, so what has the government done? Increased hex fees by up to 30 per cent, raised um, the repayment threshold to $30,000 after dramatically lowering it when they came into government. But remember that under Labor's original um, proposal, um, the hex repayment threshold in the years 2005-2006 would have been $39,000. So still dramatically, um, the threshold is, will still be dramatically lower after these changes than it would have been if they hadn't tampered with it in the first place. And TAFE funding, that the minister is so fond of carrying on about um, uh, vocational education and TAFE funding, there is not an extra cent in this budget for TAFE. It's, um, it's incredible the hypocrisy of a minister who comes in all the time and, and talks about how we don't care about kids and vocational education and TAFE, and then not to put a single extra cent into the budget for the technical and further education sector is, is phenomenal. Um, this budget creates 444 places for doctors and nurses. Um, well, that's terrific. We've heard a lot of fanfare about that, but it's well, well short of the 800 places that this government's own review into nursing has said were necessary. Um, they are, of course, um, prepared to um, commit $20 million to creating a new bureaucracy to attract students. You've really got to ask about the priorities there. Um, we've heard a lot recently, of course, about um, child protection uh, because of the governor, former Governor General's um, dramatic failures in this area. And um, we heard the Prime Minister say, in response to questions about a Royal Commission, that he'd rather take the um, 100 to $140 million a Royal Commission would cost and spend it instead on child protection and early intervention. I, I actually looked forward to seeing something in this budget for child protection. I thought that given the current environment, they, they couldn't go past doing something for children in this country. G given all the media focus, the public attention on child abuse, unprecedented public attention, nothing. $4 million for, um, for child protection. This is the same $4 million that they underspent by $500,000 in last year's budget. I cannot understand how you could not spend a puny amount like $4 million on child protection, given what we know are the needs in this country, given that we know the, the large number of children that face um, physical abuse or sexual abuse in their home or, um, or in some other institution. And um, the same for domestic violence. I mean, we have such a small amount of money committed to domestic violence by this Commonwealth government, $16.5 million. I mean, $16.5 million is a lot of money if you're an individual with $16.5 million sitting in your bank account. But when you're talking about a nation of 20 million people, $16.5 million is not a lot of money to, to devote to an important area like domestic violence. Well, this government's able to take $10.1 million out of that $16.5 and, and spend it on a fridge magnet, on the terrorism fridge magnet. How can it be? that they can't spend even the pathetic amount of money that is, that is dedicated to these important areas. Have a look at the baby bonus. Well, that's been underspent as well. Why is that failure of advertising? It's certainly not that, that families don't need help when they're having babies. We've heard so much over um, the last um, years and particularly the last months about paid maternity leave. Again, I thought that it was an excellent opportunity, this budget, for the government to, to introduce paid maternity leave. We know the government's own Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Prue Goward, has made a very strong recommendation in favour of paid maternity leave, and yet nothing in this budget. The Prime Minister said in 2002 on, um, on AM, paid maternity leave, I quote, paid maternity leave has a legitimate claim in the debate. There is merit in it, and we're looking at it. Um, in November 2002, at a CEDA speech, 
and I quote, our key policy goal in this area is to facilitate choice for families and not to mandate particular behaviour. We need to respect the different priorities that individual families have and the different choices they want to make. Well, you would think that that would be a terrific opening for paid maternity leave. You would think that that was um, softening up the community for a really good announcement on paid maternity leave. Not a cent. Not a priority for this government. Um, we hear a lot of rhetoric as well about welfare to work. Um, Tony Abbott, um, the Minister for Workplace Relations, this, the government, and I quote, the government is committed to a simpler, fairer welfare system with built-in incentives for people to find work as a counterpoint to the problems of the wider world. Providing a fair go for struggling Australian families is more urgent than ever. Well, certainly it is. I agree that it is. I'm sure everyone on this side of the chamber agrees that it is. We could have expected something in the budget to help families struggling um, from welfare to work. No, nothing. According to the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, it appears that $135 million over four years announced by the Treasurer for Disability Employment Services comes from at the cost of moving 90,000 people over four years from disability support pension to the new start allowance. Now, I know, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, that you would have experienced the same thing as I have in your electorate office with people coming in in an absolute flat panic about these proposals to, to ch propose changes to disability support payments. People are absolutely terrified about what it means for their, for their um, ability to make ends meet. Again, when you're looking at um, protections for the, um, the, the weakest members of our community, on top of all these changes to, um, to people on disability support pensions, you look at what the government's proposing to do the, to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission. Absolutely gut the commission, make it impossible for the commission to appear in, um, in uh, legal proceedings without the permission of the minister. So the minister says, sure, we agree that, um, that you need to make, represent a client against the government. I, I, I mean, it, it's absolutely fanciful to imagine that the excellent advocacy work that the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission have been able to do at times in the past will happen under these proposed changes. It cannot happen. Um, if you look at the cuts to legal aid, cuts of 35 per cent since 1996, people, I mean, you know the situation, people coming to your office because they can't afford legal aid. Whole areas have been wiped out of legal aid. These people are beside themselves. They're appearing in the court system unrepresented. They're wasting the time of the courts. In the end, um, in the end, there's no saving because the court system is so much slower and the results people are getting are not fair. Have a look at childcare. 30,000 children are unable to get childcare places outside school hours. Um, this government is spending $800 less per childcare place than in 1996. How can we provide quality childcare on those sorts of figures? And funds for children with special needs have been frozen. Have a look at the area of mental health. This is something that, um, that unfortunately, we don't, um, we don't discuss nearly enough in this parliament, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. We know that, um, that at least 25 per cent of health-related disabilities in our society are mental health disorders. One in five people are affected by a mental illness at some time in their lives. And yet we spend less than 4 per cent of our total Commonwealth health funding on mental health services. Australia spends far less on mental health than New Zealand, Canada, the US, the UK, Ireland. For example, over 8 per cent of Ireland's health spending is on mental health services. The Mental Health Council of Australia released last year a report called Out of Hospital, Out of Mind. And, um, he pointed out the incredible needs in this area and how families are left, just to, left alone just to cope as best they can if they have a family member that experiences a mental illness. The government could have responded in this budget to the um, calls in this, uh, in this report, but it has not done, it has not done so. It's, it's not earmarked any extra funding in this area. There is only so much that state governments can do. And the federal government has to do more than pump out glossy brochures um, in this area. If you look at the environment, um, we, um, despite the Prime Minister's um, talk about salinity, we know that in 2000, the year 2000, the Prime Minister committed an extra uh, $1.4 billion to the National Action Plan on salinity. Well, it's been clawed back. The, um, 
salinity and water quality spending is going to be cut by more than 60 million over the next two years, making a total of $287 million cut from the National Action Plan. Now, honestly, this is an area that, where there is a crying need. We know that there is a crying need in this area. Land clearing, we've heard the Prime Minister speak about as well. He's promised at both elections to do something about land clearing. Not a thing. We are committed to halting large-scale land clearing, and we've said so in our budget reply. Alternative fuels. This budget is a disaster for alternative fuels. Um, the, and the ABC. We have um, Senator Alston out there telling the community that if the ABC doesn't act as the propaganda wing of the, um, the federal government, then they're going to have their funding cut. This government, this government has, um, uh, has come up with a budget that is a disaster for the poorest people in our community, a disaster for the middle class, and passes more benefits to the wealthy than to any other part of the Australian community. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. For that, I call the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Environment and Heritage, Minister for a member for Murray. I thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The economy of this country is a consequence of the entrepreneurial spirit, the work ethic of the men and women, and prudent and strong federal government leadership. This has produced a continuation of growth and expanding opportunity despite the internationally turbulent times and the crippling impact of drought on regional economies. Our economic strength is one of the wonders of the developed world. The budget delivered additional investment into national security, education, aged care, road funding and environment and heritage protection. At the same time, despite the drought, expenditure incurred in liberating the Iraqis and extra costs associated with national security issues, the Treasurer, Peter Costello, was still able to deliver tax cuts over $10.76 billion over four years and retire more of Labor's legacy of debt. In this week, when we focus on the continuing struggle of Indigenous communities as they recover from the impacts of the usurpation of their land, I want to say how pleased I am with the increase in the budget, in particular, of the funds for the Indigenous programs that are delivering real change to the lives of our first Australians. The Indigenous Protected Area Program, for example, funded under the Natural Heritage Trust uh, Mark II, now has a more secure funding stream and participants can better plan for their futures. Seventeen IPAs have been, involuntarily, uh, proclaimed, have been voluntarily proclaimed so far, covering more than 13 million hectares of country owned or managed by Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. This country now becomes part of the National Reserve System. Much of the country now returned to Aboriginal ownership or control is in a seriously degraded condition eaten out by feral species and overgrazing, invaded by weeds, the soil eroded or compacted, water holes and waterways damaged, destroyed or polluted. The IPA is a voluntary scheme which helps Indigenous land managers to first strategically plan and then implement works to restore their country to protect unique ecosystems and biodiversity. They are tackling the problems of goats, donkeys, camels, rabbits, cats and foxes, inappropriate fire regimes and weeds. Elders locate critically endangered native flora and fauna and work with scientists who can then better understand how to rescue those species. Some of our IPAs are teaching their non-Indigenous neighbours how to bring back country that's been pushed to the limits. IPA participants uh, develop work programs to maintain and sustain their country intergener intergenerationally. At the same time, as they look to new ways to live off the land, say as ecotourism or bush tucker enterprises, outdoor recreational specialists or providers of educational tours. The IPA program is one of the many great success stories made possible by NHT funding, the biggest sum ever committed by any government to environmental sustainability works in this country. When combined with the National Salinity and Water Quality Action Plan and other environmental initiatives, it is clear that the John Howard-led government has, in the year 2003 uh, to 2004, delivered the biggest ever injection of federal funds into sustaining and conserving our great country's natural resources. Natural resource protection, conservation and remediation is, we believe, the biggest challenge facing all Australians in this century. The scale of our budget commitment to the environment reflects this concern. As a member for Murray, as well as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Environment and Heritage, I and my constituents are sharply focused on the future of the Murray-Darling Basin. Access to good quality water is the lifeblood of the region's economy, whether that be farming, manufacturing, urban consumption or tourism and living and working amidst the natural beauty of the riverland and forests, waking to the sounds of the bird life coexi coexisting with the native fauna, anchors and enriches the life of communities and gives individuals' lives special meaning and purpose. 
We know the environment is in serious trouble. We understand we must urgently take stock of all water consumption and management regimes that have left us with blue-green algal blooms poisoning waters, feral fish supplanting native species fouling wetlands, some 1,500 kilometres of dying red gum on the banks of the Murray from Euston downstream, houseboats blatantly fouling waters with fuel spills, grey water and human waste dumping, making noise playing havoc with riverside habitat, jet skis and speedboats eroding banks and frightening wildlife. Tourism and recreation on the riverlands is a significant activity economically and culturally, but it must be better regulated and managed. We have to cut through the problem of cross-border anomalies, where the mix of New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia jurisdictions means regulations are not aligned. In critical areas, for example, regulating river use behaviour and the location and number of pumping out stations for houseboats, as one example, are left in a too hard basket. Right now, the Murray-Darling Basin states and the ACT and the Commonwealth are consulting on what environmental flows need to be returned in the future to sustain the Murray-Darling ecosystems. Regional communities can now be better assured that there is an acknowledgement that sustaining human community or human capital is equal in importance to sustaining natural capital, given that the latter depends on the former to invest in and manage the ecosystem sustainably. There is a close interdependency between human communities experiencing a life they consider is worth leading for themselves and their children and their desire to invest in and protect and sustain the land and water that underpins their existence. The development of models of ecosystem health indicators now being produced at the request of the Murray-Darling Basin Council are hugely important in convincing basin communities that we do have some idea about what additional environmental flows are needed to rescue the now threatened wetlands, water quality and flora and fauna. We must be able to assure those who may have to relinquish some of their water rights that the basis, that's the basis of their livelihood, that their sacrifice will deliver the outcomes of a healthier river system. Nothing else will do. I want to commend the John Howard government for its open-ended commitment to drought relief in this federal budget with an expectation of at least $700 million being expended in the next financial year. At the same time, I want to condemn the Victorian BRACS-led government, which has now withdrawn all drought aid to Victorian farmers, aid which was offered during its electoral campaign fervour in late 2002. The Victorian government package was only announced months after similarly impacted farmers in New South Wales had been offered state-funded support. The New South Wales measures included fodder subsidies. You can imagine the desperation of farmers in northern Victoria watching the convoys of transports loaded with fodder crossing the rickety Murrah River bridges heading for the subsidised dairy farms and livestock enterprises of New South Wales. Some six months later, by the time the Victorian government noticed uh, that it was electorally smart to offer some assistance to Victorian rural enterprises, hit by the worst drought on record, it was too late. Any fodder was in critically short supply and, the, and way beyond the means of Victorian drought-stricken farmers. A month or two ago, rural communities were rocked by Victorian Minister for Agriculture Bob Cameron's announcement that all state drought aid to farmers was to be cancelled on the 7th of May. And I hope the shadow spokesman for the environment, the member for Wills, is paying attention to this. This drought was brought out, has brought out the worst in political opportunism and callous disregard in the case of the Victorian government. But it has also given rise to the steady commitment of the federal government and to some extraordinary acts of kindness and generosity displayed by the wider community. For example, between the 4th and 11th of January this year, the farmers of King Island rallied to the call for fodder by donating 1,000 tonnes for Victorian drought relief. They offered another 4,000 tonnes but could not afford to transport it to the mainland. There was a heartfelt plea to the BRACS government to cover the cost of the freight. Victoria's Deputy Premier, John Brumby, refused point blank, stating that there should be plenty of fodder in Victoria. What a disgrace. Was he so out of touch, or was it simply that he did not care about the crisis? The Brax government has also point blank refused assistance to the Golden Murray Water Authority, a state-owned instrumentality, which is forced to charge drought-devastated farmers for water it cannot deliver. 288 farmers cannot pay and the Goulburn Murray water cannot carry the debt. Due to the lack of water for sale for the last three years and despite it rising prices by nearly 30 per cent, Goulburn Murray water is unable to fund essential major storage safety works, for example, at Eildon Reservoir. 12 million is what they need for that reservoir, 
which generates billions of dollars in farm gate value and tourism annually, underpinning the Victorian economy. This is the first collapse of the irrigation system in 100 years. The Victorian economy has done very well out of the hard work and on-farm investment of irrigators, but in this hour of need it is simply walking away. Goulburn Murray Water needs only $12 million to make Ildon Dam safe, but Premier Brax of the Labor Victorian government says no. Instead, the Victorian government has provided $400 million for a new ticketing system for Melbourne's subsidised commuter transport system, $27.8 million for a new footbridge over the Yarra, and $425 million for the redevelopment of the MCG Northern Stand. The Brax government rejected a $77 million contribution from the Commonwealth government to assist with the MCG project because their union bosses told them to. So far, the Brax government has received over $400 million in competition policy payments from the federal government for, in, including uh, other reforms, water law reform. Not a cent of these funds have found their way into the pockets of the water supply or farm sector. This is breathtakingly short-sighted. Clearly, the state Victorian government does not understand or chooses to ignore the severity of this natural disaster. It has walked away. Drought Force, an excellent federal funded government program introduced five months ago, at least may rescue some of our regional workforce that's now looking to internal migration to capital seaboard cities. I commend the Commonwealth government for this extraordinarily far-sighted and humane and compassionate program. In my electorate, we have some 55 individuals now volunteering work back on farms in Murray, paid a new start allowance under this program. Those who are monitoring the situation closely anticipate that at least 30 per cent of, Murray's electorate, of the Murray electorate farmers may not be able to recover their losses sufficient to re-establish herds and restart enterprises when the drought breaks. There are also a significant number of farm-dependent businesses who have already lost too much equity in their enterprises and who will struggle to continue. The drought is a natural disaster. The next three months in particular will be the hardest of all. We are looking at less than 10 per cent of irrigation allocation at the opening of the season for the Goulburn system in August, possibly less than 30 per cent on the Murray system. I call on the Victorian Labor government members of the Senate and the House of Representatives to insist that their Labor colleagues in Spring Street, Melbourne, revisit their decision to withdraw all drought, aid to, all drought aid to Victorian farmers. I do not know how members opposite can sit here in clear conscience if they do not demand a return of some drought aid to Victorian farmers. This is uncharted territory in terms of how we will survive. We need both state and Commonwealth support. I want to commend the extraordinary efforts now being made in my community with rural towns and small district communities undertaking family days, information sessions, trying to make do. The Sheridan Centrelink office has done an extraordinary job. In regard to primary producers' futures, however, the drought is just another blow in their struggle for, to farm sustainably. In regard to exported primary production, primary producers typically compete in corrupted, subsidised and managed markets where any lowering of tariffs is often supplanted by non-tariff barriers aimed at protecting domestic producers. As well, exchange rate fluctuations can negatively or positively affect Australia's export earnings overnight and the exporting competitors in these markets are often advantaged with home country subsidies, aid, trade deals and the like. It is, extremely, it is extremely tough world out there in agribusiness trade land. Back home, however, in this country, a virtual duopoly dominates the food and beverage retail sector. This gives Woolworths and Colesmire, the two giants, the powers to exert extraordinary downward pressure on the prices they pay to suppliers. And at the moment, these two are particularly anxious to entrench their positions as they face a new era of globalisation of retail food chains. Mr Roger Corbett, chief executive of Woolworths, speaks for his company and his rival when he says, instead of focusing on getting margins up in product categories, we are interested in getting our costs down. This translates into, we intend to keep prices down and we will do this by finding efficiencies and paying less to our suppliers. Chief executive Corbett is hugely pleased to announce slicing $1 billion from Woolworths costs over the last four years 
and he seems particularly pleased to report that at least half of that has come out of the pockets of dairy producers. His big two, this big two can squeeze their suppliers because of their extraordinary purchasing power. Both use the cost reduction strategies of increasing home brands, and Woolworths in particular is also pursuing their everyday low prices strategy and uh, their, yearly, their bi yearly tendering for suppliers with only one year of price agreement. Home brands deliver maximum returns to the retailer. They force the supplier to become a price taker, with their product vulnerable to substitution by any imported or domestic supplier who will offer a few cents less. Even suppliers with premium brands are being pressured to also supply so-called top quality home brands that will then compete directly with their own product. Woolworths' everyday low price strategy drops suppliers' prices and takes away their ability to initiate supermarket specials. Specials can move glutted stock for a processor or grower due, for example, to seasonal conditions. Without this control over specials and advertising, suppliers lose their ability to optimally manage their stock. The supermarkets take total control. In relation to the supermarket's tendering system for suppliers, where 5 per cent can mean the difference in a farm product being under or oversupplied, and where there is virtually no alternative point of sale for the produce, there is invariably pressure on a supplier to submit a price near to or even below the cost of production. The supermarkets' pricing strategy and their use of their market power to push food and beverage suppliers' prices down has succeeded, in the case of Woolworths taking $500 million out of the pockets of dairy suppliers so far. Dairy prices, for example, collapsed by 30 per cent over three months in Victoria last year, just as the drought was beginning to bite. Another $500 million or so of Woolworths' um, cost cuts we are told have been found in a combination of improved efficiencies and paying lower prices to a whole range of other primary producer suppliers. So Australia's households will go on enjoying some of the cheapest and best food in the developed world. Woolworths and Colesmeyer shareholders will continue to see nice returns on their investments, and the suppliers of that food and beverage will be driven to survive on substantially less. Some commentators, including uh, NGOs, wonder why some farmers are not fencing out their remnant vegetation, installing their nutrient management systems, revegetating slopes, buying new, more efficient irrigation infrastructure, replacing lost nutrients, paying their workers more, reducing stocking rates, replacing introduced species with native pastures, restoring wetlands, tackling weed invasion and exterminating feral animals. I suggest they go and talk to customers in the supermarkets. Australia needs to understand that their cheap food is in fact costing the earth. A range of farmers responded to a survey undertaken by the Allen Consulting Company in 2001, the year before the major price collapse in the dairy industry. In a document called Repairing the Country, they quote the responses where landholders were asked to identify what factors prevented them from addressing environmental problems. Over 75 per cent cited a lack of funds. Another 67 per cent cited low commercial benefits. My farmer constituents put it this way, you cannot be green when you're in the red and you cannot pull up your socks when you have none. In a classic case of blaming the victim, the Wentworth Group in their Blueprint for a Living Continent proclaimed, we need to change our institutions to remove the hidden environmental subsidies to agriculture where farmers impose costs on other people or future generations. They do somewhat redeem themselves in the next paragraph by saying that these subsidies generally benefit consumers, not farmers, through lower prices and often hurt farmers who are trying to be sustainable by making their, them compete with others who are not paying the full cost of their actions. Farmers are simply not offered prices which cover the full cost, including the environmental externalities, in the production of food and fibre. And I've just been discussing why not. But it can and must be different. In a book soon to be published entitled Agri-Food Globalisation in Perspective, Associate Professor David Birch of Griffith Uni and Bill Pritchard, lecturer in, at uh, Economic Geography at University of Sydney, compare Australia and Canada's systems of regulating manufacturer-supplier relationships so that the value to be derived from the sector is shared and the industry remains competitive, sustainable and even grows. In Victoria, some 10 years ago, we, we dismantled what was a suboptimal but at least a working system of tomato industry supplier by a price negotiation and mediation. But it was replaced with the Commonwealth regulation which outlawed tomato growers' rights to even talk in the pub together about contract prices. While collective bargaining was lawful for workers in the labour market, more vulnerable micro-businesses like farmers were breaking the law if they sought to collaborate. I commend the wisdom of the Dawson Review of the Trade Practices Act, which identifies the inequities in the system. 
I also commend the initiative of John Howard government in the establishment of the Grocery Ombudsman, which interestingly has not been asked to deal with a single retailer supplier dispute due, I believe, to the huge potential for retaliation, but it is now proving to be a godsend for those in supplier and wholesaler disputes. We must consider how other countries have dealt with the inevitable vulnerability of primary producers to be price squeezed and the consequences for them as managers of our natural resources when they are pushed to the brink of viability. It, it has to be remembered that farmers are no longer necessarily in control of the decisions made about land use on their properties. They are, for example, often forced to take on board contract harvesters employed by multinational processes which are inappropriate for the best environmental protection of their soils. We have examples in Tasmania of this. We must find ways to transfer back the embedded subsidies in cheap food so it can be invested in the remediation and improvement of the land and water management. Uh, it is essential that this is so if we are to protect the country which sustains the people and sustains all our futures. Our supermarkets must and can behave ethically. They need to look to Sainsbury's and Tesco's as two examples of supermarkets who have understood what is at stake if they simply push their suppliers to the brink. The development of crop and animal protocols which translate into higher price uh, incentives for suppliers has been done elsewhere. Order. Australians the must look to those examples. Time has expired. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. To that, I call the honourable member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak on the Appropriations Bill for 2003-2004, now before the House. In my time as a member for Stirling, I have experienced five budgets from the Howard government. I do not want to devote my time in this place to listing the many atrocities of Treasurer Costello's previous budgets, but I will say that this year's budget is no exception. Again, he treats the Australian people with contempt and again fails to show the ability to have care and concern for justice and equity for all Australian people. If you listen to the Howard government rhetoric, health and education are two of their most important priorities. The Australian people are not that easily fooled. Prime Minister. This government has no real plans for health or education, but rather ways to stop the everyday Australian from getting the access to services that they deserve. Dismantling Medicare and the health system and increasing the burden on students, university, TAFEs and colleges is not fair and equitable. Allow me to start on the first of the Treasurer's supposed reforms of this year's budget, health. As part of my service to the electorate of Stirling, I produce a bulk billing guide listing all the bulk billing surgeries in the area. The first edition of this guide, produced in late 2002, had 28 bulk billing GPs on it. The latest edition, compiled in March of this year, has shrunk by more than 25 per cent to be at 20 bulk billing doctors for a population of approximately 90,000 people. The average Australian patient goes to a GP six and a half times per year. I trust that the government are able to do the math. Since the, in, since the introduction of Medibank by the Whitlam government, Australia has been considered a world leader in government health provision for all in our community. However, the Howard government is slowly dismantling one of the most important government initiatives in Australian history and left many Australians out in the, out in the cold when it comes to health care. And what has this government given us as an alternative system? Not much. Private health insurance has been propped up by taxpayer money with questionable success. So now all of the population pays for rebates that go to the 44.1 per cent of people who are covered by private health insurance. Again, all of us pay the Medicare rebate, yet according to the government's private health insurance policy, only those not covered privately would actually use it. And those Australians in private health insurance are not receiving the protection from fee hikes that the Prime Minister promised them so many times. Regularly, health insurance companies have raised their premiums well above CPI levels. Regularly, health insurance companies have ripped off their customers, and this government has sanctioned it. This government has never cared about health for low-income and middle-income people and families, and this budget is no change of the heart. The shortage of doctors in this country is of growing concern. Particularly in rural centres, general practitioners are in short supply. Where is the Treasurer's commitment to fixing the problem? He will tell you it is in the 38.7 million dollars he has set aside for medical places. If he really cared about the number of doctors ordinary Australians had access to, the amount that universities could charge for these new spots would be fixed. 
Naturally, it is not. There is a genuine shortage of doctors in this country, yet the Treasurer chooses to make a quick buck out of this through the universities rather than actually fix the problem. Prime Minister Howard says he is putting older Australians first by ensuring that pensioners have access to bulk billing. My colleagues have outlined time and time again why the plan will not work. But beyond that, even if it did work, this is still no real commitment to Australia's older people. Prime Minister Howard, if you cared about the health status of our pensioners, you would do something about the crisis that is gripping aged care in this country. In the Stirling electorate, bed licences have been issued. No new beds have been built since 1998, since I have been the member. Despite the fact that Australia has an ageing population, this seems to have escaped the government in putting together this budget. I would bring to the attention of the House the plight of one of my constituents, Mrs Athel Thomas, herself 71 years old, having to pave the way of her 100-year-old mother because this government refuses to. Mrs Thomas is trying to find an aged care bed for her 101-year-old mother, so far without success. Mrs Thomas and her mother are not alone. Hundreds of families in the Stirling electorate alone would be facing the aged care crisis daily, living with uncertainty for their own future and the future of their loved ones. If this government cared, the budget would have addressed this issue. The government has got things upside down. Health is clearly at the bottom of the list, and one position above it is education. Treasurer Costello is striking at the heart of higher education in Australia with this budget. Australia has a worldwide reputation for educating its people. Treasurer Costello is trying his hardest to destroy that reputation. Gough Whitlam introduced a higher education system that ensured every Australian had the opportunity to go to uni. When fees were introduced by the Hawke government, they were installed in such a way that, regardless of wealth, any Australian could still go. The Treasurer Costello mentality, though, is not about the most talented getting to university. It is about getting the richest to university. By giving universities 30 per cent freedom over their course fees, this government is creating a two-tiered system of education. If you are a student using hex style repayments, you can expect to be in debt for the better part of your working life. And for those families fortunate enough to be able to pay their sons and daughters' fees upright, these positions will now cost anywhere up to $100,000. I remember in Australia that with the Whitlam government, change is becoming renowned for its creativity, ingenuity and skillful, intelligent citizens. This was a product of a time when Australians were admitted to universities on the basis of talent, not, much how they were, not, much, not about how much they were prepared to pay. For the very small proportion of people out there with enough money to pay such high fees, there is some good news. The extremely wealthy minority will get into the top universities regardless of talent because they have a bank balance that meets the Treasurer's criteria. The Treasurer talked about the value of education as an export. Granted, we should take advantage of our international reputation as an educator and open our universities to students from around the world. But this budget allows for up to 50 per cent of undergraduates to be full fee-paying students, the majority of which would almost certainly be taken up by international students. Yes, let's make education an export, but let's not do that at the expense of young Australians who have every, every right to a higher education within their own country. Once we were the clever country, but under this government we will soon become the class country once again. The measures in this budget in, term, in terms of education ensure that lower socio-economic groups have no feasible access to higher education in this country. Australia's skilled workforce makes up a high proportion of Australians because of the accessible education that Whitlam put in place three decades ago. Even past coalition governments have realised the importance of accessible higher education, but for the first time since the early 1970s, not every Australian will be able to go to university on the basis of merit. I am appalled. My constituents in Stirling are appalled. They are also fearful that their children and grandchildren will not get access to education. Health and education should be the priorities of the budget, not the victim. But this government has enough disrespect for ordinary Australians to slash and burn through both areas of funding in the one budget. What compensation does the majority of Australians get for such poor policy? Treasurer Costello's tax cut. A very weak, very useless and very empty tax cut. $4 a week. Does that $4 a week compensate for the thousands extra Australian families will pay to put a child through university? 
Does it compensate for the GP payments and at times poorer health of Australians? Does it compensate for the peace of mind it has taken away from middle Australia? No. No, it does not. We on this side of the House take tax cuts very seriously. If the government did too, a tax cut would be introduced that managed to cover bracket creep or one that gave Australians more for their retirement. Instead, Australians are given a token cut, a cut that fails to confront bracket T, creep, a tax that is worth nothing. This empty tax cut should be measured up against the tax regime that the Coalition has introduced during this time in government. For example, $4 a week compared against the ANSET levy, the milk tax and the sugar tax, $4 a week against the goods and services tax that was meant to simplify tax but really was just another tax increase. The government presumably taxes Australians to fund public services. This government has ripped the most basic services, health and education, to shreds. Where is all this tax going, Treasurer Costello? Ordinary Australians like the people of Stirling deserve better. My colleagues and I are committed to serving the many and not the few. The government is not only removing our basic services, it is failing to invest in our greatest strengths. Australia is held in high regard as a destination throughout the world. Tourism should be looked upon as a key industry for the growth of the Australian economy. The global tourist market is going through very tough times. Terrorism and a poor global economy are threatening thousands of Australian jobs. The industry is in a state of crisis. But this government has done literally nothing to nurture tourism while it is fragile. Airlines are collapsing all over the world. Tourist destinations are going under every day. And the Prime Minister and Treasurer have twiddled their thumbs on this one, despite Australia's stronghold in the industry being threatened. I wonder if $4 a week will be enough to comfort those who lose their jobs because of government inaction. This mentality can be seen, especially in the electorate of Stirling. I brought the issue of the Sunset Coast as a tourist destination to this place a number of times. This is one of hundreds of natural tourist destinations in Australia, which received no support from this government. In spite of the government not caring about Stirling's tourism, in spite of lack of support, the Sunset Coast and the Stirling electorate have pressed on and continue to attract tourists. The city of Stirling has poured millions into, de into developing the areas surrounding the beaches along our beautiful and pristine coast. However, this organisation should not have to act without the backing of the federal government. I'm sure there are many councils throughout Australia have been treated just as badly, and Treasurer Costello, you do an injustice to our beautiful country by not supporting them. Just recent publicity in the media points out that Australia is perceived overseas as one of the safe destinations to go to. So we should be doing everything possible to promote that safety, to promote our beautiful country and natural attractions, and to attract tourists and the tourist dollar. Neglect is a common theme in this budget. Health, education and tourism have all been comprehensively neglected by the powers that be. We can add Australian families to this list. The Howard government has yet again snubbed parents who need help balancing their work and parenting responsibilities. Nowhere in this, in this budget is there anything for the average Australian family. It costs them more to see a doctor and get an education, particularly if they are a low or middle income family. And these same families can't go out and earn enough money to try and pay their way because a large proportion of their pay packet goes towards childcare. The government has left Australian families out in the cold yet again with no paid maternity leave, no childcare relief and clearly no interest in making life easier for the Australian community, particularly working people. The Howard government talks about the importance of work and family but gives little in this government to give practical support and resources to Australian families. The only money that is going into the Family and Community Services budget this year is money to catch out Centrelink cheats. I agree that those who are cheating the system need to be caught out. But if you look at the amount of money going to catching the minority and the amount of money going to helping the majority of genuine claims, there is a huge problem. This problem has exi existed throughout the Howard government's time in government, and year after year they have washed their hands of family services and decided that it is a problem too hard to fix. I must also point out that under the Family and Community Services portfolio, there seems to be a philosophy of funding pilots. A pilot's run for a year or so. Many of them have proved very successful, yet ongoing funding is not given to many of these pilots. That sets up a situation of creating an expectation of community. They have a service, then suddenly the service disappears. 
Judging by the measures taken in this budget, the federal government is eager to abandon you almost as soon as you leave Australian shores. Under the new budget, those on the majority of support payments will only continu continue to receive these for 13 weeks after leaving Australian borders. This means that those young Australians, like a growing amount of Australian students, will be supported by their government for barely three months when gaining an education overseas. I appreciate entirely that when someone leaves Australia, they do so on their own accord. But this, it, this is just another way that the Treasurer has trimmed off the top in order to try and buy us all for $4 a head. In the context of a sterling electorate, the Treasurer and Prime Minister have starved the area of resources yet again. The people of Stirling are hard-working individuals from all walks of life. The treatment of Stirling electorate in this budget is not unique. It repeats treatment being given to many Australians. It, it ignores the needs of the everyday person. Stirling could easily be a tourism money winner for the federal government and the Treasury co coffers. I challenge the, the government to find many other places in the world that have the pristine beaches of Scarborough, Trigger and North Beach located so close to a city centre. People throughout the world come and pay to be a part of that if the Howard government let them know. I can't repeat this often enough, but the, repeat, but the neglect of Stirling is not only in terms of the tourism industry. The coastal suburbs within Stirling electorate have endured poor television reception for many years due to the unique geography of the area. I have brought this matter to the attention of the government several times with no success. It would seem that the people of Stirling do not deserve an adequate quality of television reception. This is despite the fact that barely half of the money allocated for fixing television and black spots in the 2002-2003 budget was spent. The Treasurer takes great pleasure in announcing his budget surface, but this budget weighs down the people of Stirling and many other Australians. An opportunity for Stirling people to get reasonable television reception was lost. When people within the Stirling electorate are unable to get on aged care waiting lists because facilities are so overrun they have closed these lists, alarm bells should be ringing. Yet absolutely nothing has been done to give Australians the basic services they have earned through paying their taxes. Many people have asked me, the problem with aged care beds not being built is due to the Howard government cancelling the capital grants program to build aged care beds in the city, cities. Why doesn't the Howard government use some common sense and bring back the capital grants program for the cities? Yes, Prime Minister and Treasurer, why don't you use common sense, bring back the capital grants program for the cities and enable the many thousands of bed licences issued actually to be built? The poor decision making and planning by the Howard government is affecting areas not covered by federal legislature. When the federal government keeps on passing the buck, someone has to try and take up the slack. In the case of West Australia, it is the Labor state government. Health has been continually patched up by the state government, with the system being propped up with state funds earmarked for other important areas. The Minister for Health of West Australia, Bob Gutierre, told me recently that in West Australian hospitals there are 260 aged people who should be in an aged care facility. This is an enormous drain on state government finances, money that should be going into um, providing health services to people using the public hospital system. As well, it is an enormous saving on the federal government budget. This is perhaps how Treasurer Costello has brought in his surplus. The state government paying for the health provision that the federal government should be paying for. Budgets in the years gone by, just like this one, result in degradation of services and less support for those in need. All of Treasurer Costello's budgets have robbed robbed low-income and middle-income Australia of the service and support that previously made Australia a world example of social equity. As a mother, grandmother and member for Stirling, I am offended by what this budget is trying to do. I want my children, children and grandchildren to have reasonable access to health care, so do Stirling constituents. I want to know that I live in a country that looks after its young citizens, so do Stirling constituents. This is not just about their health but also about their education. It is a crime against our children and against Australians in general to starve a massive proportion of our population from higher educational access. This budget neglects the things most important to me and most important to ordinary Australians. We have been lucky enough to have visionary leaders like Whitlam, Hawke and Keating who saw the necessity of giving all Australians a strong infrastructure and resources. This budget is about tearing those basic resources away. It is poor economics, it is cheap politics and, sadly, it is an injustice against every Australian who believes in a fair go. We on this side of the House simply want a fair go for every Australian. I am proud of Labor's resolve when it comes to health and education. 
I worry that the Treasurer has got so, got so lost in undermining Labor principles that he has forgotten about what this place is about, representing Australians. This budget is no different from its predecessors, and I am appalled at the Howard government's approach to managing Australia's finances. You do not balance a budget through cutting essentials. You balance a budget through long-term investment and vision, something the Howard government has once again shown to be lacking. I call on the government to restore justice and equity and rethink their budget. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The question is the words proposed to Minister Stan Parr. The question I call the honourable member for Karangamite. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm delighted to participate in this year's uh, budget deliberations because of the strength of the Australian economy and the fundamentally sound basis in which the budget has been put forward to this uh, parliament. As the uh, Treasurer has said on a number of occasions publicly that uh, we have a situation here in Australia, unlike the states uh, and other countries around the world, where uh, the budget has delivered a tax cut, the budget is in surplus, we've been through a drought and we've been through the Iraq war. So if you, get that, if you look at that scenario, you see that uh, the presentation of this year's budget is a remarkable uh, demonstration of the strength and fundamental soundness of the Australian economy. <coughs> the uh, growth rate projected in the uh, budget is 3.25 per cent for the next, uh, next uh, financial year. This compares very favourably, Mr Deputy Speaker, with uh, other countries around the world. Uh, and uh, gives us a basis of confidence that we can move forward to fulfil the budget commitments and again uh, hopefully provide a tax cut and uh, uh, bring in a, a surplus. If we look at the surplus position of $2.2 billion, that compares very favourably with other countries around the world. And I think uh, those opposite should be, should be fully aware of that uh, budget program compared to the Keating years where uh, uh, deficit budgeting was the order of the day. <coughs> In the USA, you've got a position where the uh, Bush administration uh, have uh, produced a budget which is 4.2 per cent uh, of GDP. My understanding, if you convert that to Australian terms, that would be a $30 billion deficit in the Australian budget. So we can see the uh, relativity. <coughs> In Japan, their budget deficit is 8 per cent of GDP. Again, a very big figure. OECD 3.5 per cent of their uh, GDP and the EU about 2 per cent of their uh, GDP. So you can see that the Australian position is, uh, is very, uh, very good indeed and that's not come about by any stroke of luck. It's because of sound economic management, taking the hard decisions and uh, introducing policies that are for the benefit of all Australians. Uh, those opposite, of course, are always uh, uh, nagging at the uh, smaller bits around the edges, but unless we get the economy uh, moving in the right direction, unless we have it sound, then everyone uh, will suffer. If you look at the uh, public debt position, again something that those opposite tend to overlook, that the $96 billion that the Keating Hawke governments ran up was something they glossed over year after year. The $63 billion of that debt has now been paid off and leaving it with approximately $35 billion worth of government debt, which is 4% uh, 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 of GDP. Again, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this uh, total debt relative to other countries, we see an interesting uh, and stark figure. In, in Germany, the, uh, the public debt is 50% of uh, GDP, OECD about 50%, EU 55%. Japan is a staggering 80% of their GDP is held in government debt and the USA about 45 per cent. Again, you look at the trend where Australia in the budget papers is showing a trend to reduce their public indebtedness, where other developed countries are showing a trend to increase their public indebtedness, which, uh, uh, as everyone would be aware, that, uh, that, inc that uh, sustains an interest rate uh, cost to governments and to the people of that, uh, in that country. Mr Deputy Speaker, of course the tax cuts are a, a showpiece of this particular budget, while uh, some commentators and those opposite and others have um, suggested that the tax cuts are not, uh, not very great. Let me say that uh, by giving a tax cut the government is flagging its position that they are a low-taxing government. They wish to keep the incentive 
for people to work and save, uh, whereas uh, most Labor governments around Australia have increased their taxes. In fact, in Victoria, I think uh, 300 items are now indexed, so they'll go up automatically without any uh, decision, without any debate. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to incorporate the new tax rates in Hansard, if I may. I seek uh, leave to incorporate. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, Thank you. The member will have uh, an agreement to incorporate them, subject to the Speaker's guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd just like to refer to the uh, tax rates that I incorporated Hansard, the uh, changes from the, uh, the various thresholds. This is very important in terms of uh, the way in which it affects individual taxpayers. Uh, the threshold to $6,000, where people pay no tax, uh, from $6,000 to $21,600 at a, a tax rate of 17 per cent. A change from uh, the next uh, tax rate from $21,600 to $52,000 has gone up $2,000 at a 30 cent tax rate. Mr Deputy Speaker, that area is where a big, majority, a big number of Australian taxpayers are incorporated in that area, paying 30 cents in the dollar tax rate. The next uh, threshold has been moved up uh, uh, 2000 from 52000 to 62000 at a 42 cent tax rate. And of course, the highest uh, threshold is 62000 that uh, has been moved up from 60 to 62 at a 47 cent tax rate. I make the comment uh, that uh, obviously here in Australia, as people incomes rise, that the thresholds and uh, tax rates are a major problem, that the 47 cent tax rate plus Medicare levy coming in at 62,000 is really starting to affect a larger number of Australians. And I do encourage the government and those uh, senators to uh, support the government's suggested change to a 70,000 tax rate, which was rejected by the Senate last year. So there we have it, Mr Deputy Speaker, a change in the thresholds, a reduction in tax, and this is a very great thing by the government that, in fact, they are prepared to return hard-won uh, money back to individual taxpayers rather than spending it on grandiose uh, programs. If you, uh, if you actually look at the, uh, the cost of revenue, whilst uh, commentators and uh, those opposite have been saying that the tax tax uh, reductions are very small to individuals. The trend is right and, of course, the cost to revenue is $10.7 billion over four years. So it's very significant and that demonstrates a problem that uh, any tax reduction uh, can be quite uh, difficult for the Treasurer and the, uh, the budget, uh, budget estimates. Mr Deputy Speaker, if we look at the world, uh, world conditions again and just see Australia's uh, a uh, very good position that we do have this growth rate projected of three and a quarter percent uh, relative to a projected world growth rate, which has got a few problems of about three percent. If we look at some of our trading partners, Japan, for instance, has got a uh, almost a zero uh, projected growth rate. Uh, six uh, major banks are fa facing bankruptcy yet again, being bailed out by the central government. The Middle East has got some difficulties, and uh, the SARS. Uh, epidemic has had a major impact on airlines, just another uh, factor of uh, world economics. The American uh, economy dominates the world economic situation, as uh, everyone would be aware, some 25 per cent of the world economic activity. However, the Bush administration have seen fit to run a deficit budget there, and uh, that is a major concern to me and to Australia as to the position of the American economy. Uh, US interest rates are at a 40 year low. Again, there are possibilities of deflation taking place in the USA. And a number of commentators are now uh, worrying about uh, that uh, distinct possibility that the uh, US may end a deflationary stage rather than uh, fighting the bogey of, of inflation. You have a problem with Germany uh, where they need structural change uh, in their labour force, they need structural change in their uh, uh, banking system. Uh, you have the UK where they've only got 1.8 per cent uh, growth rates. So if you look at that, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you see that Australia has done well, that the Howard Costello economic management has been one of responsibility, one of setting the right policy for the benefit of all Australians uh, in the longer term rather than short term political advantage. 
Could I just mention a couple of the, uh, the uh, issues that, that are incorporated in the budget? Uh, one that's not actually in the budget is the GST, and I just make the comment that uh, now the states are receiving some $28 billion, I think the latest figure, uh, sourced to their revenue. A couple of the states are now ahead of the allocation that they would be receiving from the Commonwealth. This is a growth, uh, growth tax. Uh, the premiers are reluctant to acknowledge the political courage of the Commonwealth in instituting this, uh, this uh, tax. I notice that even Premier Kennett, Premier Beattie and others were never critical of the fact that they would be receiving the GST, but they were happy to go on the bandwagon of the ALP in the opposition to uh, the GST. I notice there's no rollback. The GST is here and there's no rollback from the Shadow Minister of the Table. Even she's not going to roll back the GST if she ever gets to government. And, uh, so that then we don't hear much, uh, much uh, policy alternative from those opposite about the GST. Every other country around the world has got a similar tax and of course the, those opposite have got many big spending proposals but they haven't got any genuine revenue, revenue uh, proposals to seek uh, the revenue for their big spending uh, operations. So I put it on the record, the courage of uh, Treasurer Peter Costello in the detailed proposals put to the Australian people and that, that they are very important policy <coughs> which will be benefit to the states in the longer term. And I do predict a better relationships between the Commonwealth and the states because they genuinely now have a growth tax, they have revenue that comes their way and they will not be resorting to some of those other minor taxes which have been so much an irritant to the uh, population of those states. Mr Deputy Speaker, I just move on to the, the drought. Uh, you and myself and other rural members have been uh, greatly concerned about the drought as it impacts on all rural Australians. Uh, there has been a lot of comment about exceptional circumstances and again I say to the states you are very quick to blame the Commonwealth about uh, the arrangements of drought aid and the criteria for exceptional circumstances. The Commonwealth is providing uh, some 740 million over the total drought package. There has been some debate about this but the Commonwealth have come good with the money and the states have spent most of their time complaining, not contributing to the drought effort, and I condemn them for their attitude and for their lack of performance. The lack of water throughout the eastern states is a major worry, and it would be my hope that we do get a good general rain before the, before the winter sets in. In terms of the health, could I just make the comment that the, this budget provides a $42 billion health agreement for the states for the 2003-04-2007 five-year agreement. It's a 70 per cent real growth rate and uh, the argument that the states should uh, contribute in similar terms I think is quite valid and sensible. And uh, that uh, should be agreed to by the states rather than having this argument uh, at election times how they're going to be better health uh, providers than, uh, than uh, their opponents and it is the Commonwealth's problem all the time. In terms of the uh, the PBS scheme, could I again uh, support the Treasurer's comments last year that this, uh, pro this scheme will be unsustainable, now $5.7 billion, moving to $7 billion in the year 2006 and 7, unless there are a considerable number of co-payments. Uh, very small though they are, they do help to contain the scheme and that uh, this very important scheme for all Australian, Australians, especially older Australians, I think should be maintained at a more sensible economic level. The 30 per cent private health insurance, again a matter for some debate by those opposite. They won't quite say, Mr Deputy Speaker, whether they're going to move, take it away, but they're looking at the $2, million, $2 billion that uh, has been contributed by this government to individual private uh, health insurance uh, holders. Uh, that meant that the, there were only 30 per cent in the private health funds in January 1999. There are now 44 per cent in December 2002. This helps to sustain the system and even Senator Richardson said that uh, we needed a private health system to ensure the long-term possibilities of, uh, uh, of uh, health in Australia, that there are an alternative uh, by, the, by the provision of private health insurance and it ensures that there will be more funds in the longer term injected into the total health system. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to refer to some of the policy debates that are incorporated in uh, budget paper number four 
and a speech given by Mr Ken Henry, Parliament, uh, Treasury Secretary to the Australian Business uh, Economic Society on May the 30th. And I'll quote from that because it does uh, cover the, the issues on budget paper number four. And he talks about in that paper about the long-term uh, wealth production in Australia and the importance of population, uh, the population of working age. He talks about the participation, that's the number of hours worked by those uh, uh, participants in the workforce and the productivity, that is the GDP per hour. Now, there's a fair bit of discussion about those matters in terms of the, the, uh, uh, what's uh, involved uh, and what, how those parameters make Australia a, a better and wealthier nation. Now, those uh, matters are canvassed quite extensively in budget paper number four. And fundamentally, one of the key tenets of that is the, the, available, the importance of Australia maintaining its population both in sheer numbers and in terms of spread of age groups. As you would be aware, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, there is a problem in Japan with, a, uh, with an ageing population that's hit uh, Japan before it will hit Australia. And uh, this trend is something that we need to be concerned about. And uh, Mr Henry makes the comment in his uh, paper that uh, in America this will not be such a major difficulty. And he quotes uh, from a, an Economist magazine in, in recent, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, the Economist magazine noted in a recent essay on Australia's demographic e exceptionalism. And what he's saying in this quote is that America has a breadth of uh, population and uh, working population and it will be a driver for economic, uh, economic uh, activity. And the quote is along this lines. Anyone who assumes the United States is now at its zenith of economic or political power is making a big mistake. There are plenty of other ways in which America could weaken itself economically or politically, but demographically will offer a fine basis for future growth and strength. So there we have it that uh, in America they have not only their fundamental strength now, but they have the basis uh, because of their range of population, their birth rate and diversity that they will continue to be a nation of strength. And then in the budget paper number four, a number of these policy options which I personally have been interested in over the years in this parliament, which uh, the Howard government have adopted and been the underpinning basis of our increasing wealth here in Australia. And in the, in the budget report uh, number four, the OECD research uh, into the linkages between policy settings, participation and uh, productivity performance. Now this is what the OECD had to say, and I'll just note them very quickly. Anti-competitive market uh, regulation worsens labour market performance. The second one, labour market regulation affects product market performance. The third one, job security cannot be bought with anti-competitive product market regulation. And the fourth one, product market deregulation does not lead to permanent increases in earnings inequality. Now that's, uh, that's coming out of the OECD. That's uh, a little bit of jargon. But uh, then the budget statement, and Mr Henry goes on to, in his speech to uh, note some of the important policy settings that have taken place here in Australia. Uh, first policy is uh, directed at improving education and training. So there we have it, the first one. So that the higher education uh, reforms that uh, Minister Brendan Nelson has brought forward are very much in line with international best practice. Secondly, uh, policies to enhance labour, uh, labour market flexibility, permitting the evolution of markets that facilitate the deployment of new, t new technologies, generate engagement of older workers and the upgrading of schools. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a position there where in 1996 the Industrial Relations uh, uh, Acts were changed and that brought about flexibility on the waterfront and flexibility through the whole Australian workforce. Third, uh, taxation policies that rec recognise disincentive effects of high marginal rates, uh, developing a tax system that encourages participation rather than early retirement. So there we have it again that uh, taxation rates need to be reduced, especially in marginal tax. Fourth, health and welfare policies, including the interaction of tax and social security systems that encourage labour market participation. So again, we need to get the mix between uh, 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 welfare, those going on to welfare, and certainly the McClure report uh, addressed those issues. And fifthly, a pro-competition reform agenda encompassing the areas of energy, water, transport. Um, 
And so I just uh, note that uh, Mr. Graham Samuel, who's done a remarkable job in this area, is now been appointed to the uh, to Dr Fells's position, and I uh, put on the record the remarkable contribution that Graeme Samuel made in, in competition uh, policy. So that the final comment that Mr Henry says is that the, the important thing is the uh, demographic uh, change will be a key driver of economic uh, activity, and of course that intergeneration report that was tabled last year highlighted this uh, problem facing Australia in the future. I commend the budget, I commend the Treasurer, I commend the Prime Minister for a most responsible document and a forward-thinking policy setting. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the Honourable Member for Calair. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to concentrate this reply to the budget on the higher education reforms. The Labor platform in 1973 could afford to say that all education should be free. But by introducing HECS, the Hawke government recognised that, in fact, free education was subsidising the better off. Professor Bruce Chapman, the architect of HECS, says frankly that free tertiary education was regressive and unfair. He says that before HECS there was a clear relationship between enrolment in higher education and measures of family wealth. When I entered tertiary education in 1964, 20 to 25% of students paid fees but the vast majority had teachers' uh, college or Commonwealth scholarships. However, by the early 1980s, with more and more seeking university education, a funding crisis was looming. The Hawke government introduced the Higher Education Contribution Scheme in uh, 1989 with an $1,800 fee for all undergraduates across all courses. In 1996, the cost of a HEX education increased by 20 per cent as the coalition government introduced a three-tier fee structure based not only on the cost of the course but the income expectations from high HEX courses like law. The HEX scheme is supposed to be a balance between the private benefit that accrues to university graduates and the public benefit of training doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, scientists and some might say unfortunately lawyers. Until the change is introduced in this budget, the evidence from Professor Bruce Chapman shows HEX has had no or neg uh, negligible impact on the demand for higher education or access by the poor. I agree. At the moment, the balance between student contribution and taxpayer contribution is just about right. The affordability is just about right. The need for a fair input to pay for the privilege of a university degree and later opportunities that accrue is just about right. With the emergence of a growing user pay policy, there has been a steep and steady decline in federal funding to universities over the past 20 years. The struggle of universities to make ends meet, despite HEX, is stark. There has been a 25 per cent decline in professorial and lecturer salaries since the early 1980s, corresponding with diminished government support. With more and more research skewed to market outcomes, there's been a loss of truly academic study and pursuit of learning. One uni cut out uh, literature, another removed languages, while humanities departments have been downgraded or gutted. With salaries 75 per cent of university costs, government operating grants by 2001 were half a billion dollars behind the growth in average earnings. Staff-student ratios increased dramatically over the past decade. Enter the Nelson reforms, as manifested in the budget. They came after a thorough consultation process for which the minister must be uh, commended. The big universities were always likely to be the winners in this reform. Based in the capital cities, close to the pool of prospective students and the high incomes of full fee-paying locals or foreign students. The regional universities like Charles Sturt, Bathurst, Wagga and Albury were the ones likely to miss out. By dint of their distance from their student pool and the comparative advantage of size and prestige embodied in the big eight campuses, who had been established on the back of uh, so much uh, public uh, funding over the many years. By allowing universities to increase their HEX charges by 30 per cent, the government, I believe, is laying the groundwork for a two-tier university system. But it can be rectified. 
Universities say they won't be automatically increasing fees, and in CSU's case, after discussing it with them, I can understand and hope their wish to constrain fees in the interests of students' socio-economic profile uh, will be um, able to be met. But one would have to be a supreme optimist to believe there won't be an inexorable percent by percent increase in fees over the next five to ten years, heading towards that 30 per cent. It's a bit like the Medicare reforms we're seeing. Some universities, recognising their dominance in uh, high demand courses, won't worry about the niceties of gradual increases. Universities will apply a surcharge equal to what the market will bear. The law school at Melbourne University or Vet Science at Sydney could, if they choose, push their charge to the maximum rate overnight, such as the demand for their degrees. Indeed, recognising this inevitability, the Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University, Alan Gilbert, this morning is um, not only calling for a lift in the threshold at which students repay their hex to average uh, earnings, but an increase in the loans cap and 15,000 more Commonwealth scholarships. He also believes there needs to be a variation in hex fees within a course for poorer students. Well, I'd suggest more liberal guidelines for independent youth allowance would be a greater help than lower repayments after a degree and a salary is obtained. Doing the uh, uni study and surviving for a student is the greatest financial challenge particularly for students from relatively poorer rural communities who have to go away to study. Now, while it's good to see Melbourne's Vice-Chancellor talking about equity issues in this package, this system will allow high-status sandstone universities to pay higher salaries and attract better staff. Now, that may all be very well, but I cannot see any uh, outcome other than a two-tier system developing and I'd suggest the regional loadings on offer for places like Charles Sturt are just not enough, and this area of the package needs serious review, with uh, at least a 10 per cent loading needed instead of the current 2.5 to uh, 5 per cent on offer. Despite a new grant scheme, the government is largely transferring the problem of indexing grants from the Commonwealth to the student. And let's not forget, for all the talk about $6 billion injection of government money into the university sector, when you transfer more of the cost of education to the student, the taxpayer is going to get it back in the long run through the tax system as students repay their hexes and their loans. So really, it's a, uh, it's a clever cost shift, not a long-term investment in the infrastructure, particularly of our tertiary education sector. The doubling of the full fee payer cap from 25 to 50 per cent and the introduction of the loan scheme is designed both to increase revenue for universities and broaden access to lower income background students, but it also increases the number of students thereby dint of capacity to pay rather than pure academic merit. Is this an investment in excellence? The loan scheme might be seen as an improvement in equity of access for those failing to gain hex places and wanting to do degrees in the lower fee range, but there are major problems with the high fee courses. How can a person from a disadvantaged background hope to do law or medicine by accessing a $50,000 loan when the full fee is around the $140,000 mark? Will these loans be enlarged or extended and at what ultimate cost to the repayer? It seems to me the loan scheme for this uh, classification of student, the, uh, the poorer ones seeking a, a higher income out, uh, outcome, is a Clayton's option from, for those from low income backgrounds uh, trying to access the more expensive degrees and able to get a hex place. They're faced with the full fee, less the loan. How do they fund around $94,000, which is the difference? They simply won't be able to afford it, and those who are able to pay under the current circumstances can also get a loan, it seems. The scheme is, um, seems to me to be a handy source of windfall funding for the well-off, but offering little or no advantage to the poorer to afford a meal ticket to a high-paid career. Now, while poorer students may be able to lower their income sites and do an arts degree covered by a loan, it looks like the high-paying careers will be reserved in Maine for the higher-paying students from the affluent backgrounds, apart, of course, from those recipients of hex places. 
And the question remains, why are we allowing universities to trade off half their places to full fee payers, whether they pay for it up front or by loan? Now, the simple answer is the system needs the bucks. But is it fair and equitable in the best long-term interests of this nation? There is certainly more money in the system at the end of the day, but are the right people in the classes? Have we maximised our intellectual and creative capital? I think not. Do we risk a tick-and-flick environment, such as noted economist Clive Hamilton reports, where 11 out of 13 students receive first-class honours in economics at one campus, when you'd be lucky to find one student deserving enough 20 years ago? The Nelson package is offered a carrot of $404 million in additional Commonwealth course contributions from 2005, perhaps in recognition of the half a billion dollar funding black hole that has developed since 1995. However, in uh, typical style, it is tied to the provision that a university must adhere to the new national government's protocols and comply with Commonwealth workplace relations policy including the specification that enterprise agreements between staff and the university don't preclude Australian workplace agreements, individual agreements between employer and employee determining wages and conditions. The National Tertiary Education Union said in March any measures to force or even encourage AWAs will be strongly opposed. Now, it's, it seems to me, having spoken with uh, people in the sector, that it's an unnecessary, uh, unnecessary battle that common law contracts could avoid. It seems more like it's the Abbott ideological injection into the education reform process. Yet I'm informed by what I believe are objective university um, contacts that an AWA is an unwieldy instrument, particularly, for example, where a revision of the agreement is sought by either party in contrast to what can be achieved through the common law contract route. I believe this package is going to need adjustments along the lines I've outlined if it's to be acceptable to the universities, the students, the families and the taxpaying public. While some countries still do place a high value on universal free university education, I think we have other funding crises and therefore priorities in this country, like TAFE, our public school system and health care. These changes, extreme as they've been painted in some quarters, will in fact mean students pay only about a third of the cost of their education. I believe there must be a balance between user pays and public pays in education, but I believe this package shifts the pendulum too far to the user, with the major beneficiaries, the sandstone unis and the well-off. As a sign of true commitment to our education future, the government and indeed the alternative one, should build a system of taxation allowances into its policy to encourage and reward long-term savings by families for their children's education. Public funding for higher education in this country accounts for just 0.6 per cent of GDP. That's down from 0.9 per cent in 1996, and the budget papers show it will actually fall to 0.5 per cent in 2004-05. Only three uh, OECD countries are behind us in terms of public spending on higher education. What's the point of having one Australian university in the world's top 100, whatever that means, if many of the other 36, particularly regional universities, might well be struggling to attract top teachers and top students while locked into a discount price degree competition with other smaller universities? That is the danger, or one of them, in this package, not the underlying fund generation process but the incentives within it that favour the large over the small and the failure to properly recognise the disadvantage of rural campuses and their need for significantly more capital funding. Mr Deputy Speaker, the big loser in tertiary education in this budget is TAFE. There is no recognition by way of significantly increased funding for the sector that more and more is taking on the job of training young Australians. There has been an increase of 68.5 per cent in the number of vocation education and training students since 1992. There are half a million TAFE students in New South Wales alone, with 36,000 at the Western Institute based in Orange. With a far greater proportion of students attending TAFE than university, TAFE receives about one-third of the funding received by universities per equivalent full-time student. 
At the very least, the government, when negotiating the new ANTA agreement with the states, should ensure the 16 per cent cut in funds to TAFE during its period of 20 per cent growth over the past five years is restored and that pre-apprenticeship training is reintroduced. And if the um, argument is used that the GST uh, revenues should be used to um, fill in those gaps, well, let's uh, have the explanation why and let's have the state step up to the mark to uh, ensure that that uh, growth gap and uh, those pre-apprenticeship training options are reintroduced in a spirit of uh, um, federation cooperation. It's no good talking of a synergy between high school, TAFE and university if these uh, two remain poor cousins and remain grossly underfunded. Before leaving education, let me comment on anomalies in the scholarship system. While Commonwealth learning, education, cost and accommodation scholarships are welcome, there's a real problem in their treatment as income. They're regarded as income for independent youth allowance but are not regarded as income for the purposes of establishing independent status to qualify for youth allowance. That situation is a nonsense and should be attended to. As well, the budget papers acknowledge the significant burden for parents of accommodation charges and point out around 10,000 students from rural and isolated areas, many from low socio-economic backgrounds, move away from home each year for higher education. Now, while welcome, 1,500 scholarships won't go far to overcome the enormous disadvantages rural students face compared with those living at home uh, in the city. While it's possible to amend this education package to make it fairer for rural campuses in particular, I don't see any salvation for Medicare under the proposed reforms planned in this budget. The carrot of almost a billion dollars worth of incentives to encourage bulk billing of the poorest and concession card holders is really a slush fund to dismantle Medicare as we know it. The Productivity Commission says $50 is a reasonable charge for a GP consultation. Instead of subsidising private health cover and offering tax cuts to the well-off, this largesse could be used to encourage bulk billing across the board. Everywhere I've gone in, the, uh, in my electorate in recent weeks, people ask me why the government or the opposition don't suggest an increase in the Medicare levy. We want universal health cover for the most basic of health services, a visit to the doctor, so we need to find the resources to pay for it. That's not me speaking, that's what people are saying to me. They don't believe people on 30,000 to 50,000 in particular, many single income families with two or three or more kids should now be faced with the certainty of a $25 upfront fee for seeing a doctor, whether it happens tomorrow or the week after next. They know their GP isn't ripping them off. They know some specialists are, but they know if the Medicare rebate offered to doctors was increased to about $33, seems to be a, a, a fee that both doctors and, and the public recognise when they stop and think about it, then doctors could afford to bulk bill, wouldn't be forced to seek the full 25 differential between the current rebate and the Productivity Commission's $50 figure. And quite frankly, the Labor Party's suggestion of three bucks has been uh, treated with uh, near uh, contempt out there, as far as I can see. Families earning this 30000 to 50000 range stand to gain just $208 from tax breaks, but this will be eaten up by eight family visits to the doctor. These changes will cost shift more and more medical care from the Commonwealth to the states as those lower-income families seek assistance at state hospitals. This is user pay ideology gone mad. People will pay with their health. And like the mean-minded abolition of dental health funding, the system will somewhere have to carry the cost of a sicker society somewhere down the track. I've conducted my own informal survey of doctors in my electorate on the Medicare changes. The overwhelming majority want a public inquiry into Medicare. Only two of the doctors believe the incentives on offer would help cover the costs of bulk billing. Most see it as a transfer of administration from Medicare offices straight to the doctor's surgery. Dr Michael Gearan from Molong says it will cost him twice as much a year to administer the changes than he'll receive for the privilege of helping to run Medicare. With 60% of his patients concession card holders, he'll be forced to opt into this scheme. He'll have no choice. He also offers bulk billing to some farmers, farm workers, others affected by the drought, for instance. 
What happens to them now, he asks. They'll have to cop the extra $15 now and probably $20 to $25 down the track. Dr Guerin says it's good to see the budget incentives to try and attract doctors to the bush, but why would they come to Molong when they can earn a far more comfortable life in the city? Three quarters of those surveyed said they expect low and middle income earners to now seek basic health care and a hospital. Only one doctor seemed to back the philosophy that I believe is behind the government's long-term agenda. Bulk billing and the Medicare system, he says, should be done away with in its entirety. I'll reserve my other comments on the other portfolios until the uh, uh, committee discussion stages, but uh, at, those, uh, at that point um, I'll, um, uh, I'll wind up and uh, thank you for listening. The question is, are the words proposed for me to stand part of the question? I call the honourable member for Aston. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia's economy is in good shape and continues to outperform other like nations throughout the world. According to the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, Australia's armour-plated economy is leading the world and is better equipped than ever to withstand financial crisis at home or abroad. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me start by taking the House back 10 years ago to the fiscal year 1993-94. In 1993-94, under the then Hawke government, Australia recorded the following key economic conditions for our country. The budget was in deficit in the order of $17.1 billion. Unemployment was at a rate of 10.2 per cent. Government debt was a staggering $70.2 billion, or 15.7 per cent of GDP, and home loan interest rates were above 9 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, now let me move forward to this fiscal year and contrast those days with the current performance of Australia's economy after just seven years under the coalition government. The budget is in surplus in the order of $2.2 billion. Unemployment is low and forecast to average at 6 per cent. Government debt has fallen drastically and has been reduced by $63 billion to $33 billion, representing around 4 per cent of GDP, one of the lowest levels of general government debt in the OECD. And home loan interest rates are around 6 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget is about protecting securing and building Australia's future by taking responsible action. In the past year, Australia has had to deal with unexpected pressures like the Bali atrocity, the war in Iraq, the worst drought on record and the unstable world economic environment. But despite these pressures, the Coalition has been able to deliver in this budget a responsible plan that further strengthens certainty and stability for families not only in my electorate of Aston, but indeed across all of Australia. This plan not only protects and secures Australia in the immediate future, but just as importantly, it provides the stability and certainty needed to build Australia in the long term. The coalition is committed to keeping Australia's economy strong. And keeping that economy strong is good news for Australian families and small business who benefit from jobs growth and lower interest rates and the security of a stable economic future. Most developed economies of the world are experiencing economic downturns and are, in fact, deep in deficit. In this very difficult international environment, the Australian economy has shown remarkable resilience. Our economy has continued to grow solidly, outperforming most other developed economies. Investments have surged employment has grown strongly and inflation has remained moderate. Looking forward, despite continuing global economic weakness, the prospects for the Australian economy remain solid. Economic growth in the coming budgetary year is forecast to be at three and a quarter per cent. The unemployment rate is expected to remain steady and inflation is expected to be within the target band. Mr Deputy Speaker, this hasn't come about by accident. It's come about by hard work and taking the tough decisions that have been necessary. And the dividend for Australians is clear. 
Good economic management by the coalition has allowed for responsible extra spending on Medicare, universities and defence, as well as income tax cuts. In contrast to world trends, the budget remains in surplus, taking pressure off interest rates and keeping them low. This budget, in fact, represents the government's sixth surplus. Now, let me talk about taxation. All Australians have contributed to our strong economy, and now all taxpaying Australians will receive personal income tax cuts. From 1 July, Australian taxpayers are going to share in personal income tax cuts worth $10.7 billion over the next four years. These tax cuts reflect the coalition's belief that whenever it can responsibly cut taxes and return money to Australian families, it should do so. The government has a strong belief that after providing for the important things like defence, health, education, support for those who need it most and paying back debt, any money left over in the budget should be returned to the Australian people. After all, it is rightly theirs. In regard to health, the coalition is committed to improving access for all Australians to quality health care and preserving Medicare. This year, the government expects to spend more than $30 billion on health care, which represents approximately one-fifth of total government spending. In the coming financial year, the government will have increased health spending by around 65 per cent since the coalition came to office—65 per cent. The government remains committed to ensuring Australians have choice in their health care. The government's 30 per cent private health insurance rebate and lifetime health cover have helped increase private health insurance coverage to 44 per cent in December 2002. Over the next five years, the federal government will provide the states and territories with up to $42 billion to support the provision of free public hospital services. This represents a 17 per cent real increase in federal funding. But it is important that the onus on growing funding for hospitals is shared. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the state and territory share, a total funding, share of total funding has fallen from 47.2 per cent in 97-98 to 43.4 per cent in 2000-2001, while in contrast the Commonwealth share has in fact risen from 45.2 per cent to 48.1 per cent over exactly the same period. The government's a fairer Medicare package and investment of $916.7 million protects the rights of all of Australians to affordable health care. This budget strengthens Medicare by further integrating prevention, health promotion and disease management within the health system, making prevention a fundamental part of Medicare. These measures bring the government's total commitment to Medicare and to tough on drugs strategies in particular, talking about tough on drugs, to over $1 billion for this very important area alone. Let me now talk about education. Improving higher education is important to the future of this country. Mr Deputy Speaker, no Australian university has ever been listed in the world's top 100 universities. Australian universities need to be competitive, not only here in Australia, but in the global community. They need to offer a world-class education for the future of our country's youth. The government has committed to additional funding and structural reform, which is necessary for building our universities and Australia's future. Education creates opportunities for all Australians to improve their standard of living. The government will introduce wide-ranging reforms to ensure the higher education system provides greater access to a high quality of education for all Australians. The government will invest an additional $1.5 billion in the system over the next four years to make this a reality. The features of the government's higher education reforms are many, but they include $775 million increase over three years from 2005 in base funding for universities, directly benefiting around 400,000 students, $211 million from 2006 in further incentives to strengthen the quality of teaching and encourage diversity in the education system. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, people's education sets the foundation for their participation in the community and assists them in reaching their goals and aspirations. Let me now turn to the area of defence. Our nation's security is a key priority of the coalition. The government has provided additional funds to further improve the Australian Defence Force's capacity to protect Australia and, indeed, to protect our national interests. Funding has been committed to maintain critical defence equipment, support Australia's objectives in the war against terrorism, enhance our domestic security capability and boost personnel numbers. In this budget, the government has increased spending on defence by $2.1 billion over the five years from the current financial year to enhance the protection afforded to Australia and its interests at both home and indeed abroad. This increase includes many new elements, but for example, an extra $156 million over four years to establish a new Special Operations Command that will enhance Australia's ability to respond to terrorist threats and boost Special Forces personnel by about 330 people. This budget increase, increasingly is meeting the needs of the Australian Defence Force in their new strategic challenges and increasing their operational tempo. And it reflects the government's determination to do its job of ensuring the safety of our troops by making sure they are capable and well equipped to respond to new global security threats. Let me now, Mr Deputy Speaker, talk about national security. Safeguarding our communities from terrorist threats, as you know, is a top priority for the government. That's why we are allocating significant new funding to domestic security initiatives to protect critical infrastructure and enhance our intelligence and protective security services. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11 and the Bali bombings, the government provided an additional funding of $1.4 billion over five years to upgrade security within Australia. This includes, included enhancements to Australia's aviation security arrangements, as well as new funding for defence, defence intelligence, intelligence and law enforcement agencies. And the budget builds on this commitment by implementing the government's A Safer Australia package of $411 million over five years. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would, in talking about the budget, now like to move to one final aspect of the budget, an aspect that is particularly relevant to my electorate. In this budget, the federal government has reaffirmed its total commitment of $445 million to the construction of the Scoresby Freeway, the most vital infrastructure project in Aston and the outer east of Melbourne. This commitment of $445 million consists of money already allocated plus $420 million over the next five years. It stands in stark contrast to the Victorian government, which, in its most recent budget only weeks ago, again failed to provide any funding for the Scoresby Freeway. I've been concerned for some time about the Victorian government's lack of commitment to the Scoresby Freeway, identified through ongoing delays that I've highlighted in this House. My deepest fears have come to fruition with the Victorian government's <coughs> appalling backflip over funding for the Scoresby Freeway and their decision to impose tolls on all vehicles. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is in spite of promising the people of Victoria at the last state election that they would not impose tolls. I join with the community in rejecting the imposition of tolls on the Scoresby. The Victorian government's attempt to divert funding from the Scoresby Freeway shortchanges not just the local community but all people that live in the outer east and southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. I understand the importance of the Scoresby Freeway project to the people of Aston, and we need it built now. That's why I've been working as hard as I can to get this decision reversed. Residents have spoken to me about their dismay at the Labor Victorian government's decision. What is disappointing is that the Scoresby Freeway did not even show or, or make an appearance in the recent Victorian state budget. And as I said, this contrasts remarkably with the federal budget, which again identified the full funding commitment of $445 million. We in the Scoresby Corridor have already endured a long journey on the road to development of the Scoresby Freeway. Sadly, it appears that we still have some way to go, or at least if the Victorian government have their way. 
Mr Speaker, budgets are important, but they are important not in themselves, but because they enable the government to deliver practical measures as part of its agenda of national priorities. Late last year, the Prime Minister outlined the government's key whole of government strategic priorities as we move forward in this term. In the area of national security and defence, this budget demonstrates the government's commitment to confronting the, th the threats of rising international terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. To support Australian families to balance, better balance their work and home life, this budget takes pressure off the family budget by cutting income taxes for every Australian taxpayer. Embracing the challenges of an ageing population, the government is continuing to deliver quality assistance for older Australians by supporting increased health and ageing services, boosting Medicare and introducing tax cuts. The government places a high value on science and innovation and continues its investment in this budget through measures such as increased funding for the CSIRO. This funding will support research and advance new ideas and technology. This budget invests a record $15.8 billion in education, science and training as part of the government's efforts to provide Australia with a world-class education sector, which will help build Australia's strong economic and social future. The government's recognition of the importance of restoring, protecting and sustainably managing our unique environment and heritage is also demonstrated in this budget through initiatives such as the Enviro Fund and the Sustainable Cities Package. As part of the government's energy reforms, this budget introduces new fuel excise arrangements that will promote long-term sustainability. Additional incentives will encourage further reduction and use of cleaner fuels. With drought widespread in the, and in the aftermath of devastating bushfires, the government has strengthened its commitment to the growth and prosperity of, Australia, of Australia's rural and regional areas through measures like increased access to GP services. And finally, this budget provides additional funding to improve Australia's road system. In short, Mr Speaker, this budget is part of the government's work in getting on with the job and delivering practical and responsible government in our national interests for the benefit of all Australians. Mr Speaker, this budget, indeed, as the Treasurer identified in his budget speech, is a further step on the journey to secure Australia's future. That future for Australia is looking much better since coalition came to government in 1996. Order. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour, and I have the impression that the member for Aston has concluded his remarks. Thank the member for Aston. Um, questions without. Notice, are there any questions? The member for Fraser. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer, Mr. Speaker, and I refer to the admission by the Secretary of the Finance Department in Senate estimates yesterday that the budget papers have overvalued Telstra by about $3 billion and that as a result the Department will publish corrected figures. Was the Treasurer aware of this massive overstatement of Telstra's value when he presented the budget two weeks ago? Treasurer, isn't it the case that Section 296 of the Corporations Act says a company's financial report must comply with relevant accounting standards and that breach of this provision carries a penalty of up to five years jail or a $100,000 fine or a civil penalty of $200,000? Isn't it then the case that if the same principle of accurate disclosure was applied to the Treasurer, his failure to comply with the relevant accounting standards could expose him to a potential penalty. The Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, um, the uh, the answer to the honourable member's question, of course, is uh, that uh, it's been fully explained by Senator Minchin in Senate estimates that in a statement of net worth <coughs> under AS31. Bratton. Telstra can be valued at uh, market uh, price, at historical cost, with uh, less, absolutely. Uh, with um, uh, platforms uh, can be valued at cost. Mr. Speaker, that puts a value on platforms at $31.5 billion and showed a net worth under uh, AAS31 of minus 49 uh, billion odd 
in 2002-2003. Uh, the government, in addition to doing net worth on a AAS31 basis, also does it on a GFS basis. On a GFS basis, uh, Mr. Speaker, the valuation of Telstra uh, would be at market value, with defence platforms valued at zero. Uh, that produces um, an estimate of net worth in 2002-2003 of minus 47 billion odd. Both of these, Mr. Speaker, of course, are huge estimations. Uh, for example, valuing the whole of Australia's defence platforms at zero. Uh, that is the Collins class submarines, frigates, uh, F 111s, Hornets at zero, uh, Mr. Speaker, is, uh, is obviously very wide of their actual value. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, in relation to uh, much of the Commonwealth land holding, uh, that is not valued at true market uh, rent. We don't attempt to value defence land such as North Head or South Head at full market value, uh, or indeed the uh, buildings surrounding. Parliament House. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, these are very, very general estimations, uh, and they vary according to the particular values that one puts on them. Uh, Senator Minchin has released uh, a different valuation, a 90-day valuation in relation to GFS standard this afternoon, which does it on an additional basis. So that, Mr. Speaker, it can be done on every single basis you like: AAS31, GFS. GFS on 90-day market average, but these are still estimations, Mr. Speaker. The important, point, the important point is that this does not affect the budget, it does not affect the cash position, it does not affect the fiscal position, it does not affect the operating position. This is a statement, Mr. Speaker, in relation to net worth, which the Commonwealth has been putting in budget papers only since 1999-2000. These are very general estimates, and the government will be reporting on all of the different bases, Mr Speaker, so that they're there for the historic record, but it makes no difference whatsoever to the underlying budget position as reported in the budget on last Tuesday night uh, fortnight. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Blair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, would the Prime Minister inform the House of the advice available to the government about when Australia first became a terrorist target for Al Qaeda. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the member for Blair for what is a very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that Australia has been an Al Qaeda target since at least November of 2001. We know this because on the 3rd of November 2001. Osama bin Laden first made specific reference to Australia when he criticised Australian troops in East Timor who were there under UN auspices as a, quote, crusader force. Bin Laden specifically mentioned Australia on two subsequent occasions, most recently following the Bali attacks. But a recent statement on the 21st of May by bin Laden's spiritual mentor and deputy Al Sawari confirmed that Australia remains a terrorist target. But I can now inform the House, Mr Speaker, that new information has come to light very recently, indicating that Al-Qaeda explored possible targets in Australia in 2000 or 2001. These reports indicate that Al-Qaeda's interest in mounting attacks in Australia actually predated the 11th of September 2001 attacks in New York and Washington. Al Qaeda's targeting of Australia does not derive from our military involvement in Afghanistan or Iraq. Rather, Al Qaeda's interest in attacking Australia derives from the fact that we are a Western nation with Western values that are abhorrent to the militant theology which is at the heart of Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda has a transparent self interest in trying to attract support for its terrorist cause by seeking to present its inhumane attacks as a response to specific events such as East Timor, Afghanistan, and Iraq. This new information, Mr. Speaker, of course, relates to past planning and past events. And I want to reassure the House that it has not resulted 
in a change to current threat levels either in Australia or for Australian interests abroad. No specific or other intelligence has been received indicating any current plan for an attack in Australia by al-Qaeda or any other group that might warrant a change in the assessed terrorist threat level within our country. The government remains committed to do everything possible to protect the safety of Australians from terrorism. And if any more information were to come to light which caused the government to change the assessed terrorism threat to Australia, the public will be advised without delay. Mr Speaker, finally, can I inform the House that at my request the Leader of the Opposition was specifically briefed on this new information on 26 May by the Director General of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. Yeah, yeah. for Fraser. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Isn't it the case that whatever measure is used, GFS market value, AAS31, none of these valuations would justify the $3 billion increase in Telstra's value shown in your budget? Treasurer? Uh, no, it's not the case, because as I've just explained, under AAS31, <coughs> Telstra is valued at historic costs. So it's not the case at all, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, Fraser has asked his question. Uh, as, I've, I've uh, as I've previously, uh, as I've previously uh, indicated, uh, Mr. Speaker, the statement of net worth does not affect the budget year, the underlying cash surplus, the headline cash surplus, the operating statement, the fiscal surplus, uh, or any of those other matters. It is a, an attempt, Mr Speaker, to try and get to the net worth of the Commonwealth, which the Commonwealth has variously estimated under different measures, could be a negative $46 billion or negative $50 billion, depending on the kind of price that you want to put on defence platforms. Uh, but I will say this, Mr Speaker, it is true, it is absolutely true that the value of the, I think it's six and a half billion shares that the Commonwealth holds in Telstra have declined. Absolutely true. Mr Speaker, if the Senate had passed the government's legislation and the government had sold those at the time of T2, yeah. the Commonwealth would have received around about $29 billion more than they are worth today. That was, that was a really good decision. So, I don't know what point the Australian Labor Party is trying to make here. It is true that the Australian Labor Party. Oh, no, the Treasurer has the call. This much is true that the Australian Tra Labor Party, by its efforts in defeating the authorisation for the government to put uh, equity of Telstra on the market, Member for has Fraser. presided over. A $29 billion dollar loss in net worth, Mr. Speaker. So I don't know if the Australian Labor Party considers that a great success. The government has, in fact, marked down its valuation of Telstra shares, and, Mr. Speaker, that is the uh, that is the effect of having those $6.5 billion shares at the kind of market prices that now prevail, rather than the prices that prevailed at the time of T2. Member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer advise the House of the results of the capital expenditure publication released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics this morning? What is the outlook for business investment in Australia? Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Sturt for his question, uh, and I can inform the House that uh, total new capital expenditure in the March quarter whilst showing a 5.3 per cent decline, showed that over the course of the year capital expenditure had risen by 18.2 per cent. Now, Mr Speaker, the reason for the decline in the March quarter is it was coming off uh, an artificially high December quarter, which had increased by 13.7 per cent, led particularly by the importation by Qantas of civil aircraft of around $1.7 billion. So, Mr Speaker, you had an abnormally high builder in the December quarter, you have a correction in March. But once you take those lumpy figures out, over the course of the year, capital expenditure rose by 18.2 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, in addition to that, we had released today the sixth estimate 
for capital spending in 2002-03, which was 16.7 per cent stronger than the equivalent estimate for 2001-2002. So, Mr. Speaker, again, the intention for the whole of this year is a very large rise on the outcome for the previous year. What this shows, Mr. Speaker, is there is very strong capital expenditure going on in the Australian economy. Uh, in part, Mr. Speaker, this is reflected uh, in today's trade figures, uh, which shows that uh, imports were up, uh, being much higher in April uh, than previous month, uh, whilst exports were down. No doubt the trade minister will have something to say about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but the uh, international trade on goods and services for the month of April, which were already released today, shows Mr Speaker a story of a strong domestic Australian economy notwithstanding a very weak international economy. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, in addition of course drought affects uh, some of Australia's exports particularly in the rural area. But if we come back to capital expenditure Mr Speaker as I was saying yesterday confirming the construction work done figures uh, capital expenditure has been very strong in the course of this year uh, both in construction uh, and in equipment. Uh, this is continuing to drive a strong underlying Australian economy. It is supported by low interest rates. It is, in addition, supported by the fact that the government has taken taxes off inputs and, as I said yesterday, in the residential sector, supported by a strong first home owners scheme, which has given young Australians a chance to get uh, a home. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Sturt for his question, uh, and I can inform him that today's figures confirm strong underlying capital expenditure going on in the Australian economy. The Honourable Member for Rankin. My question is to the Minister for Trade. Can the Minister confirm that today's $3.1 billion trade deficit is the worst in Australia's history, is the 17th trade deficit in a row, makes a deficit of $17 billion over the last 12 months, is the worst 12-month export slump in our history, and will add to Australia's record current account deficit and record $350 billion foreign debt. How does the minister explain the 60 per cent slump in the growth of our exports of high-valued manufactured goods and the grim reality that Australia is losing market share in our major export markets? Does the minister stand by his statement that Australia's trade deficits are no cause for concern? Is that what you said? The Minister for Trade. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think the, uh, the honourable member for Order. his question for trade uh, has the call. From, the, from the outset, uh, I also should, also should uh, indicate to the House that um, uh, when we came to office in 1996, there were $99 billion worth of exports of goods and services, and that's increased by 50 per cent over those years we've been in office to $151 billion worth Order. of exports of goods and services out of Australia. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, and if the Australian Labor Party had their way, uh, we wouldn't have achieved those targets because we wouldn't have been able to reform the economy and make it efficient and, and uh, competitive the way we have. But, Mr Speaker, um, today uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, announced the, or released the, uh, the trade figures for, for April, and those trade figures indicate, and as the Treasurer has indicated, uh, it's a result of a, very, of a very strong domestic economy and a very weak global economy. Uh, a very strong domestic the economy member for and a very weak international economy. The, uh, the increase in, uh, in imports reflects the strength of the Australian economy, and I don't think that's disputed at all. Uh, but uh, also, uh, Mr, uh, Mr. Speaker, our exports have been hit by a triple whammy of SARS, drought, and a sluggish world economy. Uh, there's no question about that. And these factors, these factors, uh, yeah, and then we can add the Labor Party. We'll, we'll make it a quadruple whammy. The Labor Party as well, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Minister and, uh, for yeah, it's, it, it, but Mr. Speaker, these factors have combined. They have combined to uh, to deliver a trade deficit of 3.1 billion dollars, and and certainly and certainly not good news. And nobody's saying it's good news. But, but Mr. Speaker, there are good reasons, and we need to be realistic about these reasons. There are good reasons for it, and I've outlined that in terms of the exports, the impact on exports. Uh, we're just starting to realise the impact of SARS throughout the region, where there've been, where there've been the SARS throughout the Batman. region has had a dramatic impact, not just on the tourism industry and visitation to Australia. Seasonally adjusted short-term visitation arrivals for April were the lowest for five years. Remember, remember 
that tourism is our largest export earner. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, some merchandise exports into, uh, into the East Asian region have also declined as a result of the impact of SARS and, and lowering economic activity in the region. And of course, the Labor Party won't recognise the impact of drought. The drought, with, the drought is still with us in Australia. The drought is still with us. It has rained in some parts of Australia. It has rained in some parts of Australia, but the drought is still affecting our export effort as far as uh, the, uh, the rural economy is concerned. And of course, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the sluggish global economy is having a dramatic impact uh, on our markets. Continuing poor performance of our major trading partners has continued uh, to, uh, to fall in non and so our, uh, has contributed to a fall in our non-rural and other goods. And Australia is not alone, Mr. Speaker. Australia is not alone in facing a difficult export environment. Exports from our regional, other regional economies have also been negatively affected. Countries like New Zealand, Singapore and Thailand. But despite the tough times that we are facing, Australia's robust economic fundamentals mean that we are well placed to meet these challenges. And we've got to be prepared to meet these challenges. And I've been saying uh, for the last couple of months that this year, this year in the international exporting environment, is this going to be competitive and it's going to be tough and we need to meet those challenges. But, Mr Speaker, we are able to do that because we've got an economy that has a budget in surplus. We've got an economy that's delivered low unemployment, low interest rates, low inflation and low public sector debt. That means our economy is performing strongly and that, that is reflected in these statistics today. And while our strong economy obviously impacts on our uh, trade performance, this government is not about to pursue the types of policies that we've seen from previous Labor governments in similar circumstances, which killed off both import and export growth and which led to unemployment of over 10 per cent and the highest interest rates this country ever, ever suffered. Member for Wills on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 321, I ask that the minister table the document from which he was quoting. <clears throat> was the minister quoting from a document? My first question is, was the member for Wells resume his seat. The, member, the minister, standing orders provide that I ask the minister two questions. Was the minister quoting from a document? Was the document confidential? The minister has indicated the document is confidential. Member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister, the minister for Kuyong might care to resume his seat? I'm reminded of the point of order raised by the member for Lilly yesterday. During the last answer, there were 15 interjections from my left-hand side. Member for Kuyong. Thank you again, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the minister update the House on recent revelations regarding gross human rights abuse by Saddam Hussein's regime, including recent discoveries of mass grave sites? Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr Speaker, first can I thank the honourable member for Kuyong for his question. Um, Mr Speaker, as the House knows, the um, causus belli for action in Iraq remains as it has always been, and that is the need to eliminate the threat of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. And the release overnight of a CIA DIA report on the discovery of mobile biological weapons laboratories illustrates we're making headway. It the Leader of the Opposition, the Minister has the call. Right. Minister. Mr Speaker, the release overnight of a CIA DIA report on the discovery of mobile biological weapons laboratories illustrates that headway is being made in uncovering the full story about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction capability, and as that report notes, the findings are the strongest evidence to date that Iraq was hiding a biological warfare program. But having said that, Mr Speaker, it is also true that the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime has brought to an end one of the cruelest chapters in modern history. The true scale of its horrors is only now being revealed by a people free of intimidation and fear. And Mr Speaker, when I was in Iraq myself, I think this was uh, patently obvious. Most chilling are the numerous mass grave sites which have been unearthed by coalition forces with the help of information provided by the local Iraqi population. Recently, two significant mass graves have been discovered 
um, near a military base reported to ca contain up to 15,000 bodies. These sites and others like them at Kirkuk, Muhammad, Sakran, Basra and Abu Qasib contain remains buried en masse rather than in individual plots, signifying the deaths were the result of mass atrocities. Mr Speaker, the thousands of bodies uncovered in these sites are just a fraction of what Human Rights Watch estimates are 290,000 Iraqis that have disappeared during the reign of Saddam Hussein. Human Rights Watch was able to locate one such survivor of a mass execution and burial, and his account provided important evidence about the manner in which mass execution campaigns and burials were conducted. In 1991, a 12-year-old boy and several family members were accused by soldiers of being looters and detained with many other Iraqis. After a few days, these detained Iraqis, including the small boy, were taken by a bus to a location and thrown in a pre-dug pit, machine gunned and then buried with a bulldozer. The young boy's mother and other relatives were executed and buried, but the boy miraculously survived to tell his tale. Mr Speaker, the um, coalition is doing what it can to ensure that uh, remains are treated with respect and with dignity, although clearly the sheer scale of what is being discovered makes it difficult to secure all of these sites. Obviously, this is a highly emotional issue for those Iraqis who are only now discovering the final fate of their missing relatives. The gruesome discovery of mass grave sites and heartbreaking accounts of personal tragedy and survival are a stark reminder, Mr Speaker, that the lives of the Iraqi people will be vastly better without Saddam Hussein. Um, Mr Speaker, I think um, it's fair to say that we're proud of the role we've played yeah, yeah. in securing the freedom of the long-suffering Iraqi people. Yeah, 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 yeah. For Reed. Um, Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Immigration. I refer to the Minister's answer. Member for Sturt. Member for Reid has the call. I refer to the Minister's answers to my questions yesterday regarding an application for a protection visa. Did the Minister twice indicate in writing to the Member for Parramatta that he did not wish to exercise his ministerial discretion in the matter? Oh. Does the Minister recall saying in his 31st of the August 2001 letter to the Member for Parramatta that, quote, I do not wish to be, it to be brought to my attention again unless additional information is provided? Ooh. Can the Minister now indicate how the matter was subsequently brought to his attention and just what specific additional information, not previously available to him or his department earlier, did he receive after the case, on the case after 31 August 2001? Will the minister table this documentation? Here, here. The Minister for Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the minister um, has the call. I regret very much the nature of the questioning from the uh, member for Reid, which uh, impugned my integrity. And, uh, and, and, which has, has the call. and which has, and which has, I might say, served its member purpose. Member for Kingsford Smith. The minister. I am not being assisted by the member for Eden Monero, as must be awfully obvious to him. The minister has the call. He is entitled to be heard in silence. The minister. Um, it served its purpose because uh, some of our friends ensured that the nature of that story, which was quite wrong in suggesting that there was any link between donations and the grant of a visa, um, was uh, totally and absolutely untrue. I have never exercised my personal discretion in return for a donation. And uh, that was the insinuation. That was the smear. That was the smear. Um, the minister has the call. And, and, and let me say, and it served its the purpose. Member for Jagger Jagger, because, the minister has the call. Because some people saw fit to report it as if it might have some credibility. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Ballarat. The minister um, has the call. I will, 
Yes, look, I don't like these sorts of points being raised, I must say. Um, no, no, no. If it was, if it was a genuine question seeking information, seeking information initially, um, I, might, I might well have, uh, have wanted to respond in a way which would be cooperative and generous, as I usually am to you. But, 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 but let me... But let me make it. Let me make the it. Member for Lily. The Minister has. Let the me call. make it abundantly clear the way in which this issue was dealt with, um, because uh, it ought to be put beyond absolute doubt. Because uh, uh, yesterday I made clear what the new information was. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, Minister. I did. And, and, and you saw fit. You Minister. saw fit to ignore it. You saw fit to ignore it. And you've been Minister. on radio today, um, suggesting, suggesting that uh, that there was no new information. Now let me let me let me just let me just take you through let me just take you let me just take you through the issue um, as as I understand it. Um, there was a request um, initially by some lawyers in Parramatta by the name of Harrison's um, involving this matter. Uh, I have uh, seen the initial request again, and it made clear to me that the only issue that was being raised uh, by the lawyer uh, on behalf of this gentleman was the handling of the matter before the RRT, the only issue raised. Um, I received further correspondence from the member for Parramatta. Um, that correspondence was referred to my department, and uh, the member for Parramatta um, raised the same issues. Um, he did not raise um, uh, the issue that ultimately influenced me in relation to this matter, um, and my department uh, referred to me a standard form letter that many of you may have seen from time to time, that having already entertained um, a, uh, an intervention request, as there was no further new information provided, um, that uh, I would not be considering it. Now, that's the letter he received. It was not a fresh consideration of the matter. It was not a second intervention by me or consideration by me. Um, it is the case um, that after I saw on the, and I might say not before, um, but after the relevant function, um, and I wouldn't mention his name normally because I don't put uh, uh, information that I receive about individual cases into the public arena, um, but I, I saw um, the Melkite bishop Isham Darwish, um, who uh, then wrote some correspondence in relation to this matter, uh, as requested by me to, uh, to uh, enable me to have a fresh look at the matter. Now, I have made it clear in relation to interventions over a period of time um, that one of the factors that I do look at um, in relation to considering interventions where I might not otherwise intervene um, are Aust substantial Australian connections. Well, um, substantial Australian connections. And, 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 and Member for Lawler. Um, we will, the Minister um, has the call. You might see in a few months whether you Minister want to comment further about the East Timorese. But let me... Minister. But, but let me, let me, let me just, Blair. Let me just say I have, made it, I have made it clear to members who are looking for uh, the way in which I will deal with these issues, and it's not—it's not—it's it's, not—it's not intended to be um, to cover the field, but it was an indication that uh, where people may have an application uh, that is marginal, um, but uh, in another area um, there are issues which also could have an impact, but have a, a marginal impact. Um, I will look at those issues cumulatively. To the assess, member for Werriwa. Well, let me. Let me. I mean, the, the substantial Minister, issue that is no always that is always considered in relation to intervention requests and is most prominent in relation to where I do intervene are um, substantial Australian connections. Uh, they are the cases of spouses of Australians, and particularly where they have uh, um, they have children. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 one of the reasons. One of the reasons. One of the reasons that we have so many interventions today um, in relation to that particular area um, is because, is because um, the provisions that put in place a bar in the Act to further applications 
have been seen as appropriate to remain in the system to discourage people from coming to Australia in expectation um, that they've got a hunting licence to go out and find a spouse and enter into a relationship and expect that it will be accommodated on shore. Um, and that's, that's the reason for the bar. Uh, put in by former governments, we haven't taken it out. But where there are other issues, such as substantial family linkages, um, those, those matters are considered. Now, uh, after uh, the approach, which included community representations, as uh, I have adverted to, um, people known to both the member and myself, um, including the bishop, a prominent doctor, and, uh, and, and community representatives. Um, well, you know that it's Mr Kisawani. You know that. Um, and um, and uh, uh, the, 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 look, the, the, advice, the advice from the bishop was on the 25th, no, 27th, of, uh, 27th of September. But tw September uh, 2001. 2001. I mean, the member was out there suggesting he knew when I was approached. He's suggesting he he was suggesting it was before the member for Cap, member for Parramatta wrote to me. Uh, in fact, it was it was afterwards. It was afterwards, um, and it was after the function uh, that was adverted to. And uh, the fact and, and and the fact is and the fact is that uh, that uh, I asked for I asked for for a uh, for a. Uh, a brief to be prepared for me, um, and I dealt with it in, in, in uh, January 2000 and, uh, 2002. Now, Member the, for Lawler. Um, I mean, the interesting aspect about this matter and, uh, um, is that there has been a lot of interest in it. There has been a lot of interest in it. Um, I was first approached in relation to this matter by the member for Kingsford Smith, um, and, uh, and uh, so he was supporting the first intervention. Um, the member for Blair, um, member for Petrie, minister has the call. The information, minister. the information that I initially considered, Don't I outlined fully yesterday, but I'll take it through you at, through it again. Minister, um, this was the issue in relation to the claims that were accepted by the Refugee Review, Review Tribunal that he'd rescued a Christian girl who'd been sexually assaulted by two Syrian workers in Lebanon. Uh, he claimed that he was accused of causing civil unrest and conducting anti-Syrian activities. He claims that following the incident he was arrested, his house was damaged and, the, um, and his car burnt by Syrian forces. His claim, he claims that he was held in captivity for 45 days without trial and interrogated and badly mistreated. Um, and uh, the RRT accepted, accepted uh, that, uh, that he had been detained and mistreated by the Syrians in 1993. Um, but further found that that was not a convention reason. Um, now, the substantial difference when this matter came forward, which had never been raised before, was that this man had three Australian citizen sisters um, who, well, he did. Um, and they, they, it was a substantial Australian link, which I thought uh, warranted me looking at this issue again because of the seriousness, the seriousness of the issues raised. Minister, now, Minister. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence, and I expect the example to be set by the leader of the opposition. The minister. And the member for Jellybrand might care to come and accompany me in the chair before she makes that sort of assessment. <laughs> leader of the House. When the House has come to order. <laughs> Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, not only is there a constant barrage of interjections uh, from, amongst others, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, but Mr Speaker, uh, there have also been a number of interjections across the table uh, from the member for Reid, uh, clearly suggesting a bribe has taken place. This is grossly offensive, and the member for Reid ought to be instructed to withdraw to withdraw and apologise and not to repeat this grossly offensive smear against the Minister for Immigration. Member Griffith will resume his seat. Member Griffith will resume his seat. As is adequately illustrated by the member for Blair, and in this case the member for Boothby, interjections in fact have occurred on both sides of the of the 
chamber. I have been listening closely to the minister's reply and for much of the time he has been appropriately heard in silence. I did not hear any, any interjection from the member for Reid. I had in fact been closely watching the member for Reid because he had asked the question. I will continue to monitor the debate. To monitor the member for Hunter. The member for Griffith sought a point of order and I will hear him. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In your ruling just then, you've dealt with the matter I was about to raise. Oh. Member for Griffith. Well, Mr Speaker, no, on member the point Griffith, of order. No, Member for Griffith, on a point of order, it has cleared the point of order. If he wishes to make any other comment, there are other forms of the House. I, I have accepted what he has said. I invite him to resume his seat. Point of order. No such statement. Member for Griffith. Alleged by the leader of member for Griffith to resume his seat. <laughs> member for Maranoa. I have indicated precisely what I witnessed. I stand by my view. The minister has the call. Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, I don't wish to add a great deal more. Um, it was clear that there was new material that was put before me. Um, and uh, let me just say that I've asked for some advice to be prepared for me on the number of occasions in which, um, in the uh, last. Uh, while um, the, uh, the uh, issues in relation to my uh, intervention have been addressed. This program year I've had something of the order of uh, 4,000 fresh requests um, and uh, something of the order of 900 repeat requests. Um, I have uh, intervened in a number of occasions, um, approximately 80 I think. Uh, where repeat requests have been made and additional information has been provided. I have done so for the Leader of the Opposition. Um, Member and, for uh, Lawler. Um, it was a second time. Um, but uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition um, would be aware that he's approached me on some 30 occasions. I've intervened on two, and one of those involved a repeat request. Um, the Member for, the member for uh, Reid has written to me seeking intervention on 62 occasions. I don't complain about that. Um, I have considered intervening on 25 occasions. Um, I might say um, that is an exceptional record. Um, uh, the minister has the call. There was no reflection in the remarks I made. There have been in others. Um, let me just say that uh, of the 25 cases, Five of those cases involved uh, matters where Mr Ferguson subsequently approached me, uh, where initial consideration had been declined. So, uh, you know, what has happened is not unusual, uh, not different, um, and uh, the intervention power that I use, I use sparingly, uh, with a, a great deal of care, um, and uh, I will continue to do that. Um, and I won't allow um, the approach that you have taken to influence me in relation Minister, to the way in which I consider Minister, those matters. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Indulgence. Mr Speaker, um, on indulgence, um, what has happened here is that the member for Reid has asked a question which could only be construed as implying corrupt behaviour by the minister. The minister has repudiated that in a very convincing manner. Can I, can I ask? The, the, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has the Mr. call. Speaker, I'm, I'm, the Prime Minister has the call. I'm, 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 I'm asking you. The Mr. member Speaker, for Fraser. I, I find, and everybody on this side of the House finds the behaviour of the member for Reid quite reprehensible. Yeah. Quite reprehensible, without foundation. The Prime Minister Mr. is speaking Speaker, on and indulgence. I, and and what, I, what I'm asking you, Mr. Speaker, to the, do is to, is to invite. Clearly the member for Banks understands only one language and that is he is warned. Uh, I might, Mr Speaker, uh, ask um, you to invite the, minister for, the, the member for Reid to apologise to the minister. When the House has come to order, the 
Member for Lilly. Yes, Mr. Point Speaker, of order. Are, Member for Lilly. Mr. Speaker, the remarks of the Prime Minister. The were member for clearly, Lilly, is the Member for Lilly seeking indulgence or a point I'm of order? I'm seeking indulgence, like the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm, in, I'm entitled to indulgence, like he was. A member for Lilly, on a point of order. The Prime Minister's remarks were clearly a reflection on your last ruling. Clearly a reflection on your last ruling. The member for Lilly, member for Hindmarsh, it, member, does the member for Reid want to? No, member I for Reid. Member, Reed, I would seek member for Reid resume his seat. I must first deal with. The, I would have thought with the matter raised. I sat here yesterday very uncomfortable with the member for Reid's question and, in fact, uh, and in fact required him to um, the, the latter paragraphs of it to be ignored. Today, when he came to the dispatch box, I was clearly very anxious to make sure that there was no repeat of what happened yesterday. There has, in my view, been no repeat of what happened yesterday. I heard nothing in the member for each question today that caused me alarm as the occupier of the chair. And I was anxious to ensure that the minister had every opportunity to be heard in relative silence. I do not believe that the, minister, that the member for each question yesterday was uh, entirely appropriate, though I allowed it to stand. I could not, in the light of today's performance, call for him to apologise. The member for Reid. Mr Speaker, I sought the uh, tabling of the documentation of this case, but I would seek to table the federal court uh, uh, decision in regards to this case uh, described as marginal. Yes, the, 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 the member for Reid has, I believe, sought to table a document. Is, is, tab is, is leave granted for the tabling of the document? Um, order, order, the, order. Neither the member for Reid and the minister will resume their seats. We cannot have a debate across the chamber. Leave has been granted for the tabling of the document. The member for Lilly. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to request that the minister table the documents from which he was quoting and the advice from which he was quoting in the previous answer. Was the minister quoting from a document? No, the, the minister is obliged to understand what is private, private but, documents but, relating to people's personal the, the, the minister is required, simply under the standing orders, to answer two questions from the chair, one of which he has loudly, la largely responded to. Was he quoting from a document? Uh, selectively, but they are confidential. Yes. And were the documents confidential? The answer to that he has just indicated. The member for Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Has the Minister seen claims by state governments about their expenditure on drought assistance? Would the Minister inform the House of the comprehensive payments being made by the Commonwealth as the drought continues? Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, I thank the Honourable Member for Parks for his question and his ongoing interest in the drought, which affects, I think, virtually all of his electorate, and where there are obviously many farmers facing particular difficulties. The Commonwealth has moved to provide significant and comprehensive financial support for farmers during these difficult times. We've moved where states have failed to act. We're providing a range of assistance measures, many of which have never been offered in a drought situation before. We are also processing applications much faster than, e than ever before. And indeed, as soon as a prima facie case has been established, uh, farmers are eligible to receive interim assistance while their case is under consideration. Uh, we're taking about a third as long to consider the detailed applications as has occurred in the past. And this has already meant 
that uh, significant assistance is flowing to Australian farm communities. We've committed, in, in relation to the applications already before and, and agreed to by the federal government, uh, expenditure of around $950 million over three years. Indeed, no federal government in any drought in our history has made a contribution anything like uh, that amount. We have recognised the severity of the situation, and whilst those numbers sound big and, when they're all added together, are indeed a very significant uh, contribution from the Commonwealth, we know that each one is dealing with a personal tragedy and, and a personal situation of great difficulty being confronted by an Australian farm family. So we've been prepared to stand by them and to offer as much assistance as we possibly can. In addition, of course, there's been substantial revenue foregone, foregone under the Farm Management Deposit Scheme. Uh, we've provided since 1997 around $800 million under the uh, AAA Agriculture Program, which provides support for farm training for uh, the Farm Family Restart Scheme and, of course, rural financial councillors, which have been especially in demand over recent times. Now, if you compare that commitment with what's been offered by the states during this uh, arguably worst drought in our nation's history, the, 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 the comparisons are, are, are light and dark. Uh, compared with our almost one billion already committed to, to relief assistance in this drought, the states between them have managed something less than $60 million. It's really a pathetic effort. And in states like Victoria and Western Australia, they actually cut the assistance off as soon as Commonwealth assistance is available under the Exceptional Circumstances Program. Uh, around, uh, around 50 EC applications have either been lodged or are projected, and some of those applications are being lodged by states who have made absolutely no financial assistance at all to farmers in that region. They demand Commonwealth help while they're prepared to do nothing themselves. And many of these applications have covered huge areas. Areas that have meant it's been very difficult for the independent arbiter, the National Rural Advisory Council, to make a decision about whether the area qualifies or it doesn't. They cover such a range of industry areas and geographical circumstances that some areas may qualify and others do not. And then when an application is declined because the state case has not been strong enough, we have state ministers actually going out criticising the Commonwealth Government because their application has failed. They'd be far better off putting their time and energy into providing meaningful practical assistance at the local level and developing applications that are likely to meet the criteria, criteria which they signed off on uh, four or five years ago and have been a party in developing. So it is important that there be, a, uh, there be cooperation between the Commonwealth and the states in developing the applications and in then considering the appropriate method of, of, of assistance to be provided uh, in cases where there is severe drought. I want to emphasise, Mr Speaker, that unfortunately because of the nature of the cases that have been presented or the way and, or the circumstances in, in, in areas, some of the applications have not been successful. But in every instance, the Commonwealth and the National Rural Advisory Council has recommended that we review the case in the months ahead. And so there will be a constant review of uh, the circumstances of people in areas where applications have not been uh, accepted and as soon as it's clear that an area meets the criteria, then we're willing to reconsider and to make that kind of a declaration. The states have a role in providing up-to-date information to ensure that those matters can be considered promptly, but what we certainly need to have is, instead of criticism and empty words from the states, a bit of performance, a bit of caring about the needs of farmers and a desire to actually ensure that benefits flow as quickly as possible. Uh, finally, Mr Speaker, let me say that the Commonwealth is aware of the fact that the current EC arrangements leave a lot to be desired. We have been trying to reform them now for more than two years and getting no cooperation from any of the states. Uh, what is important is that there be a spirit of cooperation and a willingness to try and provide benefits in the most effective way. States have never done less in a drought, never done less, never, never talked more, but never done less. But we haven't been prepared to have farmers suffer just because they've got uncaring state governments. We've been prepared to move in and provide realistic assistance, and we will do that until the drought's over. The Honourable Member for Reid. <coughs> Mr Speaker, my question is directed the to the Minister for, for Immigration. I refer to the Minister's last answer, and I ask, 
On what date did the minister or his department first become aware of the visa applicants' relatives in Australia, specifically the three sisters? On what date did Bishop Darwish first write or contact the minister or his department? Will the minister confirm uh, that the matters are— Member Farid, Member Farid, the member for Mackella on a point of order. Standing order the 76. member for Blacksland seemed to find it very useful to make sure that points of order on my left are heard. He might extend the same courtesy to members on my right. The member for McClellan. Standing order 76 says that all imputations or improper motives which are implied shall in fact be considered highly disorderly. So standing order 77 says that if it is disorderly, you must intervene, and then you go to section uh, standing order 303 or 304A or 306, and request that the member either desist or be removed from the house. Now the imputations that the member is making are quite plain and clear to see, and accordingly, Mr. Speaker, I would ask you to rule in accordance with either 303, 304A or 306. The member. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, everything that the member for Reid has uh, asked uh, and member said uh, in this House uh, uh, yesterday and today uh, is an allegation, in effect, of improper conduct. Now, if the member for Reid, if the member for Reid wants to proceed that way, there are clear forms under the standing orders. If the member for Reid wants to proceed that way, he must move a substantive motion. And this fishing, this disgusting fishing expedition Member, should of the House be ruled out of his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. There are, of course, forms of the House and substantive motions when allegations of improper conduct are being made. I have listened closely to the Member for Reid's question, and he has to date asked for the Minister to nominate a series of dates. I did not consider that out of order. Whether or not the minister has the, that as a question without notice is entirely, of course, the minister's prerogative, but it is not, I think, a reasonable question. Remember, for the minister, the, don't the minister finish his question? Unless the, did the minister have a point of order? No. no the no, the member for Reid was interrupted on a point of order. Will the minister confirm that the two matters detailed today are the limit of the new, alleged new information received? After the 31st of August 2001, the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, um, in relation to the way in which this matter was dealt with, um, the uh, first uh, document I would have seen was on the uh, first of the 10th, 98. Um, that was um, an intervention request. Um, which was in the form of a schedule um, in which no reference was made uh, to the gentleman's family. The second relevant document is, is the uh, letter from the member for Parramatta. Uh, I, I probably have the date of it, but I refreshed my memory earlier by reading it. Um, the questions in relation to his family were not raised in that matter. I outlined that in uh, response to the earlier question. Um, uh, the bishop wrote to me um, on the uh, 27th of September, after I'd met with him on the 25th of September 2001, and uh, I have no idea um, whether my department uh, may have received any other advice. Um, it wasn't brought. To, well, I can ask, but I don't think it's relevant um, because it wasn't before me at the time when I first considered the matter. Mm -hmm. It wasn't before me um, or the department at the time Mr Cameron wrote his letter, um, but was before me when I made the decision in January 2002. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I simply affirm what I said before as to uh, the factors that uh, I considered at that time. Um, look, I mean, the, the minister? No. Um, the letter that initiated... The, well, no, the letter minister, that initiated... Through the chair. The letter that, uh, Mr. Speaker, the letter that initiated this matter uh, followed our meeting um, with the bishop uh, on the 25th of uh, September 2001, um, and the letter was written on the 27th of September. And that was after the dinner. The member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Would the minister advise the House of measures being taken by the Howard government 
to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Would the Minister also inform the House of any new developments? Minister of Environment and Heritage. I thank the Honourable Member for Ryan for his question, and I also take this opportunity to thank him for representing me recently by launching the excellent book on Australian grasses, which has been produced by the Australian Biological Resources Survey. Mr Speaker, Australia is very vulnerable to climate change, and this is why the government shares international concern about climate change and the challenge that it poses to our natural environment and to our economy. It was this government that established the first greenhouse-specific agency in the world with the Australian Greenhouse Office, and through a mixture of mandatory, voluntary uh, incentives and grants, has encouraged action which has meant that Australia has been a leader in greenhouse gas abatement. In fact, the measures that the government has taken so far are estimated to deliver some 60 million tonnes per annum of CO2 equivalent abatement each year by the year 2010, and that's equivalent to taking all Australia's passenger cars off the roads. Through the impact of new technology and improved standards, Australia is successfully now decoupling its economic growth from greenhouse emissions growth. Emissions per dollar of GDP were 24 per cent lower in 2000 than they were in 1990. Today I have announced the applications are now being sought for round three of the $400 million greenhouse gas abatement program. As a result of the first two applications rounds, 15 projects have already been offered a total of almost $145 million to abate more than 27 million tonnes of greenhouse gas during the period 2008 to 2012. Examples of these projects include funding of up to $26 million for combined heat and power cogeneration facilities to abate 3.25 million tonnes of greenhouse gases and funding of up to more than $40 million for several projects in New South Wales and Queensland to capture and use waste coal mine gas to abate over 7 million tonnes of greenhouse gases. Mr Speaker, this government is committed to meeting the target that we negotiated at Kyoto of 108 per cent of 1990 levels. We are also developing a climate change forward agenda to cover the next 20 to 30 years that will lead a strong contribution to global climate control without sacrificing the competitive advantages that we have as a resource-rich nation. The Honourable Member for Reid. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Immigration. Does the Minister stand by his statement to the House yesterday that neither he nor the other minister with whom he checked, who I understand to be the Minister, minister, Abbott, minister, minister Abbott, have, quote, any knowledge of any donations being made at that particular function at Romeo's restaurant? Member for Reid. The Minister. <laughs> Member for Booth, be on a point of order. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Standing Order 142 says that questions should relate to the area of the Minister's responsibility, and uh, page 526 of House of Representatives practice shows that speakers in the past have ruled out questions which relate to the actions, activities, and statements by a minister's own party. Um, it therefore follows that this question, every part of it so far, has been out of order, and I ask you to rule it out of order. The Minister for the, the Member for Boothby makes a point of order that I, that I was I'm dealing with the point of order. The member for Boothby makes a point of order that I was about to make myself. The members will be aware that on Tuesday, I think the member for Fraser raised the question of ministerial responsibility and party matters, and I'd subsequently reported back to he and the member for Lilly the um, House of Representatives practice comments reinforced by the member for Boothby. I do not believe that donations at a particular function 
could be deemed the, minister, the business of either the Minister for Workplace Relations or the Minister for Immigration. The member for where are on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think you'll find that the question goes to an answer that the minister provided yesterday. That's right. And having provided an answer in the House of Representatives yesterday, very clearly it's a matter of ministerial responsibility, improper accountability to the House in asking the minister whether he stands by those remarks just yesterday. The Minister for Employment and Work... Oh, I'm sorry, if he's not seeing... Um, order. I stand by my earlier comments that I cannot see how donations at a party function are the business of a minister or a member of the executive. In that context, the question is not in order and would need to be rephrased. The, the, oh, no, I'm sorry, I had already recognised the member for Lilly. On your day, Tony. <laughs> Manager of Opposition the, uh, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Minister's question related directly to an answer given in this House yesterday by the Minister. Yes. Ha the member for Lily will resume his seat. I'm very happy to deal with that, what, what he regards as anomaly. In fact, of course, it related to a question that was much broader than the specific matter of donations. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I move. Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended, as will prevent uh, the member for Reid being compelled to move a motion of censure of the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs in order. Member for Prospect. Minister will resume his seat. Leader of the Opposition, the member for Rye Rankin, the member for Macmillan, the minister, particularly as leader of the House, is entitled to be heard in silence. He has the call. The Mr. member Speaker, for Wills is warned. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Leader of the Opposition being compelled to move a motion of censure on the Minister for Immigration in place, in place of the innuendo and imputation he is attempting to make by means of questions without notice. Member Mr. for Speaker. Kingston. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker I am moving this way. Uh, because the conduct of the member for Reid, supported by the Leader of the Opposition yeah, yeah, yeah. and others opposite, has demeaned this parliament. The Mr. member for Lindiari has demeaned this parliament. Mr Speaker, last night the Leader of the Opposition member for made a speech calling yet again for higher parliamentary standards, and today he comes into the parliament on a disgusting fishing expedition, a fishing expedition for which he has produced not a shred or a scrap of hard evidence. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, members opposite are entitled to ask questions seeking factual information. They are entitled to ask questions the seeking the factual Watson. information. What they are not entitled to do is to come into this parliament and smear and, and traduce the reputation of a decent and honourable member of this parliament, a the decent and honourable minister of the Crown. Mr Speaker, what has been alleged over the last two days by the member for Reid is that the Minister for Immigration rejected representations, then, after money was paid, that he changed his view on those representations. That is a disgraceful allegation. It is an absolutely disgraceful allegation, and such an allegation should never be made without hard evidence, hard evidence of which the member for Reid has not produced a single scrap. Now, I have to say, Mr Speaker, that this kind of disgusting behaviour, this kind of travesty uh, of, uh, of, of behaviour, this is typical of the Leader of the Opposition, a Leader of the Opposition who acts like a junkyard dog in this parliament uh, and then yeah. pretends to be a choir boy, pretends to be a choir boy Minister, as soon as Minister he resume his seat. Member for Werra will resume his seat. The member for Werra will resume his seat. Minister will withdraw that comment. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I withdraw and I apologise, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition's problem. Minister, member for where on a point of order? On the question of relevance, Mr. Speaker, there's nothing in this the suspension motion that's about the leader seat. of the opposition. Member for where will resume his seat. The minister has the call. By any standard, the minister was being relevant. He had, in fact, linked these remarks between the leader of the opposition and the member for Reid. Not a question whether I like it or not. I have, he has withdrawn. He has the call. Speaker, there is there is only one reason why the member for Reid is persisting member in this for line of gutter tactics. Uh, there's only one reason why the member for Reid and members opposite are uh, floundering like rats in a sewer of their own making. Uh, there's only one reason for this, Mr. Speaker. Member, member for Batman on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I find the remarks of the leader of the House yes, most member offensive, un-Australian, and I ask that you Member for Batman, resume his seat. The member for Batman is aware that, undesirable though the remarks are, the requirement for withdrawal is that they are directed to an individual. The leader. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, if it, if it would assist you and assist the House, uh, I'm, I'm happy to withdraw the comments. But the fact I is, Mr. Withdrawn. Speaker, that this leader of That's the opposition no has put the member for Reid up to this. This leader of the opposition, assisted by the management team, and what this leader of the opposition is on about is a grubby fishing expedition designed to traduce the reputation of the minister. minister Minister, resume his seat. The member for Reid on a point of order. I take the censure. Member for Reid, resume his seat. Member for Reid, resume his seat. The minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, finally, it seems, finally, it seems, the member for Reid uh, is prepared to move a censure motion. Well, Mr. Speaker, why didn't he come in here and do it yesterday? Why didn't he come in here and do it yesterday rather than traduce the forms of this House, rubbish the reputation of this minister, uh, bring the parliament into disrespect by abusing all the proper standards that ought to be in place in this place? Mr. Speaker, the member for, the member for Reid, the member for Reid, in cahoots with the Leader of the Opposition, has unfairly and dishonestly smeared the reputation of the Minister for Immigration. He shouldn't be able to get away with it. He's demonstrated nothing, and it's about time for him to put up or shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the motion be agreed to? All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The member for Reid. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House censures the Minister for failing to adequately explain to the House the alleged new information that he relied upon to approve the visa application of Bedwani Habish, which he had previously rejected. Yeah. 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 And uh, I'm asked by the Leader of uh, Government Business why I didn't uh, do it earlier. Well, I've only become aware overnight that he was at the function himself. Oh, oh, and, uh, oh. Uh, he's uh, one of the witnesses relied upon uh, in regards to there being no previous donations. The situation is that this case has been through the normal processing system. It has been examined internally by the department uh, and uh, the allegations of uh, rape and incarceration and persecution by Syrian forces were dealt with by the department and then the RRT. And despite the attempts of the minister to indicate that the RRT might have provided a few favourable comments in regards to Mr Bedwani's case, the reality is that the federal court found him to be a particularly untrustworthy witness. And uh, what we have here is a situation where uh, the uh, member for Parramatta Made a number of uh, uh, made a number of uh, endeavours on this matter. They were clearly rejected by the minister. All of his persuasive powers and influence were unable to turn this case around. Uh, I, and uh, I, I reluctantly interrupt the member for Reid because, as the clerk has pointed out, we're not in the House is not in possession no, no, of his resolution. If you could hand the blue. With the resolution, the House would be in possession of it, and the debate can proceed. The member for Reid. The, uh, as I Water. said, uh, the uh, 
the situation was that uh, the uh, member for Parramatta was unable in any manner to persuade the minister as to the bona fides of this case. And, member, uh, minister for citizenship. It is extremely interesting that uh, Bishop Darwish is quoted in the media today uh, as to the nature of this case. And what does he refer to? Does he refer to the matters raised by the minister uh, about uh, the, the truth of the case, which were to deal with rapes and uh, tussles between Syrians in uh, northern Lebanon and uh, issues of incarceration? The bishop, who supposedly was so persuasive of the minister, was so telling, which turned his views around. Uh, the, minister, the bishop in the, in the paper today refers to the member being a, a previous member of the South Lebanese army, which is not even part of the case. It's not even a fact in the whole case. This is the man who persuaded the minister that this person should, should live in Australia, that he should become another one of the 14 to 1,500 privileged people who have been allowed to stay here as permanent residents the member after, for having been, after having been rejected by the department. I warn the member for Hindmarsh. The RRT and the federal court. So the person who was so persuasive, so telling, to, to turn the minister around, far more influential allegedly than the member for Parramatta, he's out there today putting facts about the case which indicate he knows nothing whatsoever about the case. That the person was not even that the person was a member of the SLA when he wasn't. Now the situation uh, clearly, the minister used yesterday. The minister yesterday came in here and said that he and another minister had no recollection of this fundraising function that any money changed hands. They just for fun went to Parramatta, sat around talking about the, the weather uh, and uh, basically went home. Uh, overnight, of course, uh, the member, uh, overnight the member for Parramatta has clarified to the minister that $22,000 was actually collected and we have and uh, we have uh, and we have uh, we have Mr. Uh, we have we have uh, Mr. Kizawani today out there in the media saying that leader of the opposition. We had uh, Mr. Kizawani out there today confirming that 22,000 was collected for the member for Parramatta, and of course trying to put forward an argument that the person uh, who was assisted uh, could not, in a million years, have provided any money because he allegedly had uh, five children, was poverty-stricken and there's no way he could provide any money. Well, the facts of life are that the person concerned has three children, uh, is a uh, very effective, fully employed cement renderer who owns his own house uh, and uh, who, uh, uh, who owns his own house uh, and drives around in a Range Rover. So there we have the Confederates of the Minister the Confederates of the Minister attempting to basically besmirch the, 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 the credibility of those that are raising this case. Now, the situation is that large numbers of people are rejected every day of the week on the same grounds that this person now remains in Australia. Yeah. The essential grounds are that there are Syrian forces in Lebanon, uh, they, uh, uh, many Maronites and Melkites and Orthodox believers allege that they are harassed and victimised, and, uh, and these are the grounds which Mr. Ruddock's the Minister's Department rejects every day of the week. If you look at RRT cases, they, ferret, they are very unfavourable to this type of case. The, this, this, the person that he has allowed in Australia was found by the federal court to be extremely unconvincing, a very poor witness. And when the minister comes in here today and he says, despite my rejection of the Minister of Parramatta, despite the RRT, despite the Federal Court, despite internal processing by Demia, I'm letting him stay in Australia because he had three sisters. Let's get real. If that was the basis for uh, ministerial discretion and intervention, there'd be about 4,000 a year coming in under the, under the criteria. Yeah, uh, right. uh, uh, th th that is the reality. You know, that Basically, uh, we, we, only, we don't let people in here under normal family reunion just because they've got three sisters here. We've got a person here who's been found to have no substantial refugee humanitarian claim whatsoever, supposedly persuaded. But, 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 sorry, he is able to be uh, allowed to remain permanently 
because the minister allegedly found out for the first time that he had three sisters here. Now, it's interesting that the minister in yesterday's uh, uh, coverage of the issue, he recounted every single part of this person's life story. Yeah. Every single detail was there, but no mention of the, the, the sisters three. yesterday. Yeah. The three sisters didn't get a run yesterday. Right. The, this, this, this case, which so impacted upon him, this letter from this bishop that so turned him around, he couldn't even remember the reasons yesterday. Uh, so uh, one has to uh, doubt how uh, substantial that factor really was. What has happened here? A few community leaders, quote, in other words, Mr. Karim Kizawani, uh, a very close long-term associate of the minister, obviously rang him up after this function and said, Philip, I want this one through to the keeper. That's the community rep that's the yes, obviously. That's the community representation that occurred here. And the donation made at the function by Mr Kizawani on behalf of Mr Habish is a fact of life. And, and the ministers opposite who lead up want us to believe the minister the ministers want us to believe the that order. they went as of yesterday they went the to call. this function and they were, they did not see minister any money being affairs. raised the fundraiser they just walked around uh, no money received uh, nothing happened uh, you know, let's get and uh, as I uh, indicated I was attempting earlier to minister get the minister to guarantee to guarantee that no money had changed hands. And quite frankly, we have procedural points and other efforts made so that the minister doesn't have to stand by his statement yesterday when he said he didn't know about money. Now, as I say, the use of ministerial discretion is a very serious matter. At various stages, some ministers have actually abolished it because they thought it was open to distortion, they thought it was open to political influence peddling, they thought it was open to ethnic kind of pleasing of communities, they thought there was a possibility of corruption there. There are ministers in the past who abolished this because they were concerned about the way it was utilised and the way it might be perceived. Now the minister said that he has uh, allowed approximately a thousand people into this country, over a thousand people in this country, on the basis of a ministerial discretion which is untested, not transparent to the Australian public. No one knows why these cases are decided. Because often they are for good reason, because, for instance, the Department of Foreign Affairs' uh, papers that they put to the Immigration Department might be somewhat hostile to or favourable to a particular regime overseas, and the minister might correctly come in and say, well, I think that the uh, DFAT uh, uh, position is too hardline or too softline the case. There are other cases where there are very compelling reasons why people should remain in Australia for family reasons. Obviously, if people have a young child who is an Australian citizen, that can be a very real factor. Are we saying that a person should be uh, deported when they do have very close family here? But to say that somebody with such an atrocious case, recognised as such by the federal court as well as the RRT, should remain here simply because he has three sisters is preposterous. Mr. The minister would realise that he would reject week after week. He would reject similar cases. This is not a novel, unusual proposal. It is Member not, for Canning. The, this man is not the first claimant in this country who has been rejected and went to ministerial discretion and was basically rejected and sent home having three, four, five, six, seven, eight siblings. That's the reality. This is nothing unusual in this case. To say that uh, all, of, all, of the, all the processing of this department, all the integrity of our immigration system, all, all of the public service effort, all the people that we appoint to tribunals, that should all be thrown out because somebody has three sisters in the country. That is preposterous, and it's not the real reason why this case, why this case was uh, decided in this fashion by the minister. The reality is that uh, uh, the reality is that uh, that, that uh, a function was attended, uh, uh, donations were made. Uh, a person who was instrumental in these donations then went to the minister Member and asked the minister Robertson. asked the minister to. Uh, uh, to basically do him a favour in this case. Now, the federal court decision, total, uh, uh, 70 FCA 1998, absolutely demolishes the witness as a, as a credible person in any way whatsoever. What? And uh, if I can, uh, Justice O'Connor uh, went went very deeply into the uh, integrity of the person. He referred to, tri to tribunal comments. The tribunal did not accept the claim made for the first time at the tribunal. Mr. Speaker. Made 
for the first time the, the claim made for the first time at the tribunal hearing that a cousin with a high ranking position with the Department of State Security renewed the applicant's passport. Furthermore, in respect of the 1996 incident, the, the crucial for reason for the refugee claim. The member, the member for Reid. The member for Cook. On Mr. A, Speaker, on I refer to Standing Order 85. Uh, it regards uh, tedious repetition. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Reid has the call. So, <laughs> quoting, quoting further from that decision. In respect of the 1996 incident, the tribunal found implausible. Quote. Furthermore, the tribunal did not accept that the applicant was wanted by the authorities. Quote. Furthermore, the tribunal did not accept the claim made for the first time at the tribunal that a cousin with a high-ranking position, etc., etc. They're saying that this person is a totally disreputable witness. They're saying he has no refugee humanitarian case whatsoever. They're saying that he should not be allowed to come into this country in the limited number of people, approximately 12,000 a year, that we take out of 25 million refugees around the world. This person is so privileged—12,000 get in here a year, at most, out of 25 million people who are out of their homes, exiled from their countries, facing torture and persecution, and the minister comes in here and says, I am letting this person be amongst that privileged 12,000 this year because he's got three sisters in the country. What? This is a, this is a Member, government. Minister for Citizenship. This is a government that we experienced last year with the Tampa, demolishing people, besmirching their image. Talk about people being smeared. A government which smeared refugee claimants, yeah, said, yeah, yeah. said that they were uh, totally that they were totally fallacious. Said that they were. And, uh, Member, the minister, they were the member for Reid has the call, implying they were terrorists. That's right. This this government which which is so vigilant supposedly. So vigilant about not having improper entry into this country, the so dedicated Fisher. to border protection, a government which is, is uh, trying to convince the Australian electorate they're credible, they're trustworthy, they believe in proper processing. That's that's the, that's the, that's the commitment they supposedly make. And I warn we, the member for Fisher. And now we have a case here where, uh, after a function of Parramatta, where a donation is made in the presence of two ministers on behalf of a then pending claimant. We find that he comes into this very privileged room. Shame. These are the people, as I say, they've been out there trying to undermine, uh, smear, slander refugee claimants, and then they themselves, under their own discretion, allow somebody on this basis. And uh, as the minister knows, it's non-compellable. All that the Australian Parliament and the Australian people know about these cases were how many were approved each year, how many the previous year, what proportion were accepted and rejected, etc. Et no details of uh, what countries they stem from, no, no, no uh, ability to, to test whether there is a pattern, to test whether there is a pattern of, let's say, influence, influence peddling amongst particular ethnic communities. Not, no possibility of the Australian electorate knowing that these people who are supposed to refugees are really entering the country because there might be this person in a particular electorate who is uh, close to the party, might be able to deliver an electoral vote to them. No way the Australian electorate can examine that. And we've had a point blank refusal by the minister today to actually table the reasons for, for this grant. We had him at the last minute today. Uh, after some overnight consideration, I gather, saying that it was about these three uh, sisters. No mention yesterday. Nothing at all. He recounted every single facet of the bloke's life. You know, next thing we'll be knowing whether he had uh, ten dinos in his pocket or something. That was the kind of level of development he had yesterday. Everything had happened in the past. Everything the tribunal knew about, we heard from yesterday. And he tried to imply. Member for Canning. He tried to imply this was the new evidence because the rest of Australia hasn't got the file. They might believe that what he said yesterday was the end of this, that they had all these pressing arguments. These, in fact, are the pressing arguments that were rejected by the system. He didn't come up with any new reasons yesterday, and that's why, quite rightly, the opposition has had to press him again today to try and find out the specifics of this decision. Now, uh, the uh, situation uh, is that. Uh, this particular community is uh, very close to the minister. He has a very strong following in it, and uh, I dare to say that uh, if one was to analyse decision making under this uh, ministerial discretion, one would find a pattern. One would find. One would find. Order. 
a, 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 the member for a Reed pattern. has the call. Uh, now, as I said, uh, and uh, not only not only do not only do I want not only do I want the minister to basically come forward and detail the whole file to see whether there's really Gee, anything uh, more convincing than three sisters, but I want him to actually stand by yesterday's statement that no donations were made to the Liberal Party at that function, that no donations on were made on behalf of Mr. Mr. Habishi. That's right. Uh, and it wasn't a very crowded function, so I don't think the activity got lost in the mist. Romeo's, as the minister, as the minister for workplace relations would know from his visit there for that night, uh, is not uh, an expand, expansive operation uh, with thousands of people present. Uh, I don't think that the minister missed that detail. That uh, uh, he uh, he and uh, he confirmed this with his colleague that uh, they weren't aware of any money uh, being raised that night. I want him to reiterate that today, to, get, to, to say that no money did take, was offered there. By him, on his behalf. You, well, no. you better read Hansard. Member for Reid, Member for Reid, uh, yeah. Minister, Member for Reid, just his remarks. Yesterday, you detailed that you confirmed with the minister that uh, you had no memory, no knowledge of money me, being, me, being raised at the function. Now, we can hide behind technicalities. The clear facts, in conclusion, are that a person had went through the normal processing minister of this country. Processing that this minister is trenchant in support of. This minister is so strong on repeat applications for uh, discretion that he actually, his office says, well, look, from now on, if a person is coming to us for a second uh, uh, consideration by the minister, we will still seek to we can still seek to deport that person while the minister is considering it. He is so strong in guarding against abuse of, of, of secondary, second and third and fourth repeat applications for his discretion that he's actually saying. In future, because people were exploiting it before to remain in Australia for lengthy times, I'm going to actually have them deported, possibly in the time when they're being considered. He's, he's, he's got a process from his 1999 uh, guidelines. From his 1999 guidelines, he says in there that a public servant will look at the less relevant, uh, unimpressive, totally fraudulent cases, not even bring them to my attention. Just send off a letter to the member for Parramatta or whoever it is, saying I don't even need to see that. That's how bad the case was. That the public servant didn't even show him to him, apparently. Right. And this is because the minister is saying that the system was being abused. I don't want to see second and third approaches to me. I want to use the discretion once and once only, essentially, because there is, it is being abused. And yet here today, uh, we've got a situation where uh, a, an approach is made and somebody is allowed in the country. Now, quite frankly, if, if people over there don't think this is serious, I think that the abuse of the immigration system through uh, uh, the refugee humanitarian uh, sector is a very serious matter. It's a thing that many members deal with daily. And if people start to believe that all you've got to do is know the right person in the right community, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the right party, at the right functions, Order. then quite frankly, it's a, it's a very sad day in Time immigration process expired. in this country. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? Thank you for all. Motion moved by the member for Reid is a motion of, second, uh, of censure of the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the minister. Mr. Speaker, um, let, me, uh, Order. let me deal with these issues in a uh, comprehensive way. Um, it, uh, it is the case that people can have different views about the way in which a particular matter might be addressed. Um, the discretion that I have to exercise is one that I take and treat with very considerable care. Um, the parliament has recognised that, uh, on a, that occasions could arise where it would be in the public interest to grant a visa even though a person did not meet normal criteria for a grant. Um, and it's for this reason that the legislation gives me the personal power to substitute where I consider it to be in the public interest for a decision with the RRT or the RMRT, a decision more favourable to the applicant. Individuals do make requests to me, many members of parliament make requests to me. And as I said earlier, um, I am free to exercise that power where I consider it to be in the public interest, irrespective of whether a person has in fact made a request. Uh, but it is also the case um, that I can decline to intervene. Um, the fact that I decline to intervene is not 
a decision to reject, um, and there is, no, there is no restriction on people coming back and seeking to raise matters with me. And as I indicated, uh, some 80 decisions have been made which were on second requests. I indicated five of them uh, were in response to requests made by the Honourable Member for Reid. Now, that's, that's, that's the point I made, and one by the Leader of the Opposition. Now, um, the point I do make in relation to these matters um, is that uh, I, uh, I exercise that responsibility with a great deal of care, but I'm not going to suggest that, uh, that uh, a decision that I take would be replicated in every case in exactly the same way by somebody else bringing their own mind to bear in relation to this matter. But I did spell out yesterday um, in Hansard um, at the end of the day uh, the basis upon which I made this decision. And I am surprised that the member for Reid um, is suggesting uh, that uh, what I said today is substantially different in any way to what I said yesterday. And um, because... The minister has the call. No. And Mr. Mr Speaker, as I find the place, I will actually quote uh, fully to the honourable member and it will become clear to all members when they hear it uh, that uh, in, this particular, in this particular case um, I put the same information yesterday um, that I put today. Um, and on page, uh, 1400, uh, sorry, uh, 14,804, I had this to say. The point I make is that the RRT accepted that the applicant had been detained and mistreated by the Syrians. In addition, the man had substantial Australian connections. In other words, he had a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia. I weighed those matters up and determined an intervention was appropriate. I disclosed to the parliament yesterday the three sisters. The three sisters. Uh, yes, I did. In other words, he had a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia, and I weighed those matters up and determined that an intervention was appropriate. I mean, you weren't listening. Minister, you weren't listening. Um, it was quite clear. It was quite clear. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that I didn't say that the that the relatives were three sisters. Um, I made it clear. That the leader the, of the opposition. I made it. I made it clear. I made it clear uh, that he had uh, a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia. That was a different factor that was not known to me before, and which coupled uh, with the concern I had about the finding of the tribunal. Um, and uh, I repeated again that the. Uh, uh, that in respect of the 1993 incident, the tribunal accepted that the applicant had been detained by the Syrians and he was mistreated in Tripoli. And I might say those matters were uh, the subject of an adverse finding because they did not constitute a convention reason. Uh, there were other matters raised on that, uh, uh, on, on that matter um, in which the tribunal did not make positive findings. Um, but uh, that in no way derogates uh, from the fact uh, that, unlike most cases I see <coughs> where the, uh, the tribunal says uh, that I do not believe the individual, he has no credibility, and I do not accept any of the claims that he has made, there was a specific finding, a very specific finding, in respect of the 1993 incident that the tribunal accepted. Um, and it was on that basis. That, uh, that I elected in this particular case to intervene. Now, uh, there were only two other points of substance uh, raised by the, uh, uh, by the uh, or three other points of substance raised by the member for Reid, which I, uh, I see fit to, to deal with. Um, the first is in relation to Bishop Darwish's comments in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, I think it was, or one of the newspapers. Well, it was the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, what I know is that. Uh, uh, that uh, the newspapers yesterday had uh, the member for Reid uh, issuing a press release uh, which contained a background information sheet on ministerial discretion under section 417. And uh, besides the fact that the, uh, that the member uh, evidences some abysmal 
uh, knowledge about what actually happened. Um, what he was putting into the minds of the journalists was that in some way decisions taken by me under 417 were related to um, the South Lebanese Army. In fact, paragraph 3 he says there was public concern when the minister used 417 to allow into Australia 200 Lebanese people either associated with members uh, with or members of the Israeli backed South Lebanese Army, and some of those members had tortured and murdered Palestinians and so on. Now, um, now let me just say uh, 417 was never used for that purpose. Um, they were allowed under the special humanitarian program. And they had to meet character, um, and, it, and it meant that amongst a large number of people who in fact applied, a very significant proportion were unable uh, to access those visas under the special humanitarian program. But I wouldn't be surprised if Bishop Darwish was rung up um, by a journalist and said, uh, was this man in some way linked with forces in Lebanon? And then, and then the journalist verbals him and says, oh, that's the South Lebanese army. That wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I certainly have, I, cert, I, cert, I certainly know the difference between the South Lebanese army and, and the uh, Lebanese forces who were a, uh, a Christian militia in Lebanon. Um, the fact is that they were quite different. They fought in very different theatres um, and they are quite distinctive. Um, and, uh, and I suspect um, that it was more likely um, uh, a journalist not dealing with those issues fully, particularly when the argument had been advanced that this issue in some way had some relationship to the South Lebanese Army by the member for Reid, who was hawking this around the press gallery yesterday. Now, let me just uh, deal with the other imputation. Uh, that the member raised about the nature of my decision making. I did actually have the department take out uh, advice for me uh, on my recent decision making in relation, to, uh, in relation to intervention requests under section 345, 351 and 417 from July 2000 until December 2002. Um, and uh, the largest number of interventions were on behalf of Fijians, 123. Um, Lebanese were next at 105, Indonesians at 72, Sri Lanka at 65 and the Philippines at 65. Now, what you, what you have to look at in relation to that decision making um, is that uh, uh, the decisions I take are based upon case by case determination. Um, the numbers will obviously vary from time to time. Member for Brisbane. Um, and uh, you do have uh, areas in which, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, you do have areas, Mr. Speaker, where uh, interventions are more likely um, because of the extent to which uh, people have entered Australia from particular cohorts and overstayed those visas, and over a period of time entered into relationships um, which are likely to prompt a, uh, an intervention request. Uh, finally, let me just say I don't know whether the Labor Party has a fundraising code. Um, but our party does. And uh, the fact is that under that fundraising code, members of parliament are Member at arm's McKellar. length from the Member process. Reed. And I remain at arm's length from that process. I always have. I don't make inquiries in relation to, uh, in relation to donations. I don't make inquiries in relation to uh, outcomes. Um, occasionally, I, I, might, I might see people paying to go into a function. Uh, I may see a raffle, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that can happen. Um, but, but, but let me say uh, what I said yesterday in relation to this matter, because I don't resile from it at all. Um, I said uh, um, I have no knowledge. I do not remember every case that has been raised with me. I think it would be unreasonable to expect that I would, in fact, uh, uh, that, that I would, in view of the fact that you are asserting that it is probably more than a thousand, I will look at the background to it. And I will assess what the situation finally was. Uh, or, or situation was. Finally, let me say that I attend many functions in which people pay to enter, and where people are involved in fundraising activities. The I have no knowledge of the nature of those fundraising activities. I never seek to inquire. I certainly have no knowledge of the sorts of claims that are being made by the honourable member. That situation remains. Um, and uh, it was the situation that it was the answer I gave yesterday. It was a full and complete answer about the, the state of my knowledge.
The question is that the motion be agreed to. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Lawler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I say this issue goes to the heart of the moral legitimacy, or should I say illegitimacy, of the Howard government. The coalition turned the last election campaign into a referendum on who could best maintain the integrity of our immigration system. They won that election after polluting public opinion with what was nothing short of deliberately manufactured lies, and Minister Ruddock knows that from yeah. children overboard. They denigrated and vilified genuine refugees to manipulate public opinion. And now we learn, now we learn, after that election, after children overboard, after CIVEX, that what they've done is they've turned the integrity of our immigration system into their own political and financial plaything. They certainly decide who comes into this country and the circumstances in which they come. They certainly decide that, and it's got a dollar sign attached to it. That's what we know from these events. And I'm going to take you through these events in a way in which Minister Ruddick Lawler. didn't in that incredibly pathetic defence to what are serious allegations. Let's just go through this, Minister. Let's just go through it very carefully. Here's a bloke. Here's a bloke who makes a protection visa application on the 1st of July 1996. He gets knocked back by the department on the 10th of March 1997. He gets knocked back by the Refugee Review Tribunal on the 2nd of April 1997. He gets knocked back by the Federal Court in June 1998. An interested Liberal Member of Parliament, presumably held in some esteem because he's a parliamentary secretary, writes twice. Writes twice, and it gets knocked back both times. And what's Minister Ruddock's case here? Minister Ruddock's case is, oh, two things changed my mind. One was a bishop. Well, I still, I still want to know, Minister, and you didn't answer this. You didn't answer this, and you didn't make it clear in question time. And the only thing that would make it clear is tabling the file. Is when you were first approached by that bishop. Your answer today, your answer today was. 24th of September, and then he wrote on the 27th. But I talk to that bishop all the time. Well, the way of absolutely proving you've had your go, no, Minister, and you Lawler, didn't answer no, this member allegation. For yeah, yeah, yeah. The way of member for Lawler, I have allowed a large number of views, but it is appropriate to address your remarks through the chair. All right, uh, Minister, Minister Ruddy. Uh, no, member, member for Lawler, will resume his seat. No, no, but. but uh, Member for Prospect, just 30 seconds, or even three. The member for Prospect. Point of order, then. You have allowed the minister in this parliament continually to use the word you, and yet you interrupt the member speakers for on our side for doing seat. the same thing. The member for Prospect will resume her seat. That is an outrageous suggestion. I will, in fact, personally run through the Hansard with a yellow pen, indicating the number of times in which I draw the minister's attention to the matter while he was speaking. And I've done the same thing to the member for Lawler. The member for Lawler. The thing that would have answered that allegation about when the bishop the first intervened in this matter would have been tabling the file. Yeah. The only answer that's been given to that is to protect the privacy of this protection visa applicant. Well, we've already got on the Hansard the person's name and the Dimia file number. What more is there to protect? But Minister Ruddock, if you want to give us that file with the name scrubbed out wherever it appears, we'll take that file, Minister Ruddock, and we'll be looking for when the bishop first contacted you. Yeah. But let's assume, let's assume that the version the minister's put is the correct version. Since when did a bishop matter? As the shadow minister for immigration, my office is littered, littered with correspondence from bishops, from priests, from nuns, from rabbis, all of which doesn't make a difference in 417 matters. I've just said to the staff, go and grab the first three, and they've come back with these. We've got. I'll see your bishop and raise you an archbishop. We've got an. <laughs> we've got an arch. We've got an archbishop in Adelaide who's personally intervened on behalf of an Iranian detainee in uh, the Baxter detention centre. I think he is. He's certainly detained. 417 of the Act, and Minister Ruddick doesn't go, oh dear me, an archbishop. I better just go the tick here because that's what I always do when I see a bishop making an, an application. 
He says, uh, how, you know, writes back and says, uh, your request for the exercise of my power was referred to me. However, I've decided not to consider exercising my power under section 417 of the Act. So, so somehow a bishop was the difference in this case, and an archbishop here doesn't make any difference. And then, of course, as honourable members on this side know, there's the East Timorese. There's more yeah, bishops yeah. over the East Timorese matter than there is on the chessboard. I mean, it is completely absurd to say that if you respond to the interventions of church figures, that you wouldn't have already made a positive indication in relation to the East Timorese when every Catholic bishop in Australia—and I note that Minister Rabbit is nodding his head here—he probably knows a little bit about the Catholic Church—every Catholic bishop in Australia has made representations on behalf of the East Timorese. Well, you know, that, 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 that hasn't— oh, well. Well, I tell, tell you something we've guaranteed through this debate. I reckon we've got 1,650 East Timorese people yeah. yeah. guaranteed that. Because you'd look fools if you didn't do that now. You'd look fools if you didn't do that. So we've obviously guaranteed Minister that. Minister. We've already guaranteed Minister. that. Then Minister. All, oh, oh, Minister. Then, then on the intervention of church figures, we've got the Coalition for the Protection of Asylum Seekers who actually say no deportations. Bishop George Browning, uh, the spokesperson for the Federation of Islamic Councils. We've got a nun, Sister Aileen Crow. We've got a, another a uniting church Sister figure, Frances Milne. Of course, Sister Janet Mead. I've forgotten her. She advocates for asylum seekers. We've got a rabbi. None of them, of course, have had positive results when they've made interventions. So since when, Minister, has the intervention of a bishop been the difference? Since when has it been the difference? I reckon if we actually could get some public transparency on your non-reviewable, non-compellable discretion, we would actually find that a church figure intervenes in most of them, and that isn't the difference between you saying yes or you saying no. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through all the correspondence in my office with these church figures, and I'm going to write back to them with the suggestion that next time, instead of sending a letter, they ought to go to a Liberal Party fundraiser because it has better results. Presumably, presumably we'd get a discount for the East Timorese in bulk, so if we get together two or three hundred thousand dollars, we should be right, because that was the difference in this case, not the intervention of the bishop. Then the other thing that the minister says is the difference is having Australian family, and then contends that somehow this only came to his attention on the third 417 matter. Not the first one, not the second no, one, RT but the know. third one. Well, the federal court didn't know. Well, if that version is right, Minister Ruddick, if that version is right, the member for Parramatta is the most incompetent, the most incompetent member the House of Representatives yeah, has yeah, ever yeah. seen. Because, because who, who would put together a letter? Who would go to the Minister for Immigration twice, so interested that he goes twice, without having interviewed the people involved and marshalled every fact in their favour, including Australian family. Yeah. And I know that members here, because they represent very multicultural electorates, I know that many of them do write to you and do seek to see you about these sorts of matters, and when they do, they make sure that they've got every fact. But, Minister Ruddock, if the member for Parramatta is that incompetent, you can prove that today Min once again Lawler. by tabling the file. Once again, by tabling the file. And if you table that file and the, minister, and the member for Parramatta couldn't be bothered putting in the details of people's family circumstances, and Dimia never worked it out, and the RRT never worked it out, and the federal court never worked it out, and the lawyers acting for this bloke never worked it out and never used it as a fact, if that is what you are actually saying, Member Minister Ruddock, which would be extraordinary, truly extraordinary, then prove it by the production of the file. Yeah. The fact that you haven't put the file before this parliament can only inexorably lead to the conclusion that the file doesn't support the case that the bishop was the difference, a contention that really we know from other files is clearly absurd, doesn't support the case that you only came to knew about the family by the third time that you were looking at this matter. It must support the case that you knew about these things earlier. And can I just make an additional point on this? If the ministers on the question of competency, because you know the minister, there's an old saying in, in Australia, the money or the box. Well, I think this motion should be the money or the incompetence. Because if the minister is truly saying 
It took until the four, third 417 for him to become apprised of the basic facts of this matter, then what he is saying to the Australian community is he weighs in his hands matters that could go to life and death because that's what can happen if people are returned in bad circumstances overseas. He weighs in his hands matters going to life and death without having taken the opportunity to inform himself of the simplest facts that relate to them. So if that is really your case, the money or the Senator incompetence, I, my, I, I'm still barracking for the money, but the only, alternate, <laughs> the only alternate case is gross incompetence, incompetence by the member for Parramatta and by you, because why would you be dealing with a matter as serious as whether a person who has claimed persecution can stay in this country without having got every fact, every fact before you and having weighed it. So you, you stand condemned either way and this censure should be carried either way. But as I say, I am still barracking for the money. Why am I still barracking for the money? Because we know there was a fundraiser. That hasn't been denied. We know Minister Ruddick was at the fundraiser. That hasn't been denied. Uh, he's clearly conferred with a ministerial colleague about the fundraiser. We suspect that to be Minister Abbott, so Minister Abbott was there. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, there were other members of parliament there, or at least one other member of parliament there. We know $22,000 was raised. Uh, now, Mr Speaker, I presume you're above fundraising because of uh, the high office you hold. Uh, but for those of us who engage in fundraising, we know $22,000 isn't a bad haul on a night for a fundraiser <laughs> at a Lebanese restaurant called Romeo's. Uh, I'll, I'll have a quiz night in my electorate tomorrow night and let me tell you I'll be lucky to walk away with $2,200, not $22,000. That's the way that political party fundraising goes when you've got a dinner here and a plate of dips there and a raffle to follow. We, we all know that's how it goes. $22,000 raised at a night at Romeo's restaurants. That's not denied. That's not denied. And also what isn't denied or guaranteed at no point has the minister actually come in here and said, I guarantee that no money was donated to the Liberal Party on behalf of this protection visa applicant. That's I right. guarantee that. Well, you, you guarantee the Leader that. of the Opposition. Well, why not? Uh, ma Member for Lawler will address her remarks through the chair. Uh, rhetorically, Painful as it may be, you should be having eye contact with the chair, not with the oh. Minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Member for Lawler. It, it'll be my pleasure, Mr. Speaker. It'll be my pleasure. Right. Can I say to you rhetorically, Mr. Speaker, if, if, the, if, the case, if the case was that no money had been donated to the Liberal Party on behalf of this protection visa applicant, then you would expect a minister subject to a censure motion to walk in and say that. I mean, after all, we've got this censure motion because the government actually thought it was all a good idea at the time. <laughs> well, if it was all a good idea at the time, I know what I would have wanted if I was Minister for Immigration. I would have wanted a file that I could table that completely exculpated me from every allegation made, and I would have been able to want to, would have wanted to walk into here and say, I guarantee 100 per cent no money was donated on behalf of this visa applicant to the Liberal Party. That hasn't happened. And the minister, of course, your guarantee? the minister, of course, guarantee? overnight. <laughs> it, it, I don't know who's uh, responding next for the government, but perhaps the person <laughs> responding next for the government uh, can, actu member, can actually give that Rankin. guarantee. He might have been at the dinner. Who's at the dinner? The, these allegations were raised in this place yesterday, properly, properly, and I resent any implication that they weren't raised properly, because we are entitled, as the opposition in this country, to be assured that the visa allocation system is working properly. Yeah, yeah. We are, we're actually concerned about the integrity of the migration system. We're actually concerned about queue jumping on this side of the House. So on that basis, we raised matters properly going to the integrity of the visa allocation system and queue jumping yesterday. They were related to a Liberal Party fundraiser. The minister involved and the member involved, whose fundraiser it was, have had overnight to confer. If you were able to 100 per cent rule out the making of a donation, well, rhetorically, Mr Speaker, I ask you, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? And it hasn't been done. Yeah, yeah. Can I conclude by saying this? We've got a man who, on the third occasion in front of the minister, gets a visa. We know that there was a donation made in between. 
the two, two, uh, Kate, two uh, issues advanced by the minister don't stack up on a proper examination, and there's been no objective backing of them by tabling the file. Well, if you want to answer this allegation, get the file out and make the guarantee. Otherwise, we are entitled to conclude, and people listening to this debate are entitled to conclude, that there is something here that, Minister, that, something here that smells and should worry them greatly Minister, about the integrity of Australia's migration system. This is the political Minister, party that says we decide to, who comes to this country in the circumstances in which they come. What's the price? Order. Yeah. Yeah. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the House, Minister for Employment uh, and Workplace Mr. Relations. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member for, the member, the member for Lawler has said, uh, she has said that uh, uh, the gentleman in question, or someone on his behalf, uh, went to a fundraiser, made a $3,000 donation and said, this donation is on behalf of the gentleman in question and he expects a visa. I guarantee that that did not happen. I guarantee that that did not happen. Nothing like that ever happens. Nothing like that ever happens at Liberal Party fundraisers and nothing like that should ever happen at any political party fundraiser. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I can understand, I can understand uh, why the member for Reid did not move this censure motion yesterday. I can understand why the member for Reid uh, was unwilling to move this censure motion today uh, until forced to by the House because, Mr Speaker, the member for Reid is incapable of moving a censure motion. He's incapable of moving a censure motion because he has no evidence, no evidence whatsoever upon which a censure motion should be based. Mr Speaker, I suppose the first point that the member for Reid made uh, was that the gentleman in question uh, should never have been let in. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, he must be the only person who's ever applied to come to Australia who members opposite don't think should have been let in. Mr Speaker, the members opposite are the people uh, who believe that anyone who gets here should be able to stay here. They're the people who want to see an open door immigration policy being run by Australia. But Mr Speaker, the other point that the, the member, member for Reid tried to make tried to make that member you can't Blackstone. have a fundraiser uh, without uh, cash changing hands and ministers watching. That's the, that's the claim uh, that, 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 that members opposite are making, that there is no such thing as a party political fundraiser without scads and scads of cash changing hands, probably not even in brown paper envelopes, and ministers watch all this. And ministers are advised the of exactly for what Swan each bit of warned. cash is for. Well, that is an utterly absurd allegation. It is a contemptible allegation, and it should never be made, never be made without without evidence. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, the next uh, the next claim that is uh, that is clear in the member for Reid's censure motion is that no one ever comes to a fundraiser without seeking corrupt favours. Well, again. This is smearing every single person who has ever been to a party political fundraiser. This idea that it's impossible to go to a fundraiser without seeking a corrupt favour is simply wrong, simply and utterly false, Mr Speaker, and it demeans this I warn the member and it demeans for the member for Reid and, most of all, it demeans the Leader of the Opposition that he should have been party to this pathetic effort. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, members opposite I have the member for Werriwa for the have, third time. Have speculated. Um, Mr. I, I have already interrupted the member for Werriwa for his interrupt. Member for Macmillan is warned. Mr. Mr. Speaker, minister has the Mr. Call. Speaker, members opposite have speculated uh, that I may have been the other minister at the fundraiser in question. Mr. Speaker, to put them out of their agony, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to let them to put their minds at ease, I am prepared to say, Mr. Speaker, yes. I was at the fundraiser in question. The fundraiser in question uh, took place uh, sometime uh, not, too, not too long before the last election. Uh, it took place at Romeo's restaurant. Uh, there was about 50 or 60 people there, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't know whether the gentleman in question was there. Uh, and I don't know whether the gentleman who is alleged to be the friend of the gentleman the member for in Watson. question was there. Mr Speaker, I don't and know the member uh, who made uh, donations 
Uh, I don't know uh, whether particular raffles were raised. I don't know whether particular auctions might have taken place. I don't know, and the Minister for Immigration wouldn't know either. I didn't know how much money was raised uh, until I read about it in the newspaper, and the member and, and the Minister for Immigration likewise wouldn't know how much money was raised uh, until uh, he read about it in the newspaper. Mr. Speaker, the truth is, as you would know, that Liberal members of Parliament are governed by a strict a code of conduct, and amongst many other things, the code of conduct says uh, that members of parliament uh, should, should, not, should not solicit uh, donations and should not handle donations. It's a very good code of conduct, and I would commend it to members opposite. I would commend it to members opposite, and I would suggest to members opposite that they should not think that ministers in this government and members of parliament in this coalition act by the same sort of standards, which are obviously only too common, only too common in the Labor Party, a Labor Party which is regularly asking people to spend $1,500 or more uh, to come to dinners, to come to dinners, so that they might get to know ministers, Mr. Speaker. This is an absurd, an absurd suggestion that members opposite are trying to make. Now, Mr. Speaker. Let's again review uh, what the member for Reid uh, has been has been saying. Well, uh, he's been saying he's been saying uh, that the gentleman in question, uh, the visa applicant, uh, was at the fundraiser in question. Uh, well, he's presented no evidence, no evidence whatsoever. Uh, he has said that a donation was made uh, by this gentleman or by someone on behalf of this gentleman. No evidence has been presented. Uh, no evidence whatsoever. I mean, is there a stat deck anywhere? Is there a stat deck of someone else? Uh, uh, is uh, uh, there, a, there a report anywhere about this? There is no evidence whatsoever. It is just a disgusting, a disgusting and dirty, grubby fishing expedition by a, the member for Reid, who should know better. And then finally, and then finally, and then finally, the member for Reid has alleged that a corrupt decision was made. Well, again, Mr Speaker, not one shred, not one scary, not one scrap of evidence has been produced to justify this grubby, dirty, unworthy, disgusting smear on a good minister. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker let's consider, let's consider uh, the, the censure motion, the censure motion uh, that the member for Reid put before the House. This House, he said, censures the minister for failing to adequately explain to the House the alleged new information that he relied upon to approve the visa application. That is, that is almost embarrassingly weak, Mr Speaker. He has no evidence that the gentleman in question was there. Uh, he has no evidence that the friend of the gentleman in question was there. He has no evidence that a donation was made. He has no evidence that conditions were placed on a donation because uh, no such donation would ever be accepted. And he has no evidence that a corrupt decision was made. So he's reduced to coming into this House and censuring the minister uh, because he's failed to adequately explain himself. Mr Speaker, this is one of the worst and the weakest censure motions that has been moved in this House for a very long time. The member for Reid has fallen into the, fallen into the trap uh, that we laid for him, Mr Speaker, because we on this side knew that there was nothing whatsoever to justify the outrageous smears and the imputations that the member for Reid, egg egged on by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, was making. Uh, Mr Speaker, what in the end is the crime uh, of the Minister for Immigration? Uh, the first crime uh, is that he listens to representations. Well, why shouldn't the Minister for Immigration listen to representations? He's a member of parliament. Why shouldn't he listen uh, to other members of parliament? And let's face it, he gets representations. In this case, he had representations by, amongst other people, the member for Kingsford Smith. Why shouldn't he have listened to those representations? And why shouldn't he have listened to the representations finally made uh, by the bishop in question? The other crime of the Minister for Immigration is that he is close uh, to a community. Well, Mr Speaker, he is the Minister for Immigration. He is the Minister for Multicultural and Ethnic Affairs. Why shouldn't he be close? 
to a community. In fact, it would be a tragedy uh, if a minister of the Crown in this country was not able to get close uh, to important communities. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there has been nothing whatsoever done wrong by this minister. More importantly, there has been nothing whatsoever demonstrated by members opposite that this minister has done anything wrong. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, I will, uh, I will, I will say to the House, uh, there has uh, at times been corruption uh, in the administration of the immigration system, and a colleague of members opposite is now in jail. Is now in jail. Uh, because of that, Mr Speaker. The former member for Corwell is now in jail uh, because, because of things that, Minister, that, that happened but Minister, shouldn't happen. Minister, Mr Speaker, the whole point, member for where the I whole point, the whole Minister point, has raised an issue that the clerk has reminded me is subject to appeal I'm, and therefore ought not to have been raised. OK. I, 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 cert I, I certainly, member for, I certainly, I member certainly for Batman would not when I'm assisting the debate in the sense of the flow of the debate properly frustrates the role of the chair. Mem the minister has the call I, to be heard I in silence. I certainly, would not I certainly would not wish, Mr Speaker, uh, to say anything that trespassed on any of the standing orders. But, so, Mr Speaker, I, I will not continue down that path. But, Mr Speaker, the fact is, the fact is Mr. Speaker, that this minister, when he came into office, was determined to clean up the administration of the immigration system, and that is precisely what he has done. I know the minister. Members of this house know the minister, and any members of this house who have dealt with the minister would accept, should accept, if they're prepared to give credit where it's due, that this minister has been probably the most outstanding minister for immigration of recent times. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister for Immigration has made abundantly clear, uh, he acted because new representations were made, uh, new evidence and new information was provided. Well, why shouldn't he do precisely what he did on the basis of precisely what has happened in this case? Uh, the position of members opposite appears to be that just because some uh, representations are refused, all representations are refused, and if some representations uh, are refused, any representation that isn't refused is somehow corrupt. It is a pathetic and a hopeless I allegation. For it's well. completely unworthy of members opposite, and it's certainly it's completely unworthy of a leader of the opposition who's pledged to raise standards. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that this is a grubby fishing expedition. Uh, it is clear. Uh, it is clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, that they have no evidence. Uh, in the end, in the end, all they could say was that, well, uh, the Minister for Immigration should have known about something uh, before he finally did know, again, know about something. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not the Minister for Immigration's fault uh, if people uh, who are making representations on behalf of someone uh, don't initially or even subsequently produce all the evidence that they might be able to to justify that case. When they finally did produce the evidence, the minister acted uh, as he should. Then uh, the, uh, the member for Lawler suggested uh, that uh, unless, unless uh, uh, the Minister for Immigration uh, was prepared to produce the file, uh, that would prove that there was a confidential file a confidential file dealing with people's lives, uh, that there would be somehow proof of corruption. Well, the suggestion uh, that every decision that is not justified by the production to a feral opposition of the complete file is just absolutely, utterly and completely absurd. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker it's pretty clear that what we have seen over the last couple of days is an exercise in mudslinging, a sad and unworthy exercise in mudslinging uh, designed uh, to prop up the failing leadership uh, of the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, this is his muscle-up strategy, Mr Speaker. Uh, he tried the member for Lilly. Uh, the member for Lilly, uh, a man of some honour, uh, had some standards that he wouldn't transgress, so he said, OK, OK, let's bring in the member for Werriwa. Let's have a muscle-up strategy, and that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, the words might be the member for Reeds, uh, the words might be the Leader of the Opposition's, but the ideas and the grubby gutter tactics are nothing 
but the member for Wera was a, a man who just can't not wait to pull his knife out of the sheet of the and shove it in the Wera back Wera of the Lord Leader of the Opposition. Mr Lilly. Speaker, an unworthy Speaker. motion from an unworthy opposition. This is an opposition that knows doesn't know where it stands, doesn't know where it stands, doesn't know what it believes in. Uh, it's now wracked uh, by a fight to the death between two proven, proven failures. And Mr. Speaker, I move as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting the following words: the House censures the member for Reid for attempting unsuccessfully to conduct a campaign of innuendo, imputation, and smear against the Minister for Immigration, and failing to substantiate his claims when compelled to do so by the House. I commend that amendment to the House. The question now is: there was a question of. Member for Batman on a point I think of order. I, I, on a point of order, Mr. Speaker, I thought I heard you requesting that the minister withdraw some unsavoury and uncomplimentary, un-Australian remarks. The, the, Is the that true, Mr. The Speaker? Member for Batman, resume his seat. The member for Batman. Order, Mem Minister. <laughs> the member for Batman is right that there were words. The member for Batman is right that there were words uttered that I felt. Um, were inappropriate. I didn't require their withdrawal. I drew the minister's attention to the fact that the motion of censure, which does allow a little more latitude than normal, was a motion of censure of the Minister for Immigration, not a motion of censure of either the member for Werra or the member for Lilly, which seemed to me to be reasonably addressing what was an inappropriate remark on his part. The question is, uh, uh, the original question was that the motion be agreed to. This, the Honourable the Leader of the House, has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words be omitted stand part of the question. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The clerk, the clerk has just suggested that, for the convenience of the House, I might, I should restate what I have just said. The original question was that the motion be agreed to. To this, the Leader of the House has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I just confer the clerk. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells. Standing orders still apply during a division. Treasurer, Leader of the Opposition.
Luka. Lock the doors. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tell us for the nose, and the honourable members for Franklin and Melbourne Ports tell us for the eyes. Porter, the result of the division is I 61, no 78. The question is therefore negative. The question now is that the words proposed to be substituted be so substituted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Is a division required? 
Ring the bells for one minute. Members would please quickly take their seats. <clears throat> Lock the doors. The question is that the words proposed to be substituted be so substituted. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee Tellers for the eyes, the honourable members for Franklin and Melbourne Ports Tellers for the nose. Provision is I 78, no 62. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, is the division required? Ring the bells for one minute. I just remind anyone leaving the chamber they should report to the tellers. Lock the doors.
question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. This is a one-minute division. Point the same tellers as in the previous division. Order. The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 89. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Prime Minister. We ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister. The member for we on a point of order. For I think you'll find Mr. seconds for it. I think you'll find, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Reid is halfway through asking a question in the House. You asked him before the censure yeah. motions to reframe his question and put it to the Minister for Immigration. Surely it is inappropriate, surely it is inappropriate to ask for further questions to be placed on the notice paper when the member for Reid hasn't had an opportunity to finish the question. Let me indicate to the, the member House. for Awarewa that I am absolutely certain that if he rummages through the hand sides over the weekend, he will find absolutely no exception has been made by this particular decision. And as it is 4.30 pm, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Stirling. On indulgent, Mr Speaker, um, I'd like to understand the Order 150. No, no, I'm sorry. I apologise, Member for Stirling. This matter will have to be taken up next week. The question before the Chair right now is the House do now adjourn. I have the impression that the Member for Beniathan is very keen to participate in that debate. The Member for Beniathan. Member for Benithan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, a week or so ago, the government arranged. The member for Benithan has the call. What? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a week or so ago, the government arranged in Broome for a conference to be held, an international conference, in fact, on the future of the hydrogen economy, uh, particularly in Australia. But of course, uh, with international speakers present, it also touched on the hydrogen economy internationally. Now, I, for one, have been following the future of the hydrogen economy on a global context for many years, in fact, uh, roughly two decades now, because I have long felt that the hydrogen economy at a global level has a very significant future to play, uh, mainly, of course, uh, in the first instance for Western economies, but ult ultimately for the planet as a whole. Now, many members may be uh, unfamiliar with the hydrogen economy, but the reality is that as uh, we, over the next uh, three or four decades, uh, and it will take that long, find the pressure increasingly placed uh, not only on the environment but also on uh, particularly petroleum products uh, and the availability at a reasonable price of those petroleum products, we will need to look to alternative uh, fuel sources and alternative ways of using fuels. Now, of course, air pollution is an issue and greenhouse is an issue. And hydrogen uh, not only is the number one element on the periodic table, is also the lightest element, but is also a very significant store of energy. Hydrogen is perhaps one of the highest value stores of energy that we have available to us in the form of a fuel which we can readily transport around, not only in gaseous form but also in liquid form. And hydrogen can also be burnt in the internal combustion engines, which are particularly adapted for that purpose. It can also be burnt, if I can use that in inverted commas, in an engine in the form of a fuel cell uh, and therefore drive a fuel cell which itself generates electricity and uh, powers electric uh, vehicles or other forms of stationary electric uh, motors. 
Now, of course, hydrogen can also be transported readily, uh, not only, as I've said, in the liquid and gaseous form, but also, uh, given enough research, it can also be absorbed by solids in the form of hydrides and possibly, uh, given further research, other uh, solid forms and uh, can be readily used in transportation. When it is burnt uh, in this context, either in an internal combustion engine or a fuel cell, it of course uh, gives off no other pollution than simply water vapour. It does not emit uh, any carbon dioxide. It doesn't emit any other pollutants such as uh, nitrous oxides or sulphur dioxides. And of course, therefore, it is the ultimate uh, fuel in that context. Um, of course, uh, the, uh, con the, the real difficulties which were identified uh, not only in the original discussions on the hydrogen economy, but also were uh, further identified at the recent conference, which I might say was particularly successful, uh, were the issues of the economics of deriving hydrogen. Unfortunately, while we can readily obtain um, from, uh, from the uh, uh, LNG uh, deposits which we have off our coast in the North West Shelf and in other locations, and of course the massive coal deposits which Australia and other countries have, uh, we can effectively mine our fossil fuels. We cannot mine hydrogen. There are no uh, available sources of hydrogen on the planet other than those which we derive by converting fossil fuels into hydrogen, but of course then we have CO2 to deal with, or alternatively we can, uh, we can obtain hydrogen by the electrolysis of water, but uh, that requires substantial amounts of energy, which can only be obtained from fossil fuels or from uh, uh, from nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear fuels or from um, solar or wind energy. But of course the cost of those uh, remains quite high, except in special cases, as my colleague highlights, uh, such as Tasmania, um, where there are competitively priced uh, products available. Now those uh, are significant areas of research which are yet to be undertaken. But this was uh, a conference about the future, the short-term future, the medium-term future and the long-term future. And I think we should see the hydrogen economy in all of those contexts. Hydrogen is a long-term future prospect and we should take it seriously. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The um, Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to rise this evening uh, and, surprisingly, continue in a similar vein to my uh, colleague, the member for Benython. Uh, the, uh, the conference uh, referred to in my electorate uh, of Kalgoorlie, taking place in Broome last week, uh, was truly a, an historic step uh, in what I believe will be a move by uh, this government and future governments of uh, Australia to adopt hydrogen as the basis of their economy rather than the existing economy as it stands today being based on uh, fossil fuels. The process of conversion of water to hydrogen and oxygen simply requires electricity. And that electricity can be produced by a number of means. One of the ways of producing electricity, of course, is to burn a fossil fuel. The result of that is the further contamination of the atmosphere with what we refer to today as greenhouse gases. Another way of producing electricity, of course, is to use tidal energy to harness the tides, tides which in the Kimberley run to 11.8 metres, to harness those tides in a way that electricity is produced and then, with the use of that electricity, produce hydrogen by converting water to both hydrogen and oxygen. The release of oxygen into the atmosphere, of course, further enhances the atmosphere of this planet, but the hydrogen produced can be dealt with thereafter in many, many ways. It can be liquefied and shipped by land or sea in, uh, in compressed state. It can be put into a uh, pipeline under compression and reticulated around Australia. And uh, perhaps members would be interested to know that there already exists in this country a reticulation of gas pipelines that with minimal addition would see hydrogen produced 
in the Kimberley, northwest of Western Australia, could be transported to southeastern Australia, where, of course, we have the majority of industry based and the majority of population living. Hydrogen, if it is produced with renewable energy, non polluting renewable energy, becomes truly the fuel of mobility for the future of this planet, because it is truly non-polluting. Non-polluting at the point of manufacture, creation, non-polluting at its end use in motor vehicles. Those motor vehicles, if utilising hydrogen as an energy source and converting that hydrogen through fuel cells into electricity to drive motors within the vehicle to, to give mobility, that, uh, that process creates no byproduct de deleterious at all. It produces only water. Just as you put electricity into water to produce oxygen and hydrogen, so when you combine hydrogen and oxygen from the atmosphere, you produce electricity and water. It is truly a breakthrough. It is not then a question of if we can adopt hydrogen as a fuel of mobility for the future and, in fact, base our economy on hydrogen. It is not a question of if. It is simply a question of when. Jules Verne referred to hydrogen as an energy source for mobility all of those decades ago in his futuristic writings. And it is not surprising that we will move we will move to a hydrogen economy. We will take up the opportunity to use hydrogen as a fuel of mobility because it is non-polluting and because we need to exist in a, on a planet that does not pollute its atmosphere. And I am so proud to be associated with a government that took the move of holding a conference on hydrogen so as we can now make the first step towards an economy based on that fuel of mobility of the future. For Ballarat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In this adjournment, I wish to add my voice to those of the Ballarat arts community, students and staff of the University of Ballarat in protesting the University Council's decision to close the theatre production course. This course is one of only two theatre production degree courses in Victoria and the only one in regional Victoria. It is a course whose students enjoy a high employment rate on graduation. Well-trained production teams are the backbone of performing arts. The students are not just part of the University of Ballarat, they are part of the, the, part of the arts community throughout the whole of Ballarat. They assist not only in theatre production for university productions, but also for the many theatre companies that exist in Ballarat, and they also participate in the staging of the Begonia Festival that we hold each year. The closure of the course is somewhat ironic, given that the Minister for Education only opened the brand new campus that the course sits on in 2002. The Minister at the time of the opening rightly pointed out that the importance of all the arts to the Ballarat community. The Camp Street precinct on which the theatre production course is started was created especially for the thriving performing and visual arts in my community. The university received generous funding from the state and federal governments, as well as local council, as well as donations from many local uh, business communities, in order to build it as a, a high standard theatre production and theatre precinct for the community. A major reason given for the course closure was lack of funding for perceived low enrolment figures of the course. Ironically, the numbers of students entering the course have been steadily rising. The new Arts Academy was to attract more students internationally, regionally and from around Australia. Is this simply the first of many courses to be rationalised as the incentives and numbers for fee-paying students grow? The university, one would think, would take a proactive approach to the advertising and promotion of the course, and perhaps this is one of the reasons that the course has, uh, has had a, a decline in some of its numbers in recent times. The university commissioned a confidential report, despite there having been a review of the arts faculty and there currently being no head of the arts faculty, and that also currently being under advertisement. I would have thought that the new head of the arts faculty would probably like to have some input into any decisions regarding course closures. The report was, I understand, finalised in February, some two and a half months ago, 
and uh, the decision to actually close the course was, uh, took two and a half months. It was taken in camera and uh, the University Council announced that decision on 5 May. No input to this report was sought from the university students, staff or the local community or the union. No consultation of staff, students or the local community or the union was undertaken in the period of time between the report being made available and the decision. On Thursday, the 8th of May, the university engaged the services of six security guards to assist the faculty to inform the, the faculty and university management in counselling students and staff about the phasing out of the course. If this is an example of the type of industrial relations the Minister for Education thinks is appropriate and wishes to encourage through his new university package, well, frankly, he can stick it. Ballarat University has had to engage in over-enrolment in order to survive the savage cuts of this government. The University of Melbourne may have the luxury of charging $150,000 for a degree under the minister's new higher education package, but the University of Ballarat will not have such luxury. In order for it to be on a firm financial footing, it, uh, it will not be able to charge the high fees that Brendan, uh, the minister seems to think is appropriate. The university has stated that in defending its decision that uh, the course was under-enrolled and that current students will be, uh, be accommodated. It fails to understand that it is not just about current students. It is about future students and the role they play in participating in the arts community in Ballarat. Honourable Member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Like my friend, the member from Bonython and the member for Kalgoorlie, I also attended the Hydrogen Economy Conference. Hydrogen can, can be produced from plant material, which is biomass, fossil fuels and from water by electrolysis. Biomass and fossil fuel production of hydrogen produces carbon as a byproduct, which requires sequestration. Using renewable, non-polluting energy to produce hydrogen from water economically would solve our problem of carbon production. Hydrogen can be used in liquid form and fuel combustion engines, such as BMW's new hybrid motor engines, where both petrol and hydrogen can be used. As WA has fuel cell buses to be delivered next year and partly federally funded, I would like to focus on hydrogen fuel cells. The first fuel cell demonstrated was by lawyer come inventor William Grove in 1839, where water was electrolyzed into hydrogen and oxygen with an electric current. He proved that when electrolysis was reversed, the hydrogen and oxygen recombined and produced an electric current, hence our ability to store and release electricity when required. This original fuel cell was based around an acid electrolyte with a cathode and anode. At the anode, the hydrogen gas ionises, releasing electrons and creating H plus ions or protons. At the cathode end, oxygen reacts with electrons taken from the anode and hydrogen ions from the acid electrolyte to form water, the residue of the process. The electrolyte must only allow the hydrogen ions or protons to pass through it and not the electrons, which are needed to travel through an external circuit to power an electric motor with a direct current of electron flow. There are many different fuel cell types with different electrolytes all result in an exothermic heat-releasing reaction. The two main problems, leaving aside cost, is the slow reaction rate in the fuel cell leading to low currents and power, and the fact that hydrogen, as already stated, is not readily and cheaply available. The proton exchange membrane, or PEM fuel cell, was used in the first manned spacecraft. The alkaline fuel cell was used on the Apollo and shuttle orbiter craft. A trial of three hydrogen power fuel cell buses will be commissioned in Perth, Western Australia in 2004. The hydrogen gas supplied by BP, the buses by Daimler Chrysler and powered by Ballard Power Systems. Murdoch University will carry out evaluation on the project. The 250 kilowatt fuel cell powered buses delivers approximately 200 kilowatt net shaft power. They will have approximately 200 kilometres of range and up to 80 kilometres per hour speed. These are PEM fuel cells. Mr Speaker, a spokesperson at the Hydrogen Energy Conference gave an estimate that by continuing our reliance on coal, 
petroleum and natural gas that as much as seven trillion US dollars per annum damage may be being caused in environmental degradation as well as defence costs securing the supply of these fuels. This may help in understanding the need to continue the vital research of the area of the hydrogen economy. Already in Western Australia, Hydrogen Technology Limited has registered patents in major countries for our first multifunctional welding and cutting system using this hydrogen patented electrolysis fuel cell. It is. It is hoped in the future to reduce diesel fuel consumption by 10 per cent and diesel emissions by using hybrid systems with the same type of fuel cell. It is essential that we pursue the partnerships with the US and the EU in hydrogen economy policy and research. Here, here. Thank you. One from Maribyrnong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last Friday I visited the Melbourne Air Mail Transit Centre fairly close to T Melbourne Airport in company with John Brown, the State Secretary of the Posts and Telecom branch of the CEPU. This is a facility jointly operated by Australia Post, Aquis and Customs. It's a facility that deals with very large volumes indeed of overseas mail items and packages and the like, so it's fairly obvious uh, that given the new emphasis that we as a society need to give to issues such as security uh, and issues such as uh, safety from imported uh, uh, products that will not be of the welfare of the Australian community, it's clear that this is a very vital function indeed. I have to say that having visited the facility, it is simply inadequate for the task that it carries out. Uh, it is overcrowded, it is difficult working conditions, and it's frankly only by the goodwill of the workforce there uh, that it continues to operate. The claim is made that it successfully screens 100 per cent of items coming through presently, uh, but that's simply not sustainable into the future. By way of illustration of the sort of item that comes through periodically, uh, I'm told that over the last couple of months, the last month, there have been two incidents. Uh, where explosives have been detected. Uh, a live grenade was detected. Uh, there are situations where uh, fake, fortunately, fortunately fake anthrax uh, uh, comes through the, uh, through the system. I'm told at around about two items a month these days, although in the past somewhat larger. And there's a range of items like spiders and millipedes and snakes that are, are periodically detected. The working environment, as I said, is extremely difficult. Uh, you have a situation where what's required is a purpose-built facility where a threat, having been identified, can be sealed off and properly dealt with. That doesn't exist at the present time. You have a situation where staff are crowded into a relatively small area, where there's continual conflict between vehicles, particularly trucks and forklifts, moving in and around the facility, people and dogs. Uh, you've got a situation where a hazardous waste bin just sits uh, at the door. Uh, you've got a situation where I believe there are serious animal welfare issues because the dogs that are such an important part of the Aquas service and the custom service are, handled, uh, are housed in extremely cramped conditions at the back of a van or alternatively are put in an exposed uh, kennel outside uh, where they're exposed to all the elements. This area, the, the fact that uh, this facility is off-site from Melbourne Airport is a problem because it means that uh, items uh, that are potentially dangerous have to be transported partly through a residential area in order to get them to the screening facility uh, for testing. Now, why is it that this situation is allowed to continue uh, in an environment where we are, or are, as a society, much more security aware and much more aware of safety issues? Well, the federal government has in fact announced and made provision in budgets for funds to in fact create a purpose-built facility on the site, of, uh, on Melbourne Airport site itself, to handle the large volumes of items that are coming into Melbourne. However, the process is being derailed by the ideological zealotry of the Minister for Workplace Relations. Uh, the Minister apparently claims that the, uh, uh, the company, the preferred company to construct the, uh, the purpose-built uh, facility, in fact, uh, has a building agreement that doesn't comply with the National Code of Building Practice. Apparently, the sin of the, uh, the building agreement the minister objects to is that it uh, makes adequate provision for allowances and superannuation and redundancy and safety for building workers. The minister obviously doesn't like that because he's prepared to put in jeopardy uh, the safety and security of Australians 
uh, at this difficult time by refusing to allow work to proceed uh, on, uh, on a purpose-built facility to address these problems. Frankly, uh, as I said, the facility is at the moment is inadequate, it's crowded, it's inefficient because items need to be double handled, and the minister ought to wake up to himself, himself and put the interests of Australians first rather than his own ideological crusade. I've sought the leave of the duty minister, the member for McEwen, and with the permission, therefore, of the House, I will recognise the member for Shortland. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I wish to make a personal explanation. Does the member for Shortland claim to have been misrepresented? Yes, I do, Mr Speaker. The member for Shortland may proceed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I claim to have been misrepresented on three occasions last night by the member for Dobell in this House in, a, in an adjournment speech. Uh, number one was where he talked about the a statement by Mr Barry Cohen saying that Labor members is made up of members without any real world experience, ex-union officials, ex-staffers, ex-lawyers, and then goes on to, to attribute me to that group. In actual fact, I've worked in numerous clerical positions, both in the public and private sector, small business. I've been an employment yeah. counsellor, a rehabilitation counsellor. Yeah. I've lectured Mr. casually Mr. at university. Shorten, I've worked in the hospitality industry, and I've been a mother of three Mr. children. Mr. Shorten will resume her seat. Uh, well, they have to be much more crisp, I may indicate, Mr. <laughs> Shorten, you can't advance yeah. an argument. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The second occasion. Uh, was uh, where in the same speech uh, the member for Doe Bell uh, attributed remarks to me that I, that I said that it was a substation uh, at Wyong and, and then goes on to say there's, that substations are for electricity, not uh, for telecommunications. I would like to table both the statement I made in the parliament and the media release that. Uh, I sent out to the local media, which demonstrates That's fully fine. that I can say day. that, that, that those comments should be attributed to me. Uh, the third point was the, minister, uh, the member for Doe Bell uh, said it was absolutely the, um, that I denigrated the, eff the efforts of technical experts that work to repair it. At, once again, I refer to those uh, items I've, I've placed before the parliament. I at no time denigrated workers. Rather, I argued that there should be more workers for and that the problem is now was arguing with the a network. case and has indicated where she's been Thank misrepresented. The question is, uh, is leave granted for the papers to be tabled? Leave is granted. The question is, the House to now join the Honourable Member Solomon. Yeah, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to speak on the, uh, the subject of uh, the hydrogen economy. But before I do that, uh, my attention has been drawn uh, to our very wonderful uh, Minister for Defence. And, uh, and uh, having seen the minister, it, uh, it has reminded me that today is, uh, is the anniversary of the Sandak and Death March uh, in 1945, uh, where a number of Allied uh, prisoners of war. Uh, perished under the Japanese control, and I think it's uh, it's very worthwhile remembering uh, uh, some of the things that uh, previous Australians have done for our freedom. But uh, on the subject of the uh, hydrogen economy, I uh, like uh, the member for Beniathan, the member uh, for Kalgoorlie, and the member for Moore also attended the uh, the conference uh, in the beautiful uh, northwest of uh, northwestern Australia in per in uh, sorry in Broome. Uh, and a very uh, wonderful conference that it was too. The thing that struck me most, uh, Mr Speaker, was the, uh, the correlation between energy production and population. Uh, the more energy that the world produces, uh, the less the population uh, grows and, uh, in, in actual fact, population uh, reduces. Uh, we don't notice it so much in Australia, but uh, population uh, uh, Blowouts are a major problem around the rest of the world, and I think uh, anything that can be done to reduce uh, the population uh, and uh, and create uh, uh, surety for the long-term uh, uh, stability of the human race is a good thing. And uh, so it was uh, it was very uh, enlightening to be uh, informed about what can be done with hydrogen and uh, and in producing energy uh, as. The members previous to me have, uh, have said uh, hydrogen can be produced in a number of ways, and, uh, and I note uh, 
The big tides that they have in uh, northwest Western Australia is, is one way that they are looking at it. Uh, I come from a resource-rich part of the, of the world. Uh, recently, um, we've had Minister Downer sign off on the Timor Sea Gas Treaty. And, uh, and the area that I'm from, uh, very close to our north, are some large gas reserves. And gas uh, is one way of producing hydrogen. And uh, uh, what happens is, of course, gas uh, gives off uh, greenhouse emissions, but that is sequestered into the ground. It crystallises and stays there for centuries. Um, in this regard, I, uh, I see that uh, not only uh, uh, is hydrogen uh, a renewable energy, but it, it extends the lifetime of our of our gas resources and provide security for the Australian energy reserves that we do have uh, for much longer down the track. Um, I don't see that they are a competing uh, energy source. In actual fact, I see them as very, very complementary. Uh, I endorse the sentiments uh, expressed by the member for Beniathan, the member for Moore and the member for Kalgoorlie, and I, uh, and I support uh, the efforts of this country to embark on uh, creating a hydrogen economy. Yeah. Simon, the question is the House to now adjourn. The Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to respond to the comment by the member for Solomon. Yes. The Minister for Veterans Affairs, in fact, uh, simply needs to um, seek the opportunity to, to require the debate to be extended. And I assume that's what she's about to do. I seek that the debate be extended. Mr. And uh, the debate will be extended until 5:10 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Solomon for raising this important issue today, because of all the days that we as Australians set aside to remember and to honour the sacrifice of our sons and daughters in the service of our nation, this day stands alone. Today marks an anniversary unlike any other in our wartime history. Throughout the year, Australians gather in the spirit of remembrance on days that mark victories and defeats, significant battles and days of peace. But this day stands alone. On this day in 1945, about 530 Australian and British prisoners of war left Sandakan, prisoner of war camp in Borneo, on a forced march to Renau. They were the second group of prisoners to be moved. Another 455 had marched out in January as the Japanese emptied the camp ahead of the expected Allied landing in Borneo. Weak and malnourished and sick, the prisoners of war were in no shape for the march, but they moved out as ordered, leaving behind more than 200 fellow prisoners who were too weak to walk. History records that most of them did not get very far. Many died of starvation and illness, Others were killed simply because they could not keep up. Prisoners who had stuck together for up to three years after being captured were left with no choice but to leave their mates behind. Of the 530 men who left Sandakan, 142 Australians and 41 British POWs reached Renau. But there was worse to come. The survivors of the march found only six men left of the 455 who had been sent to Renau four months earlier. The POWs were put to work, carrying firewood, building huts and hauling water for their captors. They died at the rate of seven a day. Beatings and executions continued daily. Back at Sandakan, the camp was burned to the ground and the remaining prisoners were killed or left to die. The last prisoner at Sandakan was executed on the 15th of August, 1945, the day that Japan surrendered. Evidence to war crimes investigators shows that the last Australians at Renau were, qu were killed 12 days after the war had ended. Only six Australians survived the death marches, all of them by escaping. But more than 2,000 Australian and British prisoners of war held at Sandakan had died. On this anniversary, on this day, Mr Speaker, we remember them all. We grieve for the memory of fathers, sons and brothers and husbands and mates of young men taken from their families to share the darkest chapter of our wartime history. We remember the courage shown by that handful of men who defied their captors, who escaped and ultimately carried home the news of what had taken place. It has taken many decades for the story of Sandakan to be told. Even now, we can only try to imagine the suffering 
and of the utter inhumanity that they had endured, the horrific conditions and the insane cruelty under which they lived and died. However, thanks to those who escaped, we can also find some measure in the comfort of the memory of the irrepressible Aussie spirit shown by the prisoners at Sandakan. Today, we remember the tales of selflessness and of the tenacity of Aussie mateship, the endurance of men who put aside their own suffering to try and ease the pain or the passing of a friend. We should remember the courage shown in the face of death and the deep and powerful emotion of mates who simply shook hands in silent goodbye to wish each other the best when they each knew what would happen next. But most of all, we make a promise to those fallen Australian servicemen and to their families, and above all to ourselves, that we will remember the men of Sandakan and try to be the very best Australians we can be. We owe it to them to tell their story so that new generations will come to understand the courage, the endurance, the mateship and the sacrifice shown by these men in the service of our nation and the price paid for the freedoms and the democracy that we enjoy because of them every day. This day stands alone, Mr Speaker. This day is Sandakan Day and we must never forget. I cannot recognise the member for Rankin, but I believe it would be appropriate for me to in indicate that the sentiments of the Minister for Veterans Affairs are embraced by the entire House. The debate having concluded, the House stands adjourned until 12.30pm next Monday. <laughs>